Chapter Seventeen of International Short Stories, Volume Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. International Short Stories, Volume Three, by Francis J. Reynolds. Chapter Seventeen: The Birds in the Letterbox, by Rene Bazin. Nothing can describe the peace that surrounded the country parsonage. The parish was small, moderately honest, prosperous, and was used to the old priest, who had ruled it for thirty years. The town ended at the parsonage, and there began meadows which sloped down to the river and were filled in summer with the perfume of flowers and all the music of the earth. Behind the great house a kitchen garden encroached on the meadow. The first ray of the sun was for it, and so was the last. Here the cherries ripened in May, and the currants often earlier, and a week before Assumption, usually, you could not pass within a hundred feet without breathing among the hedges the heavy odour of the melons. But you must not think that the Abbe of St. Philmon was a gourmand. He had reached the age when appetite is only a memory. His shoulders were bent his face was wrinkled, he had two little grey eyes, one of which could not see any longer, and he was so deaf in one ear that if you happened to be on that side you just had to get round on the other. Mercy, no, he did not eat all the fruits in his orchard. The boys got their share, and a big share, but the biggest share, by all odds, was eaten by the birds, the blackbirds, who lived there very comfortably all the year, and sang in return the best they could. The Oriolus, pretty birds of passage, who helped them in summer, and the sparrows, and the warblers of every variety, and the tomtits, swarms of them, with feathers as thick as your fingers, and they hung on the branches and pecked at a grape or scratched a pear. Veritable little beasts of prey, whose only thank you was a shrill cry like a saw. Even to them, old age had made the Abbe of St. Philmon indulgent. The beasts cannot correct their faults, he used to say. If I got angry at them for not changing, I'd have to get angry with a good many of my parishioners. And he contented himself with clapping his hands together loud when he went into his orchard, so he should not see too much stealing. Then there was a spreading of wings, as if all the silly flowers cut off by a great wind were flying away, grey and white and yellow and mottled, a short flight, a rustling of leaves, and then quiet for five minutes. But what minutes! Fancy, if you can, that there was not one factory in the village, not a weaver or a blacksmith, and that the noise of men with their horses and cattle, spreading over the wide distant plains, melted into the whispering of the breeze, and was lost. Mills were unknown, the roads were little frequented, the railroads were very far away. Indeed, if the ravages of his garden had repented for long, the abbe would have fallen asleep of the silence over his breviary. Fortunately, their return was prompt. A sparrow led the way, a jay followed, and then the whole swarm was back at work. And the abbe could walk up and down, close his book or open it, and murmur, They'll not leave me a berry this year. It made no difference. Not a bird left his prey, any more than if the good abbe had been a cone choked pear tree, with thick leaves balancing himself, on the gravel of the walk. The birds know that those who complain take no action. Every year they built a nest around the parsonage of St. Philemon in greater numbers than anywhere else. The best places were quickly taken, the hollows in the trees, the holes in the walls, the forks of the apple trees and the elms, and you can see a brown beak, like the point of a sword, sticking out a wisp of straw between all the rafters of the roof. One year, when all the places were taken, I suppose, a tomtit in her embarrassment, spied the slit of the letter-box protected by its little roof, at the right of the parsonage gate. She slipped in, was satisfied with the results of her explorations, and brought the material to build a nest. There was nothing she neglected that would make it warm, neither the feathers, nor the horsehair, nor the wool, nor even the scales of lichens that cover all wood. One morning the housekeeper came in, perfectly furious, carrying a paper. She had found it under the laurel bush, at the foot of the garden. "'Look, sir, a paper! And dirty, too! 
They are up to fine doings. Who, Philomene? Your miserable birds, all the birds that you let stay here. Pretty soon they'll be building their nests in your soup torrents. I haven't but one. Haven't they got the idea of laying their eggs in your letter box? I opened it because the postman rang, and that doesn't happen every day. It was full of straw and horsehair and spider's webs, with enough feathers to make a quilt, and in the midst of all that, a beast that I didn't see hissed at me like a viper. The abbe of Saint Philemon began to laugh like a grandfather when he hears of a baby's pranks. That must be a tomtit, said he. They are the only birds clever enough to think of it. Be careful not to touch its Philomene. No fear of that. It is not nice enough. The abbe went hastily through the garden, the house, the court planted with asparagus, till he came to the wall which separated the parsonage from the public road, and there he carefully opened the letter box in which there would have been room enough for all the mail received in a year by all the inhabitants of the village. Sure enough, he was not mistaken. The shape of the nest, like a pine cone, its colour and texture, and the lining, which showed through, made him smile. He heard the hiss of the brooding bird inside and replied, "'Rest easy, little one. I know you. Twenty-one days to hatch your eggs and three weeks to raise your family. That is what you want?' You shall have it. I'll take away the key. He did take away the key, and when he had finished the morning's duties, a visit to his parishioners who were ill or in trouble, instructions to a boy who was to pick him up some fruit at the village, a climb up the steeple because a storm had loosened some stones, he remembered the tomtit and began to be afraid she would be troubled by the arrival of a letter while she was hatching her eggs. The fair was almost groundless, because the people of St. Philemon did not receive any more letters than they sent. The postman had little to do on his rounds but to eat soup at one house, to have a drink at another, and, once in a long while, to leave a letter from some conscript, or a bill for taxes at some distant farm. Nevertheless, since St. Robert's Day was near, which, as you know, conies on the twenty-ninth of April, the abbe thought it wise to write to the only three friends worthy of that name, whom death had left him, a layman and two priests. "'My friends, do not congratulate me on my saint's day this year, if you please. It would inconvenience me to receive a letter at this time. Later I shall explain, and you will appreciate my reasons.' They thought that his eye was worse, and did not write. The abbe of St. Philemon was delighted. For three weeks he never entered his gate one time without thinking of the eggs, speckled with pink, that were lying in the letter-box. And when the twenty-first day came round, he bent down and listened with his ear close to the slit of the box. Then he stood up, beaming. I, I hear them chirp, Philomene. I hear them chirp. They owe their lives to me, sure enough, and they'll not be the ones to regret it any more than I. He had in his bosom the heart of a child that had never grown old. Now, at the same time, in the green room of the palace, at the chief town of the department, the bishop was deliberating over the appointment to be made, with his regular councillors, his two grand vicars, the dean of the chapter, the secretary-general of the palace, and the director of the great academy. After he had appointed several vicars and priests, he made this suggestion. "'Gentlemen of the council, I have in mind a candidate suitable in all respect for the parish of but I think it will be well, at least, to offer that charge and that honour to one of our oldest priests, the Abbe of St. Philemon. He will undoubtedly refuse it, and his modesty, no less than his age, will be the cause. But we shall have shown, as far as we could, our appreciation of his virtues. The five councillors approved unanimously, and that very evening a letter was sent from the palace, signed by the bishop, and which contained in a postscript, Answer at once, my dear Abbe, or better, come to see me, because I must submit my appointments to the government within three days. The letter arrived at St. Philemon the very day the tomtits were hatched. The postman had difficulty in slipping it into the slit of the box, but it disappeared inside, and lay touching the base of the nest, like a white pavement at the bottom of the dark chamber. The time came when the tiny points on the wings of the little tomtits began to be covered with down. There were fourteen of them, and they twittered and staggered on their little feet, 
with their beaks open up to their eyes, never ceasing from morning till night to wait for food, eat it, digest it, and demand more. That was the first period, when the baby birds hadn't any sense. But in birds it doesn't last long. Very soon they quarrelled in the nest, which began to break with the fluttering of their wings. Then they tumbled out of it and walked along the side of the box, peeped through the slit at the big world outside, and at last they ventured out. The abbe of St. Philemon, with a neighbouring priest, attended this pleasant garden party. When the little ones appeared beneath the roof of the box, two, three, together, and took their flight, and came back, started again, like bees at the door of a hive, he said. Behold, a baby who had ended, and a good work accomplished. They are hardy and strong, every one. The next day, during his hour of leisure after dinner, the abbe came to the box with a key in his hand. Tap, tap, he went. There was no answer. I thought so, said he. Then he opened the box, and mingled with the debris of the nest, the letter fell into his hands. "'Good heavens!' said he, recognising the writing. "'A letter from the bishop, and in what a state! How long has it been there?' His cheeks grew pale as he read. "'Philomene, harness Robin quickly!' She came to see what was the matter before obeying. "'What have you there, sir?' "'The bishop has been waiting for me three weeks!' "'You missed your chance,' said the old woman. The abbé was away until the next evening. When he came back he had a peaceful air, but sometimes peace is not attained without effort, and we have to struggle to keep it. When he had helped to unharness Robin and had given him some hay, had chained his cassock and unpacked his box, from which he took a dozen little packages of things bought on his visit to the city, it was the very time that the birds assembled in the branches to tell each other about the day. There had been a shower, and the drops still fell from the leaves, as they were shaken by these bohemian couples looking for a good place to spend the night. Recognising their friend and master as he walked up and down the gravel path, they came down, fluttered about him, making an unusual loud noise, and the tomtits, the fourteen of the nest, whose feathers were still not quite grown, essayed their first spirals about the pear-trees, and their first cries in the open air. The abbe of St. Philemon watched them with a fatherly eye, but his tenderness was sad, as we look at things that have cost us dear. "'Well, my little ones, without me you would not be here, and without you I would be dead. I do not regret it at all, but don't insist. Your thanks are too noisy.' He clapped his hands impatiently. He had never been ambitious, that is very sure, and, even at the moment, he told the truth. Nevertheless, the next day, after a night spent in talking to Philomene, he said to her, "'Next year, Philomene, if the tomtit comes back, let me know. It is decidedly inconvenient.' But the tomtit never came again, and neither did the letter from the bishop. End of The Birds in the Letterbox by René Bazin International Short Stories, Volume 3, French Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary International Short Stories, Volume 3 French Stories, compiled and translated by Francis J. Reynolds. Jean Gourdon's Four Days, Part One, by Emile Zola. Spring. On that particular day, at about five o'clock in the morning, the sun entered with delightful abruptness into the little room I occupied at the house of my uncle Lazare, parish priest of the hamlet of Durg. A broad yellow ray fell upon my closed eyelids, and I awoke in light. My room, which was whitewashed and had deal furniture, was full of attractive gaiety. I went to the window and gazed at the Durance, which traced its broad course amidst the dark green verdure of the valley. Fresh puffs of wind caressed my face, and the murmur of the trees and river seemed to call me to them. I gently opened my door. To get out I had to pass through my uncle's room. 
i proceeded on tiptoe fearing the creaking of my thick boots might awaken the worthy man who was still slumbering with a smiling countenance and i trembled at the sound of the church bell tolling the angelus for some days past my uncle lazar had been following me about everywhere looking sad and annoyed he would perhaps have prevented me going over there to the edge of the river and hiding myself among the willows on the bank so as to watch for babet passing that tall dark girl who had come with the spring but my uncle was sleeping soundly i felt something like remorse in deceiving him and running away in this manner i stayed for an instant and gazed on his calm countenance with its gentle expression enhanced by rest and i recalled to mind with feeling the day when he had come to fetch me in the chilly and deserted home which my mother's funeral was leaving since that day what tenderness what devotedness what good advice he had bestowed on me he had given me his knowledge and his kindness all his intelligence and all his heart i was tempted for a moment to cry out to him get up uncle lazar let us go for a walk together along that path you are so fond of beside the durance you will enjoy the fresh air and morning sun you will see what an appetite you will have on your return and babet who was going down to the river in her light morning gown and whom i should not be able to see my uncle would be there and i would have to lower my eyes it must be so nice under the willows lying flat on one's stomach in the fine grass i felt a languid feeling creeping over me and slowly taking short steps holding my breath i reached the door i went downstairs and began running like a madcap in the delightful warm may morning air the sky was quite white on the horizon with exquisitely delicate blue and pink tints the pale sun seemed like a great silver lamp casting a shower of bright rays into the durance and the broad sluggish river expanding lazily over the red sand extended from one end of the valley to the other like a stream of liquid metal to the west a line of low rugged hills threw slight violet streaks on the pale sky i had been living in this out-of-the-way corner for ten years how often had i kept my uncle lazar waiting to give me my latin lesson the worthy man wanted to make me learned but i was on the other side of the durance ferreting out magpies discovering a hill which i had not yet climbed then on my return there were remonstrances the latin was forgotten my poor uncle scolded me for having torn my trousers and he shuddered when he noticed sometimes that the skin underneath was cut the valley was mine really mine i had conquered it with my legs and i was the real landlord by right of friendship and that bit of river those two leagues of the durance how i loved them how well we understood one another when together i knew all the whims of my dear stream its anger its charming ways its different features at each hour of the day when i reached the water's edge on that particular morning i felt something like giddiness at seeing it so gentle and so white it had never looked so gay i slipped rapidly beneath the willows to an open space where a broad patch of sunlight fell on the dark grass there i laid me down on my stomach listening watching the pathway by which babet would come through the branches oh how sound uncle lazar must be sleeping i thought and i extended myself at full length on the moss the sun struck gentle heat into my back whilst my breast buried in the grass was quite cool have you never examined the turf at close quarters with your eyes on the blades of grass whilst i was waiting for babet i pried indiscreetly into a tuft which was really a whole world in my bunch of grass there were streets crossroads public squares entire cities 
at the bottom of it i distinguished a great dark patch where the shoots of the previous spring were decaying sadly then slender stalks were growing up stretching out bending into a multitude of elegant forms and producing frail colonnades churches virgin forests i saw two lean insects wandering in the midst of this immensity the poor children were certainly lost for they went from colonnade to colonnade from street to street in an affrighted anxious way it was just at this moment that on raising my eyes i saw babet's white skirts standing out against the dark ground at the top of the pathway i recognized her printed calico gown which was gray with small blue flowers i sunk down deeper in the grass i heard my heart thumping against the earth and almost raising me with slight jerks my breast was burning now i no longer felt the freshness of the dew the young girl came nimbly down the pathway her skirts skimming the ground with a swinging motion that charmed me i saw her at full length quite erect in her proud and happy gracefulness she had no idea i was there behind the willows she walked with a light step she ran without giving a thought to the wind which slightly raised her gown i could distinguish her feet trotting along quickly quickly and a piece of her white stockings which was perhaps as large as one's hand and which made me blush in a manner that was alike sweet and painful oh then i saw nothing else neither the durance nor the willows nor the whiteness of the sky what cared i for the valley it was no longer my sweetheart i was quite indifferent to its joy and its sadness what cared i for my friends the stories and the trees on the hills the river could run away all at once if it liked i would not have regretted it and the spring i did not care a bit about the spring had it borne away the sun that warmed my back its leaves its rays all its may morning i should have remained there in ecstasy gazing at babet running along the pathway and swinging her skirts deliciously for babet had taken the valley's place in my heart babet was the spring i had never spoken to her both of us blushed when we met one another in my uncle lazare's church i could have vowed she detested me she talked on that particular day for a few minutes with the women who were washing the sound of her pearly laughter reached as far as me mingled with the loud voice of the durance then she stooped down to take a little water in the hollow of her hand but the bank was high and babet who was on the point of slipping saved herself by clutching the grass i gave a frightful shudder which made my blood run cold i rose hastily and without feeling ashamed without reddening ran to the young girl she cast a startled look at me then she began to smile i bent down at the risk of falling i succeeded in filling my right hand with water by keeping my fingers close together and i presented this new sort of cup to babet asking her to drink the women who were washing laughed babet confused did not dare accept she hesitated and half turned her head away at last she made up her mind and delicately pressed her lips to the tips of my fingers but she had waited too long all the water had run away then she burst out laughing she became a child again and i saw very well that she was making fun of me i was very silly i bent forward again this time i took the water in both hands and hastened to put them to babet's lips she drank and i felt the warm kiss from her mouth run up my arms to my breast which it filled with heat oh how my uncle must sleep i murmured to myself just as i said that i perceived a dark shadow beside me and having turned round i saw my uncle lazare in person a few paces away watching babet and me as if offended his cassock appeared quite white in the sun in his look 
i saw reproaches which made me feel inclined to cry babet was very much afraid she turned quite red and hurried off stammering thanks monsieur jean i thank you very much as for me wiping my wet hands i stood motionless and confused before my uncle lazare the worthy man with folded arms and bringing back a corner of his cassock watched babet who was running up the pathway without turning her head then when she had disappeared behind the hedges he lowered his eyes to me and i saw his pleasant countenance smile sadly jean he said to me come into the broad walk breakfast is not ready we have half an hour to spare he set out with his rather heavy tread avoiding the tufts of grass wet with dew a part of the bottom of his cassock that was dragging along the ground made a dull crackling sound he held his breviary under his arm but he had forgotten his morning lecture and he advanced dreamily with bowed head and without uttering a word his silence tormented me he was generally so talkative my anxiety increased at every step he had certainly seen me giving babet water to drink what a sight oh lord the young girl laughing and blushing kissed the tips of my fingers whilst i standing on tiptoe stretching out my arms was leaning forward as if to kiss her my action now seemed to me frightfully audacious and all my timidity returned i inquired of myself how i could have dared to have my fingers kissed so sweetly and my uncle lazare who said nothing who continued walking with short steps in front of me without giving a single glance at the old trees he loved he was assuredly preparing a sermon he was only taking me into the broad walk to scold me at his ease it would occupy at least an hour breakfast would get cold and i would be unable to return to the water's edge and dream of the warm burns that babet's lips had left on my hands we were in the broad walk this walk which was wide and short ran beside the river it was shaded by enormous oak trees with trunks lacerated by seams stretching out their great tall branches the fine grass spread like a carpet beneath the trees and the sun riddling the foliage embroidered this carpet with a rosaceous pattern in gold in the distance all around extended raw green meadows my uncle went to the bottom of the walk without altering his step and without turning round once there he stopped and i kept beside him understanding that the terrible moment had arrived the river made a sharp curve a low parapet at the end of the walk formed a sort of terrace this vault of shade opened on a valley of light the country expanded wide before us for several leagues the sun was rising in the heavens where the silvery rays of morning had become transformed into a stream of gold blinding floods of light ran from the horizon along the hills and spread out into the plain with the glare of fire after a moment's silence my uncle lazare turned towards me good heavens the sermon i thought and i bowed my head my uncle pointed out the valley to me with an expansive gesture then drawing himself up he said slowly look jean there is the spring the earth is full of joy my boy and i have brought you here opposite this plain of light to show you the first smiles of the young season observe what brilliancy and sweetness warm perfumes rise from the country and pass across our faces like puffs of life he was silent and seemed dreaming I had raised my head astonished breathing at ease my uncle was not preaching it is a beautiful morning he continued a morning of youth your eighteen summers find full enjoyment amidst this verdure which is at most eighteen days old all is great brightness and perfume is it not 
the broad valley seems to you a delightful place the river is there to give you its freshness the trees to lend you their shade the whole country to speak to you of tenderness the heavens themselves to kiss those horizons that you are searching with hope and desire the spring belongs to fellows of your age it is it that teaches the boys how to give young girls to drink i hung my head again my uncle lazar had certainly seen me an old fellow like me he continued unfortunately knows what trust to place in the charms of spring i my poor jean i love the durance because it waters these meadows and gives life to all the valley i love this young foliage because it proclaims to me the coming of the fruits of summer and autumn i love this sky because it is good to us because its warmth hastens the fecundity of the earth i should have had to tell you this one day or other i prefer telling it you now at this early hour it is spring itself that is giving you the lesson the earth is a vast workshop wherein there is never a slack season observe this flower at our feet to you it is perfume to me it is labor it accomplishes its task by producing its share of life a little black seed which will work in its turn next spring and now search the vast horizon all this joy is but the act of generation if the country be smiling it is because it is beginning the everlasting task again do you hear it now breathing hard full of activity and haste the leaves sigh the flowers are in a hurry the corn grows without pausing all the plants all the herbs are quarrelling as to which shall spring up the quickest and the running water the river comes to assist in the common labour and the young sun which rises in the heavens is entrusted with the duty of enlivening the everlasting task of the labourers at this point my uncle made me look him straight in the face he concluded in these terms jean you hear what your friend the spring says to you he is youth but he is preparing ripe age his bright smile is but the gaiety of labor summer will be powerful autumn bountiful for the spring is singing at this moment while courageously performing its work i looked very stupid i understood my uncle lazar he was positively preaching me a sermon in which he told me i was an idle fellow and that the time had come to work my uncle appeared as much embarrassed as myself after having hesitated for some instants he said slightly stammering jean you were wrong not to have come and told me all as you love babet and babet loves you babet loves me i exclaimed my uncle made me an ill-humoured gesture eh allow me to speak i don't want another avowal she owned it to me herself she owned that to you she owned that to you and i suddenly threw my arms round my uncle lazar's neck oh how nice that is i added i had never spoken to her truly she told you that at the confessional didn't she i would never have dared ask her if she loved me and i would never have known anything oh how i thank you my uncle lazar was quite red he felt that he had just committed a blunder he had imagined that this was not my first meeting with the young girl and here he gave me a certainty when as yet i only dared dream of a hope he held his tongue now it was i who spoke with volubility i understand all i continued you are right i must work to win babet but you will see how courageous i shall be ah how good you are my uncle lazar and how well you speak i understand what the spring says i also will have a powerful summer and an autumn of abundance 
one is well placed here one sees all the valley i am young like it i feel youth within me demanding to accomplish its task my uncle calmed me very good jean he said to me i had long hoped to make a priest of you and i imparted to you my knowledge with that sole aim but what i saw this morning at the waterside compels me to definitely give up my fondest hope it is heaven that disposes of us you will love the almighty in another way you cannot now remain in this village and i only wish you to return when ripened by age and work i have chosen the trade of printer for you your education will serve you one of my friends who is a printer at grenoble is expecting you next monday i felt anxious and i shall come back and marry babet i inquired my uncle smiled imperceptibly and without answering in a direct manner said the remainder is the will of heaven you are heaven and i have faith in your kindness oh uncle see that babet does not forget me i will work for her then my uncle lazare again pointed out to me the valley which the warm golden light was overspreading more and more there is hope he said to me do not be as old as i am jean forget my sermon be as ignorant as this land it does not trouble about the autumn it is all engrossed with the joy of its smile it labors courageously and without a care it hopes and we returned to the parsonage strolling along slowly in the grass which was scorched by the sun and chatting with concern of our approaching separation breakfast was cold as i had foreseen but that did not trouble me much i had tears in my eyes each time i looked at my uncle lazare and at the thought of babet my heart beat fit to choke me i do not remember what i did during the remainder of the day i think i went and lay down under the willows at the river's side my uncle was right the earth was at work on placing my ear to the grass i seemed to hear continual sounds then i dreamed of what my life would be buried in the grass until nightfall i arranged an existence full of labor divided between babet and my uncle lazare the energetic youthfulness of the soil had penetrated my breast which i pressed with force against the common mother and at times i imagined myself to be one of the strong willows that lived around me in the evening i could not dine my uncle no doubt understood the thoughts that were choking me for he feigned not to notice my want of appetite as soon as i was able to rise from the table i hastened to return and breathe the open air outside a fresh breeze rose from the river the dull splashing of which i heard in the distance a soft light fell from the sky the valley expanded peaceful and transparent like a dark shoreless ocean there were vague sounds in the air a sort of impassioned tremor like a great flapping of wings passing above my head penetrating perfumes rose with the cool air from the grass i had gone out to see babet i knew she came to the parsonage every night and i went and placed myself in ambush behind a hedge i had got rid of my timidness of the morning i considered it quite natural to be waiting for her there because she loved me and i had to tell her of my departure when i perceived her skirts in the limpid night i advanced noiselessly then i murmured in a low voice babet babet i am here she did not recognize me at first and started with fright when she discovered who it was she seemed still more frightened which very much surprised me it's you monsieur jean she said to me what are you doing there what do you want i was beside her and took her hand you love me fondly do you not i who told you that my uncle lazare she stood there in confusion her hand began to tremble in mine as she was on the point of running away i took her other hand 
we were face to face in a sort of hollow in the hedge and i felt babet's panting breath running all warm over my face the freshness of the air the rustling silence of the night hung around us i don't know stammered the young girl i never said that his reverence the cure misunderstood for mercy's sake let me be i am in a hurry no no i continued i want you to know that i am going away to-morrow and to promise to love me always you are leaving to-morrow oh that sweet cry and how tenderly babet uttered it i seem still to hear her apprehensive voice full of affliction and love you see i exclaimed in my turn that my uncle lazare said the truth besides he never tells fibs you love me you love me babet your lips this morning confided the secret very softly to my fingers and i made her sit down at the foot of the hedge my memory has retained my first chat of love in its absolute innocence babet listened to me like a little sister she was no longer afraid she told me the story of her love and there were solemn sermons ingenious avowals projects without end she vowed she would marry no one but me i vowed to deserve her hand by labor and tenderness there was a cricket behind the hedge who accompanied our chat with his chaunt of hope and all the valley whispering in the dark took pleasure in hearing us talk so softly on separating we forgot to kiss each other when i returned to my little room it appeared to me that i had left it for at least a year that day which was so short seemed an eternity of happiness it was the warmest and most sweetly scented spring day of my life and the remembrance of it is now like the distant faltering voice of my youth End of Jean Gourdon's Four Days, Part 1 by Emile Zola International Short Stories, Volume 3, French Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary International Short Stories, Volume 3, French Stories, compiled and translated by Francis J. Reynolds. Jean Gourdon's Four Days, Part 2, by Émile Zola. Summer When I awoke at about three o'clock in the morning on that particular day, I was lying on the hard ground, tired out and with my face bathed in perspiration, the hot heavy atmosphere of a july night weighed me down my companions were sleeping around me wrapped in their hooded cloaks they speckled the gray ground with black and the obscure plain panted i fancied i heard the heavy breathing of a slumbering multitude indistinct sounds the neighing of horses the clash of arms rang out amidst the rustling silence the army had halted at about midnight and we had received orders to lie down and sleep we had been marching for three days scorched by the sun and blinded by dust the enemy were at length in front of us over there on those hills on the horizon at daybreak a decisive battle would be fought i had been a victim to despondency for three days i had been as if trampled on without energy and without thought for the future it was the excessive fatigue indeed that had just awakened me now lying on my back with my eyes wide open i was thinking whilst gazing into the night i thought of this battle this butchery which the sun was about to light up for more than six years at the first shot in each fight i had been saying good-bye to those i loved the most fondly babet and uncle lazare and now barely a month before my discharge i had to say good-bye again and this time perhaps for ever then my thoughts softened with closed eyelids i saw babet and my uncle lazare 
how long it was since i had kissed them i remembered the day of our separation my uncle weeping because he was poor and allowing me to leave like that and babet in the evening had vowed she would wait for me and that she would never love another i had had to quit all my master at grenoble my friends at Dourg. a few letters had come from time to time to tell me they always loved me and that happiness was awaiting me in my well-beloved valley and i i was going to fight i was going to get killed i began dreaming of my return i saw my poor old uncle on the threshold of the parsonage extending his trembling arms and behind him was babet quite red smiling through her tears i fell into their arms and kissed them seeking for expressions suddenly the beating of drums recalled me to stern reality daybreak had come the gray plain expanded in the morning mist the ground became full of life indistinct forms appeared on all sides a sound that became louder and louder filled the air it was the call of bugles the galloping of horses the rumble of artillery the shouting out of orders war came threatening amidst my dream of tenderness i rose with difficulty it seemed to me that my bones were broken and that my head was about to split i hastily got my men together for i must tell you that i had won the rank of sergeant we soon received orders to bear to the left and occupy a hillock above the plain as we were about to move the sergeant major came running along and shouting a letter for sergeant gourdon and he handed me a dirty crumpled letter which had been lying perhaps for a week in the leather bags of the post office i had only just time to recognize the writing of my uncle lazare forward march shouted the major i had to march for a few seconds i held the poor letter in my hand devouring it with my eyes it burnt my fingers i would have given everything in the world to have sat down and wept at ease whilst reading it i had to content myself with slipping it under my tunic against my heart i have never experienced such agony by way of consolation i said to myself what my uncle had so often repeated to me i was in the summer of my life at the moment of the fierce struggle and it was essential that i should perform my duty bravely if i would have a peaceful and bountiful autumn but these reasons exasperated me the more this letter which had come to speak to me of happiness burnt my heart which had revolted against the folly of war and i could not even read it i was perhaps going to die without knowing what it contained without perusing my uncle lazare's affectionate remarks for the last time we had reached the top of the hill we were to await orders there to advance the battlefield had been marvelously chosen to slaughter one another at ease the immense plain expanded for several leagues and was quite bare without a house or tree hedges and bushes made slight spots on the whiteness of the ground i have never since seen such a country an ocean of dust a chalky soil bursting open here and there and displaying its tawny bowels and never either have i since witnessed a sky of such intense purity a july day so lovely and so warm at eight o'clock the sultry heat was already scorching our faces oh the splendid morning and what a sterile plain to kill and die in firing had broken out with irregular crackling sounds a long time since supported by the solemn growl of the cannon the enemy austrians dressed in white had quitted the heights and the plain was studded with long files of men who looked to me about as big as insects one might have thought it was an ant hill in insurrection clouds of smoke hung over the battlefield at times when these clouds broke asunder i perceived soldiers in flight smitten with terrified panic thus there were currents of fright which bore men away and outbursts of shame and courage which brought them back under fire 
i could neither hear the cries of the wounded nor see the blood flow i could only distinguish the dead which the battalions left behind them and which resembled black patches i began to watch the movements of the troops with curiosity irritated at the smoke which hid a good half of the show experiencing a sort of egotistic pleasure at the knowledge that i was in security whilst others were dying at about nine o'clock we were ordered to advance we went down the hill at the double and proceeded towards the centre which was giving way the regular beat of our footsteps appeared to me funeral-like the bravest among us panting pale and with haggard features i have made up my mind to tell the truth at the first whistle of the bullets the battalion suddenly came to a halt tempted to fly forward forward shouted the chiefs but we were riveted to the ground bowing our heads when a bullet whistled by our ears this movement is instinctive if shame had not restrained me i would have thrown myself flat on my stomach in the dust before us was a huge veil of smoke which we dared not penetrate red flashes passed through this smoke and shuddering we stood still but the bullets reached us soldiers fell with yells the chiefs shouted louder forward forward the rear ranks which they pushed on compelled us to march then closing our eyes we made a fresh dash and entered the smoke we were seized with furious rage when the cry of halt resounded we experienced difficulty in coming to a standstill as soon as one is motionless fear returns and one feels a wish to run away firing commenced we shot in front of us without aiming finding some relief in discharging bullets into the smoke i remember i pulled my trigger mechanically with lips firmly set together and eyes wide open i was no longer afraid for to tell the truth i no longer knew if i existed the only idea i had in my head was that i would continue firing until all was over my companion on the left received a bullet full in the face and fell on me i brutally pushed him away wiping my cheek which he had drenched with blood and i resumed firing i still remember having seen our colonel monsieur de montrevert firm and erect upon his horse gazing quietly towards the enemy that man appeared to me immense he had no rifle to amuse himself with and his breast was expanded to its full breadth above us from time to time he looked down and exclaimed in a dry voice close the ranks close the ranks we closed our ranks like sheep treading on the dead stupefied and continuing firing until then the enemy had only sent us bullets a dull explosion was heard and a shell carried off five of our men a battery which must have been opposite us and which we could not see had just opened fire the shell struck into the middle of us almost at one spot making a sanguinary gap which we closed unceasingly with the obstinacy of ferocious brutes close the ranks close the ranks the colonel coldly repeated we were giving the cannon human flesh each time a soldier was struck down i was taking a step nearer death i was approaching the spot where the shells were falling heavily crushing the men whose turn had come to die the corpses were forming heaps in that place and soon the shells would strike into nothing more than a mound of mangled flesh shreds of limbs flew about at each fresh discharge we could no longer close the ranks the soldiers yelled the chiefs themselves were moved with the bayonet with the bayonet and amidst a shower of bullets the battalion rushed in fury towards the shells the veil of smoke was torn asunder we perceived the enemy's battery flaming red which was firing at us from the mouths of all its pieces on the summit of a hillock but the dash forward had commenced the shells stopped the dead only 
I ran beside Colonel Montrevert, whose horse had just been killed, and who was fighting like a simple soldier. Suddenly I was struck down. It seemed to me as if my breast opened and my shoulder was taken away. A frightful wind passed over my face, and I fell. The colonel fell beside me. I felt myself dying. I thought of those I loved, and fainted whilst searching with a withering hand for my uncle Lazar's letter. When I came to myself again, I was lying on my side in the dust. I was annihilated by profound stupor. I gazed before me with my eyes wide open, without seeing anything. It seemed to me that I had lost my limbs and that my brain was empty. I did not suffer, for life seemed to have departed from my flesh. The rays of a hot, implacable sun fell upon my face like molten lead. I did not feel it. Life returned to me, little by little. My limbs became lighter. My shoulder alone remained crushed beneath an enormous weight. Then, with the instinct of a wounded animal, I wanted to sit up. I uttered a cry of pain and fell back upon the ground. But I lived now. I saw. I understood. The plain spread out naked and deserted, all white in the broad sunlight. It exhibited its desolation beneath the intense serenity of heaven. Heaps of corpses were sleeping in the warmth, and the trees that had been brought down seemed to be other dead who were dying. There was not a breath of air. A frightful silence came from those piles of inanimate bodies. Then, at times, there were dismal groans which broke this silence and conveyed a long tremor to it. Slender clouds of grey smoke hanging over the low hills on the horizon was all that broke the bright blue of the sky. The butchery was continuing on the heights. I imagined we were conquerors, and I experienced selfish pleasure in thinking I could die in peace on this deserted plain. Around me the earth was black. On raising my head I saw the enemy's battery on which we had charged a few feet away from me. The struggle must have been horrible. The mound was covered with hacked and disfigured bodies. Blood had flowed so abundantly that the dust seemed like a large red carpet. The cannon stretched out their dark muzzles above the corpses. I shuddered when I observed the silence of those guns. Then, gently, with a multitude of precautions, I succeeded in turning on my stomach. I rested my head on a large stone, all splashed with gore, and drew my uncle Lazar's letter from my breast. I placed it before my eyes, but my tears prevented my reading it. And whilst the sun was roasting me in the back, the acrid smell of blood was choking me. I could form an idea of the woeful plain around me, and was as if stiffened with the rigidness of the dead. My poor heart was weeping in the warm and loathsome silence of murder. Uncle Lazar wrote to me. My dear boy, I hear war has been declared, but I still hope you will get your discharge before the campaign opens. Every morning I beseech the Almighty to spare you new dangers. He will grant my prayer. He will, one of these days, let you close my eyes. Ah, my poor Jean, I am becoming old. I have great need of your arm. Since your departure I no more feel your youthfulness beside me, which gave me back my twenty summers. Do you remember our strolls in the morning along the oak-tree walk? Now I no longer dare to go beneath those trees. I am alone. I am afraid. The Durance weeps. Come quickly and console me assuage my anxiety. The tears were choking me. I could not continue. 
at that moment a heart-rending cry was uttered a few steps away from me i saw a soldier suddenly rise with the muscles of his face contracted he extended his arms in agony and fell to the ground where he writhed in frightful convulsions then he ceased moving i have placed my hope in the almighty continued my uncle he will bring you back safe and sound to durg and we will resume our peaceful existence let me dream out loud and tell you my plans for the future you will go no more to grenoble you will remain with me i will make my child a son of the soil a peasant who shall live gaily whilst tilling the fields and i will retire to your farm in a short time my trembling hands will no longer be able to hold the host i only ask heaven for two years of such an existence that will be my reward for the few good deeds i may have done then you will sometimes lead me along the paths of our dear valley where every rock every hedge will remind me of your youth which i so greatly loved i had to stop again i felt such a sharp pain in my shoulder that i almost fainted a second time a terrible anxiety had just taken possession of me it seemed as if the sound of the fusillade was approaching and i thought with terror that our army was perhaps retreating and that in its flight it would descend to the plain and pass over my body but i still saw nothing but the slight cloud of smoke hanging over the low hills my uncle lazar added and we shall be three to love one another ah my well-beloved jean how right you were to give her to drink that morning beside the durance i was afraid of babet i was ill-humoured and now i am jealous for i can see very well that i shall never be able to love you as much as she does tell him she repeated to me yesterday blushing that if he gets killed i shall go and throw myself into the river at the spot where he gave me to drink for the love of god be careful of your life there are things that i cannot understand but i feel that happiness awaits you here i already call babet my daughter i can see her on your arm in the church when i shall bless your union i wish that to be my last mass babet is a fine tall girl now she will assist you in your work the sound of the fusillade had gone farther away i was weeping sweet tears there were dismal moans among soldiers who were in their last agonies between the cannon wheels i perceived one who was endeavouring to get rid of a comrade wounded as he was whose body was crushing his chest and as this wounded man struggled and complained the soldier pushed him brutally away and made him roll down the slope of the mound whilst the wretched creature yelled with pain at that cry a murmur came from the heap of corpses the sun which was sinking shed rays of a light fallow colour the blue of the sky was softer i finished reading my uncle lazar's letter i simply wished he continued to give you news of ourselves and to beg you to come as soon as possible and make us happy and here i am weeping and gossiping like an old child hope my poor jean i pray and god is good answer me quickly and give me if possible the date of your return babet and i are counting the weeks we trust to see you soon be hopeful the date of my return i kissed the letter sobbing and fancied for a moment that i was kissing babet and my uncle no doubt i should never see them again i would die like a dog in the dust beneath the leaden sun and it was on that desolated plain amidst the death rattle of the dying that those whom i loved dearly were saying good-bye a buzzing silence filled my ears i gazed at the pale earth spotted with blood which extended deserted to the gray lines of the horizon i repeated i must die 
then i closed my eyes and thought of babet and my uncle lazare i know not how long i remained in a sort of painful drowsiness my heart suffered as much as my flesh warm tears ran slowly down my cheeks amidst the nightmare that accompanied the fever i heard a moan similar to the continuous plaintive cry of a child in suffering at times i awoke and stared at the sky in astonishment at last i understood that it was monsieur de montrever lying a few paces off who was moaning in this manner i had thought him dead he was stretched out with his face to the ground and his arms extended this man had been good to me i said to myself that i could not allow him to die thus with his face to the ground and i began crawling slowly towards him two corpses separated us for a moment i thought of passing over the stomachs of these dead men to shorten the distance for my shoulder made me suffer frightfully at every movement but i did not dare i proceeded on my knees assisting myself with one hand when i reached the colonel i gave a sigh of relief it seemed to me that i was less alone we would die together and this death shared by both of us no longer terrified me i wanted him to see the sun and i turned him over as gently as possible when the rays fell upon his face he breathed hard he opened his eyes leaning over his body i tried to smile at him he closed his eyelids again i understood by his trembling lips that he was conscious of his sufferings it's you gourdon he said to me at last in a feeble voice is the battle won i think so colonel i answered him there was a moment of silence then opening his eyes and looking at me he inquired where are you wounded in the shoulder and you colonel my elbow must be smashed i remember it was the same bullet that arranged us both like this my boy he made an effort to sit up but come he said with sudden gaiety we are not going to sleep here you cannot believe how much this courageous display of joviality contributed towards giving me strength and hope i felt quite different since we were two to struggle against death wait i exclaimed i will bandage up your arm with my handkerchief and we will try and support one another as far as the nearest ambulance that's it my boy don't make it too tight now let us take each other by the good hand and try to get up we rose staggering we had lost a great deal of blood our heads were swimming and our legs failed us anyone would have mistaken us for drunkards stumbling supporting pushing one another and making zigzags to avoid the dead the sun was setting with a rosy blush and our gigantic shadows danced in a strange way over the field of battle it was the end of a fine day the colonel joked his lips were crisped by shudders his laughter resembled sobs i could see that we were going to fall down in some corner never to rise again at times we were seized with giddiness and were obliged to stop and close our eyes the ambulances formed small gray patches on the dark ground at the extremity of the plain we knocked up against a large stone and were thrown down one on the other the colonel swore like a pagan we tried to walk on all fours catching hold of the briars in this way we did a hundred yards on our knees but our knees were bleeding i have had enough of it said the colonel lying down they may come and fetch me if they will let us sleep i still had the strength to sit half up and shout with all the breath that remained within me men were passing along in the distance picking up the wounded they ran to us and placed us side by side on a stretcher comrade the colonel said to me during the journey death will not have us i owe you my life 
I will pay my debt whenever you have need of me. Give me your hand. I placed my hand in his, and it was thus that we reached the ambulances. They had lighted torches. The surgeons were cutting and sawing amidst frightful yells. A sickly smell came from the blood-stained linen, whilst the torches cast dark rosy flakes into the basins. The colonel bore the amputation of his arm with courage. I only saw his lips turn pale and a film come over his eyes. When it was my turn, a surgeon examined my shoulder. A shell did that for you, he said. An inch lower, and your shoulder would have been carried away. The flesh only has suffered. And when I asked the assistant who was dressing my wound whether it was serious, he answered me with a laugh. Serious? You will have to keep to your bed for three weeks and make new blood. I turned my face to the wall, not wishing to show my tears. And with my heart's eyes I perceived Babet and my uncle Lazare stretching out their arms towards me, I had finished with the sanguinary struggles of my summer day. End of Jean Gourdon's Four Days, Part Two, by Emile Zola. International Short Stories, Volume Three, French Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. International Short Stories, Volume 3. French Stories, compiled and translated by Francis J. Reynolds. Jean Gourdon's Four Days, Part 3, by Émile Zola. Autumn. It was nearly fifteen years since I had married Babet in my uncle Lazare's little church. We had sought happiness in our dear valley. I had made myself a farmer. The Durance, my first sweetheart, was now a good mother to me, who seemed to take pleasure in making my fields rich and fertile. Little by little, by following the new methods of agriculture, I became one of the wealthiest landowners in the neighborhood. We had purchased the oak tree walk and the meadows bordering on the river at the death of my wife's parents. I had had a modest house built on this land, but we were soon obliged to enlarge it. Each year I found a means of rounding off our property by the addition of some neighboring field, and our granaries were too small for our harvest. Those first fifteen years were uneventful and happy. They passed away in serene joy, and all they have left within me is the remembrance of calm and continued happiness. My uncle Lazare, on retiring to our home, had realized his dream. His advanced age did not permit of his reading his breviary of a morning. He sometimes regretted his dear church, but consoled himself by visiting the young vicar who had succeeded him. He came down from the little room he occupied, at sunrise, and often accompanied me to the fields, enjoying himself in the open air and finding a second youth amidst the healthy atmosphere of the country. One sadness alone made us sometimes sigh. Amidst the fruitfulness by which we were surrounded, Babet remained childless. Although we were three to love one another, we sometimes found ourselves too much alone. We would have liked to have had a little fair head running about amongst us, who would have tormented and caressed us. Uncle Lazare had a frightful dread of dying before he was a great uncle. He had become a child again, and felt sorrowful that Babet did not give him a comrade who would have played with him. On the day when my wife confided to us, with hesitation, that we would, no doubt, soon be four, I saw my uncle turn quite pale and make efforts not to cry. He kissed us thinking already of the christening, and speaking of the child as if it were already three or four years old. And the months passed in concentrated tenderness. We talked together in subdued voices, awaiting someone. 
i no longer loved babet i worshipped her with joined hands i worshipped her for two for herself and the little one the great day was drawing nigh i had brought a midwife from grenoble who never moved from the farm my uncle was in a dreadful fright he understood nothing about such things he went so far as to tell me that he had done wrong in taking holy orders and that he was very sorry he was not a doctor one morning in september at about six o'clock i went into the room of my dear babet who was still asleep her smiling face was peacefully reposing on the white linen pillow-case i bent over her holding my breath heaven had blessed me with the good things of this world i all at once thought of that summer day when i was moaning in the dust and at the same time i felt around me the comfort due to labor and the quietude that comes from happiness my good wife was asleep all rosy in the middle of her great bed whilst the whole room recalled to me our fifteen years of tender affection i kissed babet softly on the lips she opened her eyes and smiled at me without speaking i felt an almost uncontrollable desire to take her in my arms and clasp her to my heart but latterly i had hardly dared press her hand she seemed so fragile and sacred to me i seated myself at the edge of the bed and asked her in a low voice is it for to-day no i don't think so she replied i dreamt i had a boy he was already very tall and wore adorable little black mustachios uncle lazare told me yesterday that he also had seen him in a dream i acted very stupidly i know the child better than you do i said i see it every night it's a girl and as babet turned her face to the wall ready to cry i realized how foolish i had been and hastened to add when i say a girl i am not quite sure i see a very small child with a long white gown it's certainly a boy babet kissed me for that pleasing remark go and look after the vintage she continued i feel calm this morning you will send for me if anything happens yes yes i am very tired i shall go to sleep again you'll not be angry with me for my laziness and babet closed her eyes looking languid and affected i remained leaning over her receiving the warm breath from her lips in my face she gradually went off to sleep without ceasing to smile then i disengaged my hand from hers with a multitude of precautions I had to maneuver for five minutes to bring this delicate task to a happy issue after that i gave her a kiss on her forehead which she did not feel and withdrew with a palpitating heart overflowing with love in the courtyard below i found my uncle lazare who was gazing anxiously at the window of babet's room so soon as he perceived me he inquired well is it for to-day he had been putting this question to me regularly every morning for the past month it appears not i answered him will you come with me and see them picking the grapes he fetched his stick and we went down the oak tree walk when we were at the end of it on that terrace which overlooks the durance both of us stopped gazing at the valley small white clouds floated in the pale sky the sun was shedding soft rays which cast a sort of gold dust over the country the yellow expanse of which spread out all ripe one saw neither the brilliant light nor the dark shadows of summer the foliage gilded the black earth in large patches the river ran more slowly weary at the task of having rendered the fields fruitful for a season and the valley remained calm and strong it already wore the first furrows of winter but it preserved within it the warmth of its last labor displaying its robust charms free from the weeds of spring more majestically beautiful like that second youth of woman who has given birth to life my uncle lazare remained silent then turning towards me said do you remember jean 
it is more than twenty years ago since i brought you here early one may morning on that particular day i showed you the valley full of feverish activity laboring for the fruits of autumn look the valley has just performed its task again i remember dear uncle i replied i was quaking with fear on that day but you were good and your lesson was convincing i owe you all my happiness yes you have reached the autumn you have labored and are gathering in the harvest man my boy was created after the way of the earth and we like the common mother are eternal the green leaves are born again each year from dry leaves i am born again in you and you will be born again in your children i am telling you this so that old age may not alarm you so that you may know how to die in peace as dies this verdure which will shoot out again from its own germs next spring i listened to my uncle and thought of babet who was sleeping in her great bed spread with white linen the dear creature was about to give birth to a child after the manner of this fertile soil which had given us fortune she also had reached the autumn she had the beaming smile and serene robustness of the valley i seemed to see her beneath the yellow sun tired and happy experiencing noble delight at being a mother and i no longer knew whether my uncle lazare was talking to me of my dear valley or of my dear babet we slowly ascended the hills below along the durance were the meadows broad raw green swards next came the yellow fields intersected here and there by grayish olive and slender almond trees planted wide apart in rows then right up above were the vines great stumps with shoots trailing along the ground the vine is treated in the south of france like a hardy housewife and not like a delicate young lady as in the north it grows somewhat as it likes according to the good will of rain and sun the stumps which are planted in double rows and form long lines throw sprays of dark verdure about them wheat or oats are sown between a vineyard resembles an immense piece of striped material made of the green bands formed by the vine leaves and of yellow ribbon represented by the stubble men and women stooping down among the vines were cutting the bunches of grapes which they then threw to the bottom of large baskets my uncle and i walked slowly through the stubble as we passed along the vintagers turned their heads and greeted us my uncle sometimes stopped to speak to some of the oldest of the laborers hey father andre he said are the grapes thoroughly ripe will the wine be good this year and the country folk raising their bare arms displayed the long bunches which were as black as ink in the sun and when the grapes were pressed they seemed to burst with abundance and strength look mr cure they exclaimed these are small ones there are some weighing several pounds we have not had such a task these ten years then they returned among the leaves their brown jackets formed patches in the verdure and the women bareheaded with small blue handkerchiefs round their necks were stooping down singing there were children rolling in the sun in the stubble giving utterance to shrill laughter and enlivening this open-air workshop with their turbulency large carts remained motionless at the edge of the field waiting for the grapes they stood out prominently against the clear sky whilst men went and came unceasingly carrying away full baskets and bringing back empty ones i confess that in the centre of this field i had feelings of pride i heard the ground producing beneath my feet ripe age ran all powerful in the veins of the vine and loaded the air with great puffs of it hot blood coursed in my flesh 
i was as if elevated by the fecundity overflowing from the soil and ascending within me the labor of this swarm of workpeople was my doing these vines were my children this entire farm became my large and obedient family i experienced pleasure in feeling my feet sink into the heavy land then at a glance i took in the fields that sloped down to the durance and i was the possessor of those vines those meadows that stubble those olive trees the house stood all white beside the oak tree walk the river seemed like a fringe of silver placed at the edge of the great green mantle of my pasture land i fancied for a moment that my frame was increasing in size that by stretching out my arms i would be able to embrace the entire property and press it to my breast trees meadows house and ploughed land and as i looked i saw one of our servant girls racing out of breath up the narrow pathway that ascended the hill confused by the speed at which she was travelling she stumbled over the stones agitating both her arms and hailing us with gestures of bewilderment i felt choking with inexpressible emotion uncle uncle i shouted look how marguerite's running i think it must be for to-day my uncle lazare turned quite pale the servant had at length reached the plateau she came towards us jumping over the vines when she reached me she was out of breath she was stifling and pressing her hands to her bosom speak i said to her what has happened she heaved a heavy sigh agitated her hands and finally was able to pronounce this single word madame i waited for no more come come quick uncle lazare ah my poor dear babet and i bounded down the pathway at a pace fit to break my bones the vintagers who had stood up smiled as they saw me running uncle lazare who could not overtake me shook his walking-stick in despair eh jean the deuce he shouted wait for me i don't want to be the last but i no longer heard uncle lazare and continued running i reached the farm panting for breath full of hope and terror i rushed upstairs and knocked with my fist at babet's door laughing crying and half crazy the midwife set the door ajar to tell me in an angry voice not to make so much noise i stood there abashed and in despair you can't come in she added go and wait in the courtyard and as i did not move she continued all is going on very well i will call you the door was closed i remained standing before it unable to make up my mind to go away i heard babet complaining in a broken voice and while i was there she gave utterance to a heart-rending scream that struck me right in the breast like a bullet i felt an almost irresistible desire to break the door open with my shoulder so as not to give way to it i placed my hands to my ears and dashed downstairs in the courtyard i found my uncle lazare who had just arrived out of breath the worthy man was obliged to seat himself on the brink of the well hello where is the child he inquired of me i don't know i answered they shut the door in my face babet is in pain and in tears we gazed at one another not daring to utter a word we listened in agony without taking our eyes off babet's window endeavoring to see through the little white curtains my uncle who was trembling stood still with both his hands resting heavily on his walking-stick i feeling very feverish walked up and down before him taking long strides at times we exchanged anxious smiles the carts of the vintagers arrived one by one the baskets of grapes were placed against the wall of the courtyard and bare-legged men trampled the bunches underfoot in wooden troughs the mules neighed the carters swore whilst the wine fell with a dull sound to the bottom of the vat acrid smells pervaded the warm air and i continued pacing up and down as if made tipsy by those perfumes my poor head was breaking and as i watched the red juice run from the grapes i thought of babet 
i said to myself with manly joy that my child was born at the prolific time of vintage amidst the perfume of new wine i was tormented by impatience i went upstairs again but i did not dare knock i pressed my ear against the door and heard babet's low moans and sobs then my heart failed me and i cursed suffering uncle lazar who had crept up behind me had to lead me back into the courtyard he wished to divert me and told me the wine would be excellent but he spoke without attending to what he said and at times we were both silent listening anxiously to one of babet's more prolonged moans little by little the cries subsided and became nothing more than a painful murmur like the voice of a child falling off to sleep in tears then there was absolute silence this soon caused me unutterable terror the house seemed empty now that babet had ceased sobbing i was just going upstairs when the midwife opened the window noiselessly she leant out and beckoned me with her hand come she said to me i went slowly upstairs feeling additional delight at each step i took my uncle lazar was already knocking at the door whilst i was only half way up to the landing experiencing a sort of strange delight in delaying the moment when i would kiss my wife i stopped on the threshold my heart was beating double my uncle had leant over the cradle babet quite pale with closed eyelids seemed asleep i forgot all about the child and going straight to babet took her dear hand between mine the tears had not dried on her cheeks and her quivering lips were dripping with them she raised her eyelids wearily she did not speak to me but i understood her to say i have suffered a great deal my dear jean but i was so happy to suffer i felt you within me then i bent down i kissed babet's eyes and drank her tears she laughed with much sweetness she resigned herself with caressing languidness the fatigue had made her all aches and pains she slowly moved her hands from the sheet and taking me by the neck placed her lips to my ear it's a boy she murmured in a weak voice but with an air of triumph those were the first words she uttered after the terrible shock she had undergone i knew it would be a boy she continued i saw the child every night give him me put him beside me i turned round and saw the midwife and my uncle quarrelling the midwife had all the trouble in the world to prevent uncle lazare taking the little one in his arms he wanted to nurse it i looked at the child whom the mother had made me forget he was all rosy babet said with conviction that he was like me the midwife discovered that he had his mother's eyes i for my part could not say i was almost crying i smothered the dear little thing with kisses imagining i was still kissing babet i placed the child on the bed he kept on crying but this sounded to us like celestial music i sat on the edge of the bed my uncle took a large armchair and babet weary and serene covered up to her chin remained with open eyelids and smiling eyes the window was wide open the smell of grapes came in along with the warmth of the mild autumn afternoon one heard the trampling of the vintagers the shocks of the carts the cracking of whips at times the shrill song of a servant working in the courtyard reached us all this noise was softened in the serenity of that room which still resounded with babet's sobs and the window frame enclosed a large strip of landscape carved out of the heavens and open country we could see the oak tree walk in its entire length then the durance looking like a white satin ribbon passed amidst the gold and purple leaves whilst above this square of ground were the limpid depths of a pale sky with blue and rosy tints 
it was amidst the calm of this horizon amidst the exhalations of the vat and the joys attendant upon labor and reproduction that we three talked together babet uncle lazare and myself whilst gazing at the dear little new-born babe uncle lazare said babet what name will you give the child jean's mother was named jacqueline answered my uncle i shall call the child jacques 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 repeated babet yes it's a pretty name and tell me what shall we make the little man parson or soldier gentleman or peasant i began to laugh we shall have time to think of that i said but no continued babet almost angry he will grow rapidly see how strong he is he already speaks with his eyes my uncle lazare was exactly of my wife's opinion he answered in a very grave tone make him neither priest nor soldier unless he have an irresistible inclination for one of those callings to make him a gentleman would be a serious babet looked at me anxiously the dear creature had not a bit of pride for herself but like all mothers she would have liked to be humble and proud before her son i could have sworn that she already saw him a notary or a doctor i kissed her and gently said to her i wish our son to live in our dear valley one day he will find a babet of sixteen on the banks of the durance to whom he will give some water do you remember my dear the country has brought us peace our son shall be a peasant as we are and happy as we are babet who was quite touched kissed me in her turn she gazed at the foliage and the river the meadows and the sky through the window then she said to me smiling you are right jean this place has been good to us it will be the same to our little jacques uncle lazare you will be the godfather of a farmer uncle lazare made a languid affectionate sign of approval with the head i had been examining him for a moment and saw his eyes becoming filmy and his lips turning pale leaning back in the armchair opposite the window he had placed his white hands on his knees and was watching the heavens fixedly with an expression of thoughtful ecstasy i felt very anxious are you in pain uncle lazare i inquired of him what is the matter with you answer for mercy's sake he gently raised one of his hands as if to beg me to speak lower then he let it fall again and said in a weak voice i am broken down he said happiness at my age is mortal don't make a noise it seems as if my flesh were becoming quite light i can no longer feel my legs or arms babet raised herself in alarm with her eyes on uncle lazare i knelt down before him watching him anxiously he smiled don't be frightened he resumed i am in no pain a feeling of calmness is gaining possession of me i believe i am going off into a good and just sleep it came over me all at once and i thank the almighty ah my poor jean i ran too fast down the pathway on the hillside the child caused me too great joy and as we understood we burst out into tears uncle lazare continued without ceasing to watch the sky do not spoil my joy i beg of you if you only knew how happy it makes me to fall asleep for ever in this armchair i have never dared expect such a consoling death all i love is here beside me and see what a blue sky the almighty has sent a lovely evening the sun was sinking behind the oak tree walk its slanting rays cast sheets of gold beneath the trees which took the tones of old copper 
the verdant fields melted into vague serenity in the distance uncle lazare became weaker and weaker amidst the touching silence of this peaceful sunset entering by the open window he slowly passed away like those slight gleams that were dying out on the lofty branches ah my good valley he murmured you are sending me a tender farewell i was afraid of coming to my end in the winter when you would be all black we restrained our tears not wishing to trouble this saintly death babet prayed in an undertone the child continued uttering smothered cries my uncle lazare heard its wail in the dreaminess of his agony he endeavored to turn towards babet and still smiling said i have seen the child and die very happy then he gazed at the pale sky and yellow fields and throwing back his head heaved a gentle sigh no tremor agitated uncle lazare's body he died as one falls asleep we had become so calm that we remained silent and with dry eyes in the presence of such great simplicity in death all we experienced was a feeling of serene sadness twilight had set in uncle lazare's farewell had left us confident like the farewell of the sun which dies at night to be born again in the morning such was my autumn day which gave me a son and carried off my uncle lazare in the peacefulness of the twilight end of jean gourdon's four days part three by emile zola International Short Stories, Volume 3, French Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. International Short Stories, Volume 3, French Stories, compiled and translated by Francis J. Reynolds. Jean Gourdon's Four Days, Part 4 by emile zola winter there are dreadful mornings in january that chill one's heart i awoke on this particular day with a vague feeling of anxiety it had thawed during the night and when i cast my eyes over the country from the threshold it looked to me like an immense dirty gray rag soiled with mud and rent to tatters the horizon was shrouded in a curtain of fog in which the oak trees along the walk lugubriously extended their dark arms like a row of spectres guarding the vast mass of vapor spreading out behind them the fields had sunk and were covered with great sheets of water at the edge of which hung the remnants of dirty snow the loud roar of the durance was increasing in the distance winter imparts health and strength to one's frame when the sun is clear and the ground dry the air makes the tips of your ears tingle you walk merrily along the frozen pathways which ring with a silvery sound beneath your tread but i know of nothing more saddening than dull thawing weather i hate the damp fogs which weigh one's shoulders down i shivered in the presence of that copper-like sky and hastened to retire indoors making up my mind that i would not go out into the fields that day there was plenty of work in and around the farm buildings jacques had been up a long time i heard him whistling in a shed where he was helping some men remove sacks of corn the boy was already eighteen years old he was a tall fellow with strong arms he had not had an uncle lazare to spoil him and teach him latin and he did not go and dream beneath the willows at the riverside jacques had become a real peasant an untiring worker who got angry when i touched anything telling me i was getting old and ought to rest 
and as i was watching him from a distance a sweet lithe creature leaping on my shoulders clapped her little hands to my eyes inquiring who is it i laughed and answered it's little marie who has just been dressed by her mamma the dear little girl was completing her tenth year and for ten years she had been the delight of the farm having come the last at a time when we could no longer hope to have any more children she was doubly loved her precarious health made her particularly dear to us she was treated as a young lady her mother absolutely wanted to make a lady of her and i had not the heart to oppose her wish so little marie was a pet in lovely silk skirts trimmed with ribbons marie was still seated on my shoulders mamma mamma she cried come and look i'm playing at horses babet who was entering smiled ah my poor babet how old we were i remember we were shivering with weariness on that day gazing sadly at one another when alone our children brought back our youth lunch was eaten in silence we had been compelled to light the lamp the reddish glimmer that hung round the room was sad enough to drive one crazy bah said jacques this tepid rainy weather is better than intense cold that would freeze our vines and olives and he tried to joke but he was as anxious as we were without knowing why babet had had bad dreams we listened to the account of her nightmare laughing with our lips but sad at heart this weather quite upsets one i said to cheer us all up yes yes it's the weather jacques hastened to add i'll put some vine branches on the fire there was a bright flame which cast large sheets of light upon the walls the branches burnt with a cracking sound leaving rosy ashes we had seated ourselves in front of the chimney the air outside was tepid but great drops of icy cold damp fell from the ceilings inside the farmhouse babet had taken little marie on her knees she was talking to her in an undertone amused at her childish chatter are you coming father jacques inquired of me we are going to look at the cellars and lofts i went out with him the harvests had been getting bad for some years past we were suffering great losses our vines and trees were caught by frost whilst hail had chopped up our wheat and oats and i sometimes said that i was growing old and that fortune who is a woman does not care for old men jacques laughed answering that he was young and was going to court fortune i had reached the winter the cold season i felt distinctly that all was withering around me at each pleasure that departed i thought of uncle lazare who had died so calmly and with fond remembrances of him asked for strength daylight had completely disappeared at three o'clock we went down into the common room babet was sewing in the chimney corner with her head bent over her work and little marie was seated on the ground in front of the fire gravely dressing a doll jacques and i had placed ourselves at a mahogany writing-table which had come to us from uncle lazare and were engaged in checking our accounts the window was as if blocked up the fog sticking to the panes of glass formed a perfect wall of gloom behind this wall stretched emptiness the unknown a great noise a loud roar alone arose in the silence and spread through the obscurity we had dismissed the workpeople keeping only our old woman servant marguerite with us when i raised my head and listened it seemed to me that the farmhouse hung suspended in the middle of a chasm no human sound came from the outside i heard naught but the riot of the abyss then i gazed at my wife and children and experienced the cowardice of those old people who feel themselves too weak to protect those surrounding them against unknown peril the noise became harsher and it seemed to us that there was a knocking at the door 
at the same instant the horses in the stable began to neigh furiously whilst the cattle lowed as if choking we had all risen pale with anxiety jacques dashed to the door and threw it wide open a wave of muddy water burst into the room the durance was overflowing it was it that had been making the noise that had been increasing in the distance since morning the snow melting on the mountains had transformed each hillside into a torrent which had swelled the river the curtain of fog had hidden from us this sudden rise of water it had often advanced thus to the gates of the farm when the thaw came after severe winters but the flood had never increased so rapidly we could see through the open door that the courtyard was transformed into a lake the water already reached our ankles babet had caught up little marie who was crying and clasping her doll to her jacques wanted to run and open the doors of the stables and cow-houses but his mother held him back by his clothes begging him not to go out the water continued rising i pushed babet towards the staircase quick quick let us go up into the bedrooms i cried and i obliged jacques to pass before me i left the ground floor the last marguerite came down in terror from the loft where she happened to find herself i made her sit down at the end of the room beside babet who remained silent pale and with beseeching eyes we put little marie into bed she had insisted on keeping her doll and went quietly to sleep pressing it in her arms this child's sleep relieved me when i turned round and saw babet listening to the little girl's regular breathing i forgot the danger all i heard was the water beating against the walls but jacques and i could not help looking peril in the face anxiety made us endeavor to discover the progress of the inundation we had thrown the window wide open we leant out at the risk of falling searching into the darkness the fog which was thicker hung above the flood throwing out fine rain which gave us the shivers vague steel-like flashes were all that showed the moving sheet of water amidst the profound obscurity below it was splashing in the courtyard rising along the walls in gentle undulations and we still heard naught but the anger of the durance and the affrighted cattle and horses the neighing and lowing of these poor beasts pierced me to the heart jacques questioned me with his eyes he would have liked to try and deliver them their agonizing moans soon became lamentable and a great cracking sound was heard the oxen had just broken down the stable doors we saw them pass before us borne away by the flood rolled over and over in the current and they disappeared amid the roar of the river then i felt choking with anger i became as one possessed i shook my fist at the durance erect facing the window i insulted it wicked thing i shouted amidst the tumult of the waters i loved you fondly you were my first sweetheart and now you are plundering me you come and disturb my farm and carry off my cattle ah cursed cursed thing then you gave me babet you ran gently at the edge of my meadows i took you for a good mother i remembered uncle lazare felt affection for your limpid stream and i thought i owed you gratitude you are a barbarous mother i only owe you my hatred but the durance stifled my cries with its thundering voice and broad and indifferent expanded and drove its flood onward with tranquil obstinacy i turned back to the room and went and kissed babet who was weeping little marie was smiling in her sleep don't be afraid i said to my wife the water cannot always rise it will certainly go down there is no danger no there is no danger jacques repeated feverishly the house is solid at that moment marguerite who had approached the window tormented by that feeling of curiosity which is the outcome of fear 
leant forward like a mad thing and fell uttering a cry i threw myself before the window but could not prevent jacques plunging into the water marguerite had nursed him and he felt the tenderness of a son for the poor old woman babet had risen in terror with joined hands at the sound of the two splashes she remained there erect with open mouth and distended eyes watching the window i had seated myself on the wooden handrail and my ears were ringing with the roar of the flood i do not know how long it was that babet and i were in this painful state of stupor when a voice called to me it was jacques who was holding on to the wall beneath the window i stretched out my hand to him and he clambered up babet clasped him in her arms she could sob now and she relieved herself no reference was made to marguerite jacques did not dare say he had been unable to find her and we did not dare question him anent his search he took me apart and brought me back to the window father he said to me in an undertone there are more than seven feet of water in the courtyard and the river is still rising we cannot remain here any longer jacques was right the house was falling to pieces the planks of the outbuildings were going away one by one then this death of marguerite weighed upon us babet bewildered was beseeching us marie alone remained peaceful in the big bed with her doll between her arms and slumbering with the happy smile of an angel the peril increased at every minute the water was on the point of reaching the handrail of the window and pouring into the room any one would have said that it was an engine of war making the farmhouse totter with regular dull hard blows the current must be running right against the facade and we could not hope for any human assistance every minute is precious said jacques in agony we shall be crushed beneath the ruins let us look for boards let us make a raft he said that in his excitement i would naturally have preferred a thousand times to be in the middle of the river on a few beams lashed together than beneath the roof of this house which was about to fall in but where could we lay hands on the beams we required in a rage i tore the planks from the cupboards jacques broke the furniture we took away the shutters every piece of wood we could reach and feeling it was impossible to utilize these fragments we cast them into the middle of the room in a fury and continued searching our last hope was departing we understood our misery and want of power the river was rising the harsh voice of the durance was calling to us in anger then i burst out sobbing i took babet in my trembling arms i begged jacques to come near us i wished us all to die in the same embrace jacques had returned to the window and suddenly he exclaimed father we are saved come and see the sky was clear the roof of a shed torn away by the current had come to a standstill beneath our window this roof which was several yards broad was formed of light beams and thatch it floated and would make a capital raft I joined my hands together and would have worshipped this wood and straw jacques jumped on the roof after having firmly secured it he walked on the thatch making sure it was everywhere strong the thatch resisted therefore we could adventure on it without fear oh it will carry us all very well said jacques joyfully see how little it sinks into the water the difficulty will be to steer it he looked around him and seized two poles drifting along in the current as they passed by ah here are oars he continued you will go to the stern father and i forward and we will maneuver the raft easily there are not twelve feet of water quick quick get on board we must not lose a minute my poor babet tried to smile she wrapped little marie carefully up in her shawl the child had just woke up and quite alarmed maintained a silence which was broken by deep sobs i placed a chair before the window and made babet get on the raft 
as i held her in my arms i kissed her with poignant emotion feeling this kiss was the last the water was beginning to pour into the room our feet were soaking i was the last to embark then i undid the cord the current hurled us against the wall it required precautions and many efforts to quit the farmhouse the fog had little by little dispersed it was about midnight when we left the stars were still buried in mist the moon which was almost at the edge of the horizon lit up the night with a sort of wan daylight the inundation then appeared to us in all its grandiose horror the valley had become a river the durance swollen to enormous proportions and washing the two hillsides passed between dark masses of cultivated land and was the sole thing displaying life in the inanimate space bounded by the horizon it thundered with a sovereign voice maintaining in its anger the majesty of its colossal wave clumps of trees emerged in places staining the sheet of pale water with black streaks opposite us i recognized the tops of the oaks along the walk the current carried us towards these branches which for us were so many wreaths around the raft floated various kinds of remains pieces of wood empty barrels bundles of grass the river was bearing along the ruins it had made in its anger to the left we perceived the lights of durg flashes of lanterns moving about in the darkness the water could not have risen as high as the village only the low land had been submerged no doubt assistance would come we searched the patches of light hanging over the water it seemed to us at every instant that we heard the sound of oars we had started at random as soon as the raft was in the middle of the current lost amidst the whirlpools of the river anguish of mind overtook us again we almost regretted having left the farm i sometimes turned round and gazed at the house which still remained standing presenting a gray aspect on the white water babet crouching down in the centre of the raft in the thatch of the roof was holding little marie on her knees the child's head against her breast to hide the horror of the river from her both were bent double leaning forward in an embrace as if reduced in stature by fear jacques standing upright in the front was leaning on his pole with all his weight from time to time he cast a rapid glance towards us and then silently resumed his task i seconded him as well as i could but our efforts to reach the bank remained fruitless little by little notwithstanding our poles which we buried into the mud until we nearly broke them we drifted into the open a force that seemed to come from the depths of the water drove us away the durance was slowly taking possession of us struggling bathed in perspiration we had worked ourselves into a passion we were fighting with the river as with a living being seeking to vanquish wound kill it it strained us in its giant-like arms and our poles in our hands became weapons which we thrust into its breast it roared flung its slaver into our faces wriggled beneath our strokes we resisted its victory with clenched teeth we would not be conquered and we had mad impulses to fell the monster to calm it with blows from our fists we went slowly towards the offing we were already at the entrance to the oak tree walk the dark branches pierced through the water which they tore with a lamentable sound death perhaps awaited us there in a collision i cried out to jacques to follow the walk by clinging close to the branches and it was thus that i passed for the last time in the middle of this oak tree alley where i had walked in my youth and ripe age in the terrible darkness above the howling depth i thought of uncle lazare and saw the happy days of my youth smiling at me sadly the durance triumphed at the end of the alley our poles no longer touched the bottom the water bore us along in its impetuous bound of victory 
and now it could do what it pleased with us we gave ourselves up we went downstream with frightful rapidity great clouds dirty tattered rags hung about the sky when the moon was hidden there came lugubrious obscurity then we rolled in chaos enormous billows as black as ink resembling the backs of fish bore us along spinning us round i could no longer see either babet or the children i already felt myself dying i know not how long this last run lasted the moon was suddenly unveiled and the horizon became clear and in that light i perceived an immense black mass in front of us which blocked the way and towards which we were being carried with all the violence of the current we were lost we would be broken there babet had stood upright she held out little marie to me take the child she exclaimed leave me alone leave me alone jacques had already caught babet in his arms in a loud voice he said father save the little one i will save mother we had come close to the black mass i thought i recognized a tree the shock was terrible and the raft split in two scattered its straw and beams in the whirlpool of water i fell clasping little marie tightly to me the icy cold water brought back all my courage on rising to the surface of the river i supported the child i half laid her on my neck and began to swim laboriously if the little creature had not lost consciousness but had struggled we should both have remained at the bottom of the deep and whilst i swam i felt choking with anxiety i called jacques i tried to see in the distance but i heard nothing save the roar of the waters i saw naught but the pale sheet of the durance jacques and babet were at the bottom she must have clung to him dragged him down in a deadly strain of her arms what frightful agony i wanted to die i sunk slowly i was going to find them beneath the black water and as soon as the flood touched little marie's face i struggled again with impetuous anguish to get near the water's side it was thus that i abandoned babet and jacques in despair at having been unable to die with them still calling out to them in a husky voice the river cast me on the stones like one of those bundles of grass it leaves on its way when i came to myself again i took my daughter who was opening her eyes in my arms day was breaking my winter night was at an end that terrible night which had been an accomplice in the murder of my wife and son at this moment after years of regret one last consolation remains to me i am the icy winter but i feel the approaching spring stirring within me as my uncle lazar said we never die i have had four seasons and here i am returning to the spring there is my dear marie commencing the everlasting joys and sorrows over again End of Jean Gourdon's Four Days, Part 4, by Emile Zola International Short Stories, Volume 3, French Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Lynn Thompson International Short Stories, Volume 3 French Stories, compiled and translated by Francis J. Reynolds Baron de Tronc by Clemence Robert Baron de Tronc already had endured a year of arbitrary imprisonment in the fortress of Glatz, ignorant alike of the cause of his detention or the length of time which he was destined to spend in captivity during the early part of the month of september major du aide to the governor of the prison of glatz entered the prisoner's apartment for a domiciliary visit accompanied by an adjutant and the officer of the guard 
it was noon the excessive heat of the dying summer had grown almost unsupportable in the tower chamber where baron de tronc was confined half empty flagons were scattered among the books which littered his table but the repeated draughts in which the prisoner had sought refreshment had only served to add to his ever-increasing exasperation the major ransacked every nook and corner of the prisoner's chamber and the interior of such pieces of furniture as might afford a possible hiding place remarking the annoyance which this investigation caused the baron do said arrogantly the general has issued his orders and it is a matter of little consequence to him whether or not they displease you your attempts to escape have greatly incensed him against you and i retorted tronc with like hauteur am equally indifferent to your general's displeasure i shall continue to dispose of my time as may best please me good replied the major but in your own interest you'll be wiser to philosophize with your books and seek the key to the sciences rather than that of the fortress i do not need your advice major the baron observed with sovereign disdain you may perhaps repent later that you did not heed it your attempts to escape have angered even the king and it is impossible to say just how far his severity toward you may go but great heavens when i am deprived of my liberty without cause have i not the right to endeavour to regain it they do not see the matter in that light in berlin as a matter of fact this spirit of revolt against your sovereign only serves to greatly aggravate your crime my crime tronk exclaimed trembling with anger his glance fell upon the major's sword and the thought came to him to tear it from his side and pierce his throat with it but in the same instant it occurred to him that he might rather profit by the situation pale and trembling as he was he retained sufficient self-control to mollify the expression of his countenance and the tone of his voice though his glance remained fixed upon the sword major he said no one can be called a criminal until he has been so adjudged by the courts happily a man's honour does not depend upon the inconsequent malicious opinion of others on the contrary blame should attach to him who condemns the accused without a hearing no constituted power whether that of king or judge has yet convicted me of any culpable action apart from the courtesy which should be observed between officers of the same rank you out of simple justice should refrain from such an accusation every one knows retorted do that you entered into relations with the enemy i great god do you not consider the pandours then as such i visited their chief solely as a relative a glass of wine shared with him in his tent can hardly be construed into a dangerous alliance but you hoped to inherit great riches from this relative that hope might well impel you to cross the frontier of bohemia for all time why that egregious folly what more could i hope for than that which i already possessed in berlin was i a poor adventurer seeking his fortune by his sword rich in my own right enjoying to the full the king's favour attached to the court by all that satisfied pride could demand as well as by ties of the tenderest sentiments what more was there for me to covet or to seek elsewhere the major turned his head aside with an air of indifference one single fact suffices to discount everything you have said baron he said dryly you have twice attempted to escape from the fortress an innocent man awaits his trial with confidence knowing that it cannot be other than favourable the culprit alone flees tronc though quivering with blind rage continued to maintain his former attitude his features composed his eyes fixed upon the major's sword sir he said in three weeks on the twenty fifth of september I shall have been a prisoner for one year you in your position may not have found the time long but to me it has dragged interminably and it has been still harder for me to bear 
because i have not been able to count the days or hours which still separate me from justice and liberty if i knew the limit set to my captivity no matter what it may be i could surely find resignation and patience to await it it is most unfortunate then said the major that no one could give you that information say rather would not replied tromp surely something of the matter must be known here you for instance major might tell me frankly what you think to be the case ah said do assuming the self-satisfied manner of a jailer it would not be proper for me to answer that you would save me from despair and revolt replied tronk warmly for i give you my word of honour that from the moment i know when my captivity is to terminate no matter when that may be or what my subsequent fate i will make no further attempts to evade it by flight and you want me to tell you yes interrupted tronk with a shudder yes once again i ask you do smiled maliciously as he answered the end of your captivity why a traitor can scarcely hope for release the heat of the day the wine he had drunk overwhelming anger and his fiery blood all mounted to tronk's head incapable of further self-restraint he flung himself upon the major tore the coveted sword from his side dashed out of the chamber flung the two sentinels at the door down the stairs took their entire length himself at a single bound and sprang into the midst of the assembled guards tronk fell upon them with his sword showering blows right and left the blade flashed snake-like in his powerful grasp the soldiers falling back before the fierce onslaught having disabled four of the men the prisoner succeeded in forcing his way past the remainder and raced for the first rampart there he mounted the rampart and never stopping to gauge its height sprang down into the moat landing upon his feet in the bottom of the dry ditch faster still he flew to the second rampart and scaled it as he had done the first clambering up by means of projecting stones and interstices it was just past noon the sun blazed full upon the scene and every one within the prison stood astounded at the miraculous flight in which tronk seemed to fairly soar through the air those of the soldiers whom tronk had not overthrown pursued but with little hope of overtaking him their guns were unloaded so that they were unable to shoot after him not a soldier dared to risk trying to follow him by the road he had taken over the ramparts and moats for without that passion for liberty which lent wings to the prisoner there was no hope of any of them scaling the walls without killing himself a dozen times over they were therefore compelled to make use of the regular passages to the outer posterns and these latter being located at a considerable distance from the prisoner's avenue of escape he was certain at the pace he was maintaining to gain at least a half hour's start over his pursuers once beyond the walls of the prison with the woods close by it seemed as if tronk's escape was assured beyond doubt he had now come to a narrow passageway leading to the last of the inner posterns which pierced the walls here he found a sentinel on guard and the soldier sprang up to confront him but a soldier to overcome was not an obstacle to stop the desperate flight of the baron he struck the man heavily in the face with his sword stunning him and sending him rolling in the dust once through the postern there now remained only a single palisade or stockade a great fence constructed of iron bars and iron trellis work which constituted the outermost barrier between the fleeing prisoner and liberty once over that iron palisade he had only to dash into the woods and disappear but it was ordained that tronk was not to overcome this last obstacle simple as it appeared at a fatal moment his foot was caught between two bars of the palisade and he was unable to free himself while he was engaged in superhuman but futile efforts to release his foot the sentinel of the passage who had picked himself up ran through the postern toward the palisade followed by another soldier from the garrison together they fell upon tronk overwhelming him with blows with the butts of their muskets and secured him 
bruised and bleeding he was borne back to his cell major du informed tronk after this abortive attempt to escape that he had been condemned to one year's imprisonment only that year was within three weeks of expiring when the infamous major who was an italian goaded the unfortunate young man into open defiance of his sovereign's mandate his pardon was at once annulled and his confinement now became most rigorous another plot headed by three officers and several soldiers of the guard who were friendly to tronk was discovered at the last moment in time for the conspirators themselves to escape to bohemia but under circumstances which prevented baron de tronk from accompanying them it also served to increase the hardships of the prisoner's lot and he now found himself deprived of the former companionship of his friends and surrounded by strangers the one familiar face remaining being that of lieutenant bach a danish officer a braggart swordsman and ruffler who had always been hostile to him but despite his isolation the energy and strength of tronk's character were only augmented by his misfortunes and he never ceased to plot for his deliverance weeks passed without any fruitful event occurring in the life of the prisoner yet help was to come to him from a source from which he could never have expected it but before that fortuitous result was destined to take place in fact as preliminary to its achievement he was destined to be an actor in the most remarkable scene that ever has been recorded in the annals of prison life and in one of the strangest duels of modern times one day tronk had cast himself fully clothed upon his bed in order to obtain a change of position in his cramped place of confinement lieutenant bach was on duty as his guard the young baron had retained in prison the proud and haughty demeanour which had formerly brought upon him so much censure at court lieutenant bach's countenance also bore the imprint of incarnate pride the two exchanged from time to time glances of insolence for the rest they remained silently smoking side by side tronk was the first to break the silence for prisoners grasp every opportunity for conversation and at any price it appears to me your hand is wounded lieutenant tronk said have you found another opportunity to cross swords lieutenant shell it seemed to me looked somewhat obliquely at me replied the dame therefore i indulged him in a pass or two directed against his right arm such a delicate youth and so mild-mannered are you not ashamed what could i do there was no one else at hand nevertheless he seems to have wounded you yes accidentally though without knowing what he did the fact then of having been expelled from two regiments for your high-handed acts and finally transferred to the garrison of the fortress of glatz as punishment has not cured you of your fire-eating propensities when a man has the reputation of being the best swordsman in prussia he values that title somewhat more than your military rank which any clumsy fool can obtain you the best swordsman exclaimed tronk concluding his remark with an ironical puff of smoke i flatter myself that such is the case retorted bark emitting in turn a great cloud of tobacco smoke if i were free said tronk i might perhaps prove to you in short order that such is not the case do you claim to be my master at that art i flatter myself that such is the case that we shall soon see cried bark flushing with rage how can we i am disarmed and a prisoner ah yes you make your claim out of sheer boastfulness because you think we cannot put it to the test truly lieutenant set me at liberty and i swear to you that on the other side of the frontier we will put our skill to the test as freely as you like well i am unwilling to wait for that we will fight here baron tronk in this room after your assertion i must either humble your arrogance or lose my reputation i shall be glad to know how you propose to do so ah you talk of bohemia because that country is far away as for me i prefer this one because it affords an immediate opportunity to put the matter to the test i should ask nothing better if it were not impossible impossible you shall see if it be bach sprang up an old door supported by a couple of benches 
had been placed in the chamber for a table he hammered at the worm-eaten wood and knocked off a strip which he split in half one of these substitutes for rapiers he gave to tronk retaining the other himself and both placed themselves on guard after the first few passes tronk sent his adversary's makeshift sword flying through space and with his own he met the lieutenant full in the chest touche he cried heavens it is true growled bach but i'll have my revenge he went out hastily tronk watched him in utter amazement and he was even more astounded when an instant later he saw bach return with a couple of swords which he drew out from beneath his uniform now he said to tronk it is for you to show what you can do with good steel you risk returned the baron smiling calmly you risk over and above the danger of being wounded losing that absolute superiority in matters of the sword of which you are so proud defend yourself braggart shouted bach show your skill instead of talking about it he flung himself furiously upon tronk the latter seemingly only to trifle lightly with his weapon at first parried his thrusts and then pressed the attack in turn wounding bach severely in the arm the lieutenant's weapon clattered upon the floor for an instant he paused immovable overcome by amazement then an irresistible admiration a supreme tenderness invaded his soul he flung himself weeping in tronk's arms exclaiming you are my master then drawing away from the prisoner he contemplated him with the same enthusiasm but more reflectively and observed yes baron you far exceed me in the use of the sword you are the greatest duelist of the day and a man of your caliber must not remain longer in prison the baron was somewhat taken by surprise at this but with his usual presence of mind he immediately set himself to derive such profit as he might from his guardian's extravagant access of affection yes my dear bach he replied yes i should be free for the reason you mention and by every right but where is the man who will assist me to escape from these walls here baron said the lieutenant you shall regain your freedom as surely as my name is bach oh i believe in you my worthy friend cried tronk you will keep your word wait resumed bach reflectively you cannot leave the citadel without the assistance of an officer i should compromise you at every step you have just seen what a hot-tempered scatterbrain i am but i have in mind one who admires you profoundly you shall know who he is to-night and together we will set you at liberty bach did in fact redeem his promise he introduced lieutenant shell who was to be tronk's companion during their arduous flight into bohemia into the prisoner's cell and himself obtained leave of absence for the purpose of securing funds for his fellow conspirators the plot was discovered before his return and shell warned of this by one of the governor's adjutants hastened the day of their flight in scaling the first rampart shell fell and sprained his ankle so severely that he could not use it but tronk was equal to all emergencies he would not abandon his companion he placed him across his shoulders and thus burdened climbed the outer barriers and wandered all night in the bitter cold fleeing through the snow to escape his pursuers in the morning by a clever ruse he secured two horses and thus mounted he and his companion succeeded in reaching bohemia tronk directed his course towards brandenburg where his sister dwelt near the prussian and bohemian frontiers in the castle of valdau for he counted upon her assistance to enable him to settle in a foreign land where he would be safe the two friends reduced shortly to the direst poverty parted with their horses and all but the most necessary wearing apparel even now though in bohemia they were not free from pursuit impelled one night through hunger and cold to throw themselves upon the bounty of an innkeeper they found in him a loyal and true friend the worthy host revealed to them the true identity of four supposed travelling merchants who had that day accosted them on the road and followed them to the inn these men were in fact 
emissaries from the fortress of Glatz, who had attempted to bribe him to betray the fugitives into their hands, for they were sworn to capture Tronk and his companion, and return them dead or alive to the enraged governor of the fortress. In the morning the four Prussians, the carriage, the driver, and the horses set forth and soon disappeared in the distance. Two hours later, the fugitives, fortified by a good breakfast, took their departure from the Essenstockau Inn, leaving behind them a man whom they at least esteemed as the greatest honour to mankind. The travellers hastened toward Dankov. They chose the most direct route and tramped along in the open without a thought of the infamous spies who might already be on their track. They arrived at nightfall at their destination, however, without further hindrance. The next day they set out for Parsimachi, in Bohemia. They started early, and a day in the open, together with a night's sleep, had almost obliterated the memory of their adventures at the inn. The cold was intense. The day was grey with heavy clouds that no longer promised rain, but which shrouded the country with a pall of gloom. The wind swirled and howled, and though the two friends struggled to keep their few thin garments drawn closely about them, they still searched the horizon hopefully, thinking of the journey's end and the peaceful existence which awaited them. To their right, the aspect of the countryside had altered somewhat. Great wooded stretches spread away into the distance, while to the left all was yet free and open. They had gone about half a mile past the first clump of trees when they noticed, through the swaying branches by the roadside, a motionless object around which several men busied themselves. With every step they gained a clearer impression of the nature of this obstacle, until at last an expression of half mockery, half anger, overspread their features. "'Now God forgive me!' exclaimed Shell finally. "'But that is the infernal brown travelling carriage from the inn.' May the devil take me, rejoined Tronk, if I delay or flee a step from those miserable rascals. And they strode sturdily onward. As soon as they were within speaking distance, one of the Prussians, a big man in a furred cap, believing them to be wholly unsuspicious, called to them, My dear sirs, in heaven's name, come help us. Our carriage has been overturned, and it is impossible to get it out of this rut. The friends had reached an angle of the road where a few withered tree branches alone separated them from the others. They perceived the brown body of the carriage, half open like a huge rat trap, and beside it the forbidden faces of their would-be captors. Tronk launched these words through the intervening screen of branches. Go to the devil, miserable scoundrels that you are, and may you remain there. Then, swift as an arrow, he sped toward the open fields to the left of the high road, feigning flight. The carriage, which had been overturned solely for the purpose of misleading them, was soon righted, and the driver lashed his horses forward in pursuit of the fugitives, the four Prussians accompanying him with drawn pistols. When they were almost within reaching distance of their prey, they raised their pistols and shouted, Surrender, rascals, or you are dead men! This was what Tronk desired. He wheeled about and discharged his pistol, sending a bullet through the first Prussian's breast, stretching him dead upon the spot. At the same moment, Shell fired, but his assailants returned the shot and wounded him. Tronk again discharged his pistol twice in succession. Then, as one of the Prussians, who was apparently still uninjured, took to flight across the plain, he sped furiously after him. The pursuit continued some two or three hundred paces. The Prussian, as if impelled by some irresistible force, whirled around and Tronk caught sight of his blanched countenance and blood-stained linen. One of the shots had struck him. Instantly, Tronk put an end to the half-finished task with a sword thrust, but the time wasted on the Prussian had cost him dear. Returning hastily to the field of action, he perceived Shell struggling in the grasp of the two remaining Prussians. Wounded as he was, he had been unable to cope single-handed with them, and was rapidly being borne toward the carriage. Courage, Shell! Tronk shouted. I am coming. At the sound of his friend's voice, Shell felt himself saved. 
by a supreme effort he succeeded in releasing himself from his captors frantic with rage and disappointment the prussians again advanced to the attack upon the two wretched fugitives but tronk's blood was up he made a furious onslaught upon them with his sword driving them back step by step to their carriage into which they finally tumbled shouting to the driver in frantic haste to whip up his horses as the carriage dashed away the friends drew long breaths of relief and wiped away the blood and powder stains from their heated brows careless of their sufferings these iron-hearted men merely congratulated each other upon their victory ah it's well indeed shell exclaimed tronk and i rejoice that we have had this opportunity to chastise the miserable traitors but you are wounded my poor shell it is nothing the lieutenant replied carelessly merely a wound in the throat and i think another in the head this was the last attempt for a considerable time to regain possession of tronk's person but the two friends suffered greatly from hardships and were made to feel more than once the cruelty of prussian oppression even tronk's sister instigated thereto by her husband who feared to incur the displeasure of frederick the great refused the poor fugitive shelter money or as much as a crust of bread and this after tronk had jeopardized his liberty by returning to prussian soil in order to meet her it was at this period when starvation stared the exiles in the face that tronk met the russian general Levin, a relative of tronk's mother who offered the baron a captaincy in the tobolsk dragoons and furnished him with the money necessary for his equipment tronk and shell were now compelled to part the latter journeying to italy to rejoin relatives there the baron to go to russia where he was to attain the highest eminence of grandeur baron de tronk on his journey to russia passed through danzig which was at that time neutral territory bordering upon the confines of prussia here he delayed for a time in the hope of meeting with his cousin the pandour during the interim he formed an intimacy with a young prussian officer named henry whom he assisted lavishly with money almost daily they indulged in excursions in the environs the prussian acting as guide one morning while at his toilet tronk's servant karl who was devoted to him body and soul observed lieutenant henry will enjoy himself thoroughly on your excursion tomorrow why do you say that karl asked the baron because he has planned to take your honour to langfour at ten o'clock at ten or eleven the hour is not of importance no you must be there on the stroke of ten by the village clock langfour is on the prussian border and under prussian rule prussia exclaimed tronk shaking his head which karl had not finished powdering are you quite sure perfectly eight prussians non-commissioned officers and soldiers will be in the courtyard of the charming little inn that lieutenant henry described so well as soon as your honour crosses the threshold they will fall upon you and bear you off to a carriage which will be in waiting finish dressing my hair karl said tronk recovering his wonted impassibility oh for that matter continued the valet they will have neither muskets nor pistols they will be armed with swords only that will leave them free to fall bodily upon your honour and to prevent you using your weapon is that all karl no there will be two soldiers detailed especially for my benefit so that i can't get away to give the alarm well is that all no the carriage is to convey your honour to Levenberg in pomerania and you must cross a portion of the province of danzig to get there besides the under officers at the inn who will travel with your honour two others will accompany the carriage on horseback to prevent any outcry while you are on neutral ground famously planned monsieur reimer the prussian resident here outlined the plot and appointed lieutenant henry to carry it out afterward karl that's all this time and it's enough yes but i regret that it should end thus for your account has greatly interested me your honour may take it that all i have said is absolutely correct but when did you obtain this information oh just now and from whom france lieutenant henry's valet 
when we were watching the horses beneath the big pines while your honours waited in that roadside pavilion for the shower to pass over is his information reliable of course as no one suspected him the whole matter was discussed freely before him and he betrayed the secret yes because he greatly admires your honour and wasn't willing to see you treated so carl give him ten ducats from my purse and tell him i will take him in my own service for he has afforded me great pleasure the outing to-morrow will be a hundred times more amusing than i had hoped indeed more amusing than any i have ever undertaken in my life your honour will go to langfour then certainly carl we will go together and you shall see if i misled you when i promised you a delightful morning as soon as baron de tronc had completed his toilet he visited monsieur scherer the russian resident spent a few moments in private with him and then returned to his apartments for dinner lieutenant henry arrived soon afterward tronc found delight in the course of dissimulation to which he stood committed he overwhelmed his guest with courteous attentions pressing upon him the finest wines and his favorite fruits meanwhile beaming upon him with an affection that overspread his whole countenance and expatiating freely upon the delights of the morrow's ride henry accepted his attentions with his accustomed dreamy manner the next morning at half past nine when the lieutenant arrived he found tronc awaiting him the two officers rode off followed by their servants and took the road to langfour tronc's audacity was terrifying even carl who was well aware of his master's great ability and cleverness was nevertheless uneasy and Franz, who was less familiar with the baron's character was in a state of the greatest alarm the country beautiful with its verdant grasslands its budding bushes and flowers its rich fields of wheat dotted with spring blossoms revealed itself to their delighted eyes in the distance glistened the tavern of langfour with its broad red and blue stripes and its tempting signboard that displayed a well-appointed festive table the low door in the wall that enclosed the tavern courtyard was still closed inside to the right of that door was a little terrace and against the wall was an arbor formed of running vines and ivy lieutenant henry pausing near a clump of trees some two hundred paces from the tavern said baron our horses will be in the way in that little courtyard i think it would be well to leave them here in the care of our servants until our return tronc assented readily he sprang from his horse and tossed his bridle to his valet and henry did the same the path leading to the tavern was enchanting with its carpet of flowers and moss and the two young men advanced arm in arm in the most affectionate manner Karl and Franz watched them overwhelmed with anxiety The door in the wall had been partly opened as they approached and the young men saw within the arbor on the terrace the resident Herr Reimer His three-cornered hat on his powdered wig his arms crossed on the top of the adjacent wall as he awaited their coming as soon as the officers were within earshot he called out come on baron de tronc breakfast is ready the two officers were almost at the threshold tronc slackened his pace somewhat then he felt henry grip his arm more closely and forcibly drag him towards the doorway tronc energetically freed his arm upon observing this movement that spoke so eloquently of betrayal and twice struck the lieutenant with such violence that henry was thrown to the ground Reimer, the resident, realizing that Tronc knew of the plot, saw that the time had come to resort to armed intervention. Soldiers, in the name of Prussia, I command you to arrest Baron de Tronc, he shouted to the men who were posted in the courtyard. Soldiers, in the name of Russia, Tronc shouted, brandishing his sword, kill these brigands who are violating the rights of the country. At these words, six Russian dragoons emerged suddenly from a field of wheat and running up fell upon the prussians who had rushed from the courtyard at the resident's command this unexpected attack took the prussians by surprise they defended themselves only half-heartedly and finally they fled in disorder throwing away their weapons and followed by the shots of the russians 
Lieutenant Henry and four soldiers remained in the custody of the victors. Tronk dashed into the arbor to seize resident Rymer, but the only evidence of that personage was his wig, which remained caught in the foliage at an opening in the rear of the arbor through which the resident had made his escape. Tronk then returned to the prisoners as a fitting punishment for the Prussian soldiers He commanded his dragoons to give each of them 50 blows to turn their uniforms wrong side out to decorate their helmets with straw cockades and to drive them thus attired across the frontier While his men proceeded to execute his orders Tronk drew his sword and turned to lieutenant Henry and Now for our affair lieutenant he exclaimed the unfortunate Henry, under the disgrace of his position, lost his presence of mind. Hardly knowing what he did, he drew his sword, but dropped it almost immediately, begging for mercy. Tronk endeavoured to force him to fight, without avail, then, disgusted with the lieutenant's cowardice, he caught up a stick and belaboured him heartily, crying, Rogue, go tell your fellows how Tronk deals with traitors. The people of the inn, attracted by the noise of the conflict, had gathered around the spot, and, as the baron administered the punishment, they added to the shame of the disgraced lieutenant by applauding the baron heartily. The punishment over the sentence of the Prussians having been carried out, Tronk returned to the city with his six dragoons and two servants. In this affair, as throughout his entire career, Tronk was simply faithful to the rule which he had adopted to guide him through life Always face danger rather than avoid it End of Baron de Tronc by Clemence Robert International Short Stories, Volume 3, French Stories this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. International Short Stories, Volume 3, French Stories Compiled and translated by Francis J. Reynolds The Passage of the Red Sea by Henri Mouget for five or six years, Marcel had been engaged upon the famous painting, which he said was meant to represent the passage of the Red Sea. And for five or six years, this masterpiece in color had been obstinately refused by the jury. Indeed, from its constant journeying back and forth, from the artist's studio to the musée, and from the musée to the studio, the painting knew the road so well that one need only to set it on rollers, and it would have been quite capable of reaching the Louvre alone. Marcel, who had repainted the picture ten times, and minutely gone over it from top to bottom, vowed that only a personal hostility on the part of the members of the jury could account for the ostracism which annually turned him away from the salon, and in his idle moments he had composed in honor of those watchdogs of the institute a little dictionary of insults with illustrations of a savage irony this collection gained celebrity and enjoyed among the studios and in the ecole des beaux-arts the same sort of popular success as that achieved by the immortal complaint of giovanni bellini painter by appointment to the grand sultan of the turks every dauber in paris had a copy stored away in his memory for a long time Marcel had not allowed himself to be discouraged by the emphatic refusal which greeted him at each exposition. He was comfortably settled in his opinion that his picture was, in a modest way, the companion piece long awaited by the wedding of Cana, that gigantic masterpiece whose dazzled splendor the dust of three centuries had not dimmed. Accordingly, each year at the time of the Salon, Marcel sent his picture to be examined by the jury, only in order to throw the examiners off the track, and if possible to make them abandon the policy of exclusion, which they seemed to have adopted toward the passage of the Red Sea. 
Marcel, without in any way disturbing the general scheme of his picture, modified certain details and changed its title. For instance, on one occasion it arrived before the jury under the name of The Passage of the Rubicon, but Pharaoh, poorly disguised under Caesar's mantle, was recognized and repulsed with all the honors that were his due. The following year Marcel spread over the level plane of his picture a layer of white representing snow, planted a pine tree in one corner, and clothing an Egyptian as a grenadier of the Imperial Guard, rechristened the painting The Passage of the Beresina. The jury, which on that very day had polished its spectacles on the lining of its illustrious coat, was not in any way taken in by this new ruse. It recognized perfectly well the persistent painting, above all by a big brute of a horse of many colors, which was rearing out of one of the waves of the Red Sea. The coat of that horse had served Marcel for all his experiments in color, and in private conversation he called it his synoptic table of fine tones, because he had reproduced in their play of light and shade, all possible combinations of color. But once again, insensible to this detail, the jury seemed scarcely able to find black balls enough to emphasize their refusal of the passage of the Beresina. Very well, said Marcel, no more than I expected. Next year I shall send it back under the title of Passage de Panorama. That will be one on them, on them, on them, 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 sang the musician Chonard, fitting the words to a new air he had been composing. A terrible air, noisy as a gamut of thunderclaps, and the accompaniment to which was a terror to every piano in the neighborhood. How could they refuse that picture? without having every drop of the vermilion in my Red Sea rise up in their faces and cover them with shame, murmured Marcel, as he gazed at the painting. When one thinks that it contains a good hundred crowns worth of paint and a million of genius, not to speak of the fair days of my youth, fast growing bald as my hat, but they shall never have the last word. Until my dying breath I shall keep on sending them my painting. I want to have it engraved upon their memory. That is certainly the surest way of ever getting it engraved, said Gustave Colline, in a plaintive voice, adding to himself, that was a good one, that was, really a good one. I must get that off the next time I'm asked out. Marcel continued his imprecations which Chonard continued to set to music. Oh, they won't accept me, said Marcel. Ah, the government pays them, boards them, gives them the cross, solely for the one purpose of refusing me once a year, on the first of March. I see their idea clearly now. I see it perfectly clearly. They are trying to drive me to break my brushes. They hope, perhaps, by refusing my Red Sea, to make me throw myself out of the window in despair. But they know very little of the human heart if they expect to catch me with such a clumsy trick. I shall no longer wait for the time of the annual salon. Beginning with today, my work becomes the canvas of Damocles, eternally suspended over their existence. From now on, I'm going to send it once a week to each one of them, at their homes, in the bosom of their families, in the full heart of their private life. It shall trouble their domestic joy. It shall make them think that their wine is sour, their dinner burned, their wives bad-tempered. They will very soon become insane, and will have to be put in straitjackets when they go to the Institute on the days when there are meetings. That idea pleases me. A few days later, when Marcel had already forgotten his terrible plans for vengeance upon his persecutors, he received a visit from Father Medicis, for that was the name by which the Brotherhood called a certain Jew, whose real name was Solomon, 
and who at that time was well known throughout the bohemia of art and literature, with which he constantly had dealings. Father Medicis dealt in all sorts of bric-a-brac. He sold complete house furnishings for from twelve francs up to a thousand crowns. He would buy anything and knew how to sell it again at a profit. His shop, situated in the Place du Carousel, was a fairy spot where one could find everything that one might wish. All the products of nature, all the creations of art, all that comes forth from the bowels of the earth or from the genius of man, Medicis found it profitable to trade in. His dealings included everything, absolutely everything that exists. He even put a price upon the ideal. Medicis would even buy ideas, to use himself or to sell again. Known to all writers and artists, intimate friend of the palate, familiar spirit of the writing desk, he was the Asmodeus of the arts. He would sell you cigars in exchange for the plot of a dime novel, slippers for a sonnet, a fresh catch of fish for a paradox. He would talk at so much an hour with newspaper reporters, whose duty was to record the lively capers of the smart set. He would get you passes to the Parliament buildings or invitations to private parties. He gave lodgings by the night, the week, or the month to homeless artists, who paid him by making copies of old masters in the Louvre. The green room had no secrets for him. He could place your plays for you with some manager. He could obtain for you all sorts of favors. He carried in his head a copy of the almanac of twenty-five thousand addresses, and knew the residence, the name, and the secrets of all the celebrities even the obscure ones. In entering the abode of the Bohemians with that knowing air which characterized him, the Jew divined that he had arrived at a propitious moment. As a matter of fact, the four friends were at that moment gathered in council, and under the domination of a ferocious appetite were discussing the grave question of bread and meat. It was Sunday, the last day of the month, Fatal day, sinister of date. The entrance of Medicis was accordingly greeted with a joyous chorus, for they knew that the Jew was too avaricious of his time to waste it in mere visits of civility. Accordingly, his presence always announced that he was open to a bargain. Good evening, gentlemen, said the Jew. How are you? Colline, said Rodolphe, from where he lay upon the bed sunk in the delights of maintaining a horizontal line, practice the duties of hospitality, and offer our guest a chair. A guest is sacred. I salute you, Abraham, added the poet. Colline drew forward a chair which had about as much elasticity as a piece of bronze, and offered it to the Jew. Medicis let himself fall into the chair, and started to complain of its hardness, when he remembered that, he himself had once traded it off to Colleen in exchange for a profession of faith, which he afterwards sold to a deputy. As he sat down, the pockets of the Jew gave forth a silvery sound, and this melodious symphony threw the four Bohemians into a reverie that was full of sweetness. Now, said Rodolphe in a low tone to Marcel, let us hear the song. The accompaniment sounds all right. Monsieur Marcel, said Medicis, I have come simply to make your fortune. That is to say, I have come to offer you a superb opportunity to enter into the world of art. Art, as you very well know, Monsieur Marcel, is an arid road in which glory is the oasis. Father Medicis, said Marcel, who was on coals of impatience, in the name of fifty per cent, your revered patron saint, be brief. Here is the offer, rejoined Medicis, a wealthy amateur who is collecting a picture gallery destined to make the tour of Europe, has commissioned me to procure for him a series of remarkable works. I have come to give you a chance to be included in this collection. In one word, 
I have come to purchase your passage of the Red Sea. Money down? asked Marcel. Money down, answered the Jew, sounding forth the full orchestra of his pockets. Go on, Medicis, said Marcel, pointing to his painting. I wish to leave to you the honor of fixing for yourself the price of that work of art, which is priceless. The Jew laid upon the table fifty crowns in bright new silver. Keep him going, said Marcel. That is a good beginning. Monsieur Marcel, said Medicis, you know very well that my first word is always my last word. I shall add nothing more. But think, fifty crowns, that makes one hundred and fifty francs. That is quite a sum. A paltry sum, answered the artist. Just in the robe of my pharaoh there is fifty crowns worth of cobalt. Pay me at least something for my work. Hear my last word, replied Medicis. I will not add a penny more, but I offer dinner for the crowd, wines included, and after dessert I will pay in gold. Do I hear any one object? howled Colleen, striking three blows of his fist upon the table. It is a bargain. Come on, said Marcel, I agree. I will send for the picture to-morrow, said the Jew. Come, gentlemen, let us start. Your places are all set. The four friends descended the stairs, singing the chorus from the Huguenots. To the table, to the table. Medicis treated the Bohemians in a fashion altogether sumptuous. He offered them a lot of things which up to now had remained for them a mystery. Dating from this dinner, lobster ceased to be a myth to Chonard, and he acquired a passion for that amphibian which was destined to increase to the verge of delirium. The four friends went forth from this splendid feast as intoxicated as on a day of vintage. Their inebriety came near bearing deplorable fruits for Marcel, because as he passed the shop of his tailor at two o'clock in the morning, he absolutely insisted upon awakening his creditor in order to give him, on account, the one hundred and fifty francs that he had just received. But a gleam of reason still awake in the brain of Colleen held back the artist from the brink of this precipice. A week after this festivity, Marcel learned in what gallery his picture had found a place. Passing along the Faubourg Saint Honoré, he stopped in the midst of a crowd that seemed to be staring at a sign newly placed above a shop. This sign was none other than Marcel's painting which had been sold by Medicis to a dealer in provisions. Only the passage of the Red Sea had once again undergone a modification and bore a new title. A steamboat had been added to it, and it was now called In the Port of Marseilles. A flattering ovation arose among the crowd when they discovered the picture, and Marcel, turned away delighted with this triumph and murmured softly the voice of the people is the voice of god end of the passage of the red sea by henri moget international short stories volume three french stories this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. International Short Stories, Volume 3, French Stories, compiled and translated by Francis J. Reynolds. The Woman and the Cat by Marcel Prévost. Yes, said our old friend Tribourdeaux, a man of culture and a philosopher, which is a combination rarely found among army surgeons. Yes, the supernatural is everywhere. It surrounds us and hems us in and permeates us. If science pursues it, it takes flight and cannot be grasped. 
our intellect resembles those ancestors of ours who cleared a few acres of forest whenever they approached the limits of their clearing they heard low growls and saw gleaming eyes everywhere circling them about i myself have had the sensation of having approached the limits of the unknown several times in my life and on one occasion in particular a young lady present interrupted him doctor you are evidently dying to tell us a story come now begin the doctor bowed no i am not in the least anxious i assure you i tell this story as seldom as possible for it disturbs those who hear it and it disturbs me also however if you wish it here it is in eighteen sixty three i was a young physician stationed at orleans in that patrician city full of aristocratic old residences it is difficult to find bachelor apartments and as i like both plenty of air and plenty of room i took up my lodging on the first floor of a large building situated just outside the city near saint Uvert. it had been originally constructed to serve as the warehouse and also as the dwelling of a manufacturer of rugs in course of time the manufacturer had failed and this big barrack that he had built falling out of repair through lack of tenants had been sold for a song with all its furnishings the purchaser hoped to make a future profit out of his purchase for the city was growing in that direction and as a matter of fact i believe that at the present time the house is included within the city limits when i took up my quarters there however the mansion stood alone on the verge of the open country at the end of a straggling street on which a few stray houses produced at dusk the impression of a jaw from which most of the teeth have fallen out i leased one half of the first floor an apartment of four rooms for my bedroom and my study i took the two that fronted on the street in the third room i set up some shelves for my wardrobe and the other room i left empty this made a very comfortable lodging for me and i had for a sort of promenade a broad balcony that ran along the entire front of the building or rather one half of the balcony since it was divided into two parts please note this carefully by a fan of ironwork over which however one could easily climb i had been living there for about two months when one night in july on returning to my rooms i saw with a good deal of surprise a light shining through the windows of the other apartment on the same floor which i had supposed to be uninhabited the effect of this light was extraordinary it lit up with a pale yet perfectly distinct reflection parts of the balcony the street below and a bit of the neighboring fields i thought to myself aha i have a neighbor the idea indeed was not altogether agreeable for i had been rather proud of my exclusive proprietorship on reaching my bedroom i passed noiselessly out upon the balcony but already the light had been extinguished so i went back into my room and sat down to read for an hour or two from time to time i seemed to hear about me as though within the walls light footsteps but after finishing my book i went to bed and speedily fell asleep about midnight i suddenly awoke with a curious feeling that something was standing beside me i raised myself in bed lit a candle and this is what i saw in the middle of the room stood an immense cat gazing upon me with phosphorescent eyes and with its back slightly arched it was a magnificent angora with long fur and a fluffy tail and of a remarkable color exactly like that of the yellow silk that one sees in cocoons so that as the light gleamed upon its coat the animal seemed to be made of gold it slowly moved toward me on its velvety paws softly rubbing its sinuous body against my legs i leaned over to stroke it and it permitted my caress purring and finally leaping upon my knees i noticed then that it was a female cat quite young 
and that she seemed disposed to permit me to pet her as long as ever i would finally however i put her down upon the floor and tried to induce her to leave the room but she leaped away from me and hid herself somewhere among the furniture though as soon as i had blown out my candle she jumped upon my bed being sleepy however i didn't molest her but dropped off into a doze and the next morning when i awoke in broad daylight i could find no sign of the animal at all truly the human brain is a very delicate instrument and one that is easily thrown out of gear before i proceed just sum up for yourselves the facts that i have mentioned a light seen and presently extinguished in an apartment supposed to be uninhabited and a cat of a remarkable color which appeared and disappeared in a way that was slightly mysterious now there isn't anything very strange about that is there very well imagine now that these unimportant facts are repeated day after day and under the same conditions throughout a whole week and then believe me they become of importance enough to impress the mind of a man who is living all alone and to produce in him a slight disquietude such as i spoke of in commencing my story and such as is always caused when one approaches the sphere of the unknown the human mind is so formed that it always unconsciously applies the principle of the causa sufficiens for every series of facts that are identical it demands a cause a law and a vague dismay seizes upon it when it is unable to guess this cause and to trace out this law i am no coward but i have often studied the manifestation of fear in others from its most puerile form in children up to its most tragic phase in madmen i know that it is fed and nourished by uncertainties although when one actually sets himself to investigate the cause this fear is often transformed into simple curiosity i made up my mind therefore to ferret out the truth i questioned my caretaker and found that he knew nothing about my neighbors every morning an old woman came to look after the neighboring apartment my caretaker had tried to question her but either she was completely deaf or else she was unwilling to give him any information for she had refused to answer a single word nevertheless i was able to explain satisfactorily the first thing that i had noted that is to say the sudden extinction of the light at the moment when i entered the house i had observed that the windows next to mine were covered only by long lace curtains and as the two balconies were connected my neighbor whether man or woman had no doubt a wish to prevent any indiscreet inquisitiveness on my part and therefore had always put out the light on hearing me come in to verify this supposition i tried a very simple experiment which succeeded perfectly i had a cold supper brought in one day about noon by my servant and that evening i did not go out when darkness came on i took my station near the window presently i saw the balcony shining with the light that streamed through the windows of the neighboring apartment at once i slipped quietly out upon my balcony and stepped softly over the ironwork that separated the two parts although i knew that i was exposing myself to a positive danger either of falling and breaking my neck or of finding myself face to face with a man i experienced no perturbation reaching the lighted window without having made the slightest noise i found it partly open its curtains which for me were quite transparent since i was on the dark side of the window made me wholly invisible to any one who should look toward the window from the interior of the room i saw a vast chamber furnished quite elegantly though it was obviously out of repair and lighted by a lamp suspended from the ceiling at the end of the room was a low sofa upon which was reclining a woman who seemed to me to be both young and pretty her loosened hair fell over her shoulders in a rain of gold she was looking at herself in a hand mirror 
patting herself, passing her arms over her lips, and twisting about her supple body with a curiously feline grace. Every movement that she made caused her long hair to ripple in glistening undulations. As I gazed upon her I confess that I felt a little troubled, especially when all of a sudden the young girl's eyes were fixed upon me, strange eyes, eyes of a phosphorescent green that gleamed like the flame of a lamp. I was sure that I was invisible being on the dark side of a curtained window. That was simple enough, yet nevertheless I felt that I was seen. The girl, in fact, uttered a cry, and then turned and buried her face in the sofa pillows. I raised the window, rushed into the room toward the sofa, and leaned over the face that she was hiding. As I did so, being really very remorseful, I began to excuse and to accuse myself, calling myself all sorts of names and begging pardon for my indiscretion. I said that I deserved to be driven from her presence, but begged not to be sent away without at least a word of pardon. For a long time I pleaded thus without success, but at last she slowly turned, and I saw that her fair young face was stirred with just the faintest suggestion of a smile. When she caught a glimpse of me she murmured something of which I did not then quite get the meaning. "'It is you!' she cried out it is you as she said this and as i looked at her not knowing yet exactly what to answer i was harassed by the thought where on earth have i already seen this face this look this very gesture little by little however i found my tongue and after saying a few more words in apology for my unpardonable curiosity and getting brief but not offended answers I took leave of her, and, retiring through the window by which I had come, went back to my own room. Arriving there, I sat a long time by the window in the darkness, charmed by the face that I had seen, and yet singularly disquieted. This woman so beautiful, so amiable, living so near to me, who said to me, It is you, exactly as though she had already known me who spoke so little, who answered all my questions with evasion, excited in me a feeling of fear. She had indeed told me her name, Linda, and that was all. I tried in vain to drive away the remembrance of her greenish eyes, which in the darkness seemed still to gleam upon me, and of those glints which, like electric sparks, shone in her long hair whenever she stroked it with her hand. Finally, however, I retired for the night. But scarcely was my head upon the pillow when I felt some moving body descend upon my feet. The cat had appeared again. I tried to chase her away, but she kept returning again and again, until I ended by resigning myself to her presence, and, just as before, I went to sleep with this strange companion near me. Yet my rest was this time a troubled one, and broken by strange and fitful dreams. Have you ever experienced the sort of mental obsession which gradually causes the brain to be mastered by some single absurd idea, an idea almost insane, and one which your reason and your will alike repel, but which nevertheless gradually blends itself with your thought, fastens itself upon your mind, and grows and grows. I suffered cruelly in this way on the days that followed my strange adventure. Nothing new occurred, but in the evening going out upon the balcony, I found Linda standing upon her side of the iron fan. We chatted together for a while in the half-darkness, and as before I returned to my room to find that in a few moments the golden cat appeared, leaped upon my bed, made a nest for herself there, and remained until the morning. I knew now to whom the cat belonged, for Linda had answered that very same evening on my speaking of it, Oh, yes, my cat. Doesn't she look exactly as though she were made of gold? As I said, nothing new had occurred, 
yet nevertheless a vague sort of terror began little by little to master me and to develop itself in my mind at first merely as a bit of foolish fancy and then as a haunting belief that dominated my entire thought so that i perpetually seemed to see a thing which it was in reality quite impossible to see why it's easy enough to guess interrupted the young lady who had spoken at the beginning of his story linda and the cat were the same thing tribourdeau smiled i should not have been quite so positive as that he said even then but i cannot deny that this ridiculous fancy haunted me for many hours when i was endeavouring to snatch a little sleep amid the insomnia that a too active brain produced yes there were moments when these two beings with greenish eyes sinuous movements golden hair and mysterious ways seemed to me to be blended into one and to be merely the double manifestation of a single entity as i said i saw linda again and again but in spite of all my efforts to come upon her unexpectedly i never was able to see them both at the same time i tried to reason with myself to convince myself that there was nothing really inexplicable in all of this and i ridiculed myself for being afraid both of a woman and of a harmless cat in truth at the end of all my reasoning i found that i was not so much afraid of the animal alone or of the woman alone but rather of a sort of quality which existed in my fancy and inspired me with a fear of something that was incorporeal fear of a manifestation of my own spirit fear of a vague thought which is indeed the very worst of fears i began to be mentally disturbed after long evenings spent in confidential and very unconventional chats with linda in which little by little my feelings took on the color of love i passed long days of secret torment such as incipient maniacs must experience gradually a resolve began to grow up in my mind a desire that became more and more importunate in demanding a solution of this unceasing and tormenting doubt and the more i cared for linda the more it seemed absolutely necessary to push this resolve to its fulfillment i decided to kill the cat one evening before meeting linda on the balcony i took out of my medical cabinet a jar of glycerin and a small bottle of hydrocyanic acid together with one of those little pencils of glass which chemists use in mixing certain corrosive substances that evening for the first time linda allowed me to caress her i held her in my arms and passed my hand over her long hair which snapped and cracked under my touch in a succession of tiny sparks as soon as i regained my room the golden cat as usual appeared before me i called her to me she rubbed herself against me with arched back and extended tail purring the while with the greatest amiability i took the glass pencil in my hand moistened the point in the glycerin and held it out to the animal which licked it with her long red tongue i did this three or four times but the next time i dipped the pencil in the acid the cat unhesitatingly touched it with her tongue in an instant she became rigid and a moment after a frightful titanic convulsion caused her to leap thrice into the air and then to fall upon the floor with a dreadful cry a cry that was truly human she was dead with the perspiration starting from my forehead and with trembling hands i threw myself upon the floor beside the body that was not yet cold the starting eyes had a look that froze me with horror the blackened tongue was thrust out between the teeth the limbs exhibited the most remarkable contortions i mustered all my courage with a violent effort of will took the animal by the paws and left the house hurrying down the silent street i proceeded to the quays along the banks of the loire and on reaching them threw my burden into the river until daylight i roamed around the city 
just where i know not and not until the sky began to grow pale and then to be flushed with light did i at last have the courage to return home as i laid my hand upon the door i shivered i had a dread of finding there still living as in the celebrated tale of poe the animal that i had so lately put to death but no my room was empty i fell half fainting upon my bed and for the first time i slept with a perfect sense of being all alone a sleep like that of a beast or of an assassin until evening came some one here interrupted breaking in upon the profound silence in which we had been listening i can guess the end linda disappeared at the same time as the cat you see perfectly well replied tribourdeau that there exists between the facts of this story a curious coincidence since you are able to guess so exactly their relation yes linda disappeared they found in her apartment her dresses her linen all even to the night-robe that she was to have worn that night but there was nothing that could give the slightest clue to her identity the owner of the house had let the apartment to mademoiselle linda concert singer he knew nothing more i was summoned before the police magistrate i had been seen on the night of her disappearance roaming about with a distracted air in the vicinity of the river luckily the judge knew me luckily also he was a man of no ordinary intelligence i related to him privately the entire story just as i have been telling it to you he dismissed the inquiry yet i may say that very few have ever had so narrow an escape as mine from a criminal trial for several moments the silence of the company was unbroken finally a gentleman wishing to relieve the tension cried out come now doctor confess that this is really all fiction that you merely want to prevent these ladies from getting any sleep to-night tribourdeau bowed stiffly his face unsmiling and a little pale you may take it as you will he said end of the woman and the cat by marcel prevost international short stories volume three french stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by bruce peary international short stories volume three french stories compiled and translated by francis j reynolds gil blas and dr sangrado by alain rené le sage as i was on my way who should come across me but dr sangrado whom i had not seen since the day of my master's death i took the liberty of touching my hat he knew me in a twinkling heyday said he with as much warmth as his temperament would allow him the very lad i wanted to see you have never been out of my thought i have occasion for a clever fellow about me and pitched upon you as the very thing if you can read and write sir replied i if that is all you require i am your man in that case rejoined he we need look no further come home with me you will be very comfortable i shall behave to you like a brother you will have no wages but everything will be found you you shall eat and drink according to the true scientific system and be taught to cure all diseases in a word you shall rather be my young sangrado than my footman i closed in with the doctor's proposal in the hope of becoming an esculapius under so inspired a master he carried me home forthwith to install me in my honourable employment which honourable employment consisted in writing down the name and residence of the patients who sent for him in his absence there had indeed been a register for this purpose kept by an old domestic but she had not the gift of spelling accurately and wrote a most perplexing hand this account i was to keep it might truly be called a bill of mortality for my members all went from bad to worse during the short time they continued in this system 
I was a sort of bookkeeper for the other world, to take places in the stage, and to see that the first come were the first served. My pen was always in my hand, for Dr. Sangrado had more practice than any physician of his time in Valladolid. He had got into reputation with the public by a certain professional slang, humoured by a medical face, and some extraordinary cures more honoured by implicit faith than scrupulous investigation. He was in no want of patience, nor, consequently, of property. He did not keep the best house in the world. We lived with some little attention to economy. The usual bill of fare consisted of peas, beans, boiled apples, or cheese. He considered this food as best suited to the human stomach, that is to say, as most amenable to the grinders, whence it was to encounter the process of digestion. Nevertheless, easy as was their passage, he was not for stopping the way with too much of them. And, to be sure, he was in the right but though he cautioned the maid and me against repletion in respect of solids it was made up by free permission to drink as much water as we liked far from prescribing us any limits in that direction he would tell us sometimes drink my children health consists in the pliability and moisture of the parts drink water by pailfuls it is a universal dissolvent water liquefies all the salts is the course of the blood a little sluggish this grand principle sets it forward too rapid its career is checked our doctor was so orthodox on this head that though advanced in years he drank nothing himself but water he defined old age to be a natural consumption which dries us up and wastes us away on this principle he deplored the ignorance of those who call wine old men's milk. He maintained that wine wears them out and corrodes them, and pleaded with all the force of his eloquence against that liquor, fatal in common both to the young and old, that friend with a serpent in its bosom, that pleasure with a dagger under its girdle in spite of these fine arguments at the end of a week i felt an ailment which i was blasphemous enough to saddle on the universal dissolvent and the new-fangled diet i stated my symptoms to my master in the hope that he would relax the rigour of his regimen and qualify my meals with a little wine but his hostility to that liquor was inflexible if you have not philosophy enough said he for pure water there are innocent infusions to strengthen the stomach against the nausea of aqueous quaffings sage for example has a very pretty flavour and if you wish to heighten it into a debauch it is only mixing rosemary wild poppy and other simples with it but no compounds in vain did he sing the praise of water and teach me the secret of composing delicious messes i was so abstemious that remarking my moderation he said in good sooth gil blas i marvel not that you are no better than you are you do not drink enough my friend water taken in a small quantity serves only to separate the particles of bile and set them in action but our practice is to drown them in a copious drench. Fear not, my good lad, lest a superabundance of liquid should either weaken or chill your stomach. Far from thy better judgment be that silly fear of unadulterated drink. I will insure you against all consequences, and if my authority will not serve your turn, read Celsus. That oracle of the ancients makes an admirable panegyric on water in short he says in plain terms that those who plead an inconstant stomach in favour of wine publish a libel on their own viscera and make their constitution a pretence for their sensuality as it would have been ungenteel in me to run riot on my entrance into the medical career i pretended thorough conviction indeed i really thought there was something in it I therefore went on drinking water on the authority of Celsus, or, to speak in scientific terms, I began to drown the bile in copious trenches of that unadulterated liquor, and though I felt myself more out of order from day to day, 
prejudice won the cause against experience it is evident therefore that i was in the right road to the practice of physic yet i could not always be insensible to the qualms which increased in my frame to that degree as to determine me on quitting dr sangrado but he invested me with a new office which changed my tone hark you my child said he to me one day i am not one of those hard and ungrateful masters who leave their household to grow gray in service without a suitable reward i am well pleased with you i have a regard for you and without waiting till you have served your time i will make your fortune without more ado i will initiate you in the healing art of which i have for so many years been at the head other physicians make the science to consist of various unintelligible branches but i will shorten the road for you and dispense with the drudgery of studying natural philosophy pharmacy botany and anatomy remember my friend that bleeding and drinking warm water are the two grand principles the true secret of curing all the distempers incident to humanity yes this marvellous secret which i reveal to you and which nature beyond the reach of my colleagues has not been able to conceal from me is comprehended in these two articles namely bleeding and drenching here you have the sum total of my philosophy you are thoroughly bottomed in medicine and may raise yourself to the summit of fame on the shoulders of my long experience you may enter into partnership at once by keeping the books in the morning and going out to visit patients in the afternoon while i dose the nobility and clergy you shall labor in your vocation among the lower orders and when you have felt your ground a little i will get you admitted into our body you are a philosopher gil blas though you have never graduated the common herd of them though they have graduated in due form and order are likely to run out the length of their tether without knowing their right hand from their left i thanked the doctor for having so speedily enabled me to serve as his deputy and by way of acknowledging his goodness promised to follow his system to the end of my career with a magnanimous indifference about the aphorisms of hippocrates but that engagement was not to be taken to the letter this tender attachment to water went against the grain and i had a scheme for drinking wine every day snugly among the patients i left off wearing my own suit a second time to take up one of my masters and look like an experienced practitioner after which i brought my medical theories into play leaving those it might concern to look to the event i began on an alguazil constable in a pleurisy he was condemned to be bled with the utmost rigor of the law at the same time that the system was to be replenished copiously with water next i made a lodgment in the veins of a gouty pastry cook who roared like a lion by reason of gouty spasms i stood on no more ceremony with his blood than with that of the alguazil and laid no restriction on his taste for simple liquids my prescriptions brought me in twelve realeth shillings an incident so auspicious in my professional career that i only wished for the plagues of egypt on all the hale citizens of Bayadolid. i was no sooner at home than dr sangrado came in i talked to him about the patients i had seen and paid into his hands eight reales of the twelve i had received for my prescriptions eight reales said he as he counted them mighty little for two visits but we must take things as we find them in the spirit of taking things as he found them he laid violent hands on six of the coins giving me the other two here gil blas continued he see what a foundation to build upon i make over to you the fourth of all you may bring me you will soon feather your nest my friend for by the blessing of providence there will be a great deal of ill health this year i had reason to be content with my dividend since having determined to keep back the third part of what i recovered in my rounds and afterward touching another fourth of the remainder 
then half of the whole if arithmetic is anything more than a deception would become my perquisite this inspired me with new zeal for my profession the next day as soon as i had dined i resumed my medical paraphernalia and took the field once more i visited several patients on the list and treated their several complaints in one invariable routine hitherto things had gone well and no one thank heaven had risen up in rebellion against my prescriptions but let a physician's cures be as extraordinary as they will some quack or other is always ready to rip up his reputation i was called in to a grocer's son in a dropsy whom should i find there before me but a little black-looking physician by name dr cuchillo introduced by a relation of the family i bowed round most profoundly but dipped lowest to the personage whom i took to have been invited to a consultation with me he returned my compliment with a distant air then having stared me in the face for a few seconds sir said he i beg pardon for being inquisitive i thought i was acquainted with all my brethren in Bayadolid, but i confess your physiognomy is altogether new you must have been settled but a short time in town i avowed myself a young practitioner acting as yet under direction of dr sangrado i wish you joy replied he politely you are studying under a great man you must doubtless have seen a vast deal of sound practice young as you appear to be he spoke this with so easy an assurance that i was at a loss whether he meant it seriously or was laughing at me while i was conning over my reply the grocer seizing on the opportunity said gentlemen i am persuaded of your both being perfectly competent in your art have the goodness without ado to take the case in hand and devise some effectual means for the restoration of my son's health thereupon the little pulse counter set himself about reviewing the patient's situation and after having dilated to me on all the symptoms asked me what i thought the fittest method of treatment i am of opinion replied i that he should be bled once a day and drink as much warm water as he can swallow at these words our diminutive doctor said to me with a malicious simper and so you think such a course will save the patient not a doubt of it exclaimed i in a confident tone it must produce that effect because it is a certain method of cure for all distempers ask signor sangrado at that rate retorted he celsus is altogether in the wrong for he contends that the readiest way to cure a dropsical subject is to let him almost die of hunger and thirst oh as for celsus interrupted i he is no oracle of mine he is as fallible as the meanest of us i often have occasion to bless myself for going contrary to his dogmas i discover by your language said cuchillo the safe and sure method of practice dr sangrado instils into his pupils bleeding and drenching are the extent of his resources no wonder so many worthy people are cut off under his direction no defamation interrupted i with some acrimony a member of the faculty had better not begin throwing stones come come my learned doctor patients can get to the other world without bleeding and warm water and i question whether the most deadly of us has ever signed more passports than yourself if you have any crow to pluck with signor sangrado publish an attack on him he will answer you and we shall soon see who will have the best of the battle by all the saints in the calendar swore he in a transport of passion you little know whom you are talking to i have a tongue and a fist my friend and am not afraid of sangrado who with all his arrogance and affectation is but a ninny the sighs of the little death-dealer made me hold his anger cheap i gave him a sharp retort he sent back as good as i brought till at last we came to fisticuffs we had pulled a few handfuls of hair from each other's head before the grocer and his kinsman could part us when they had brought this about they feed me for my attendance and retained my antagonist whom they thought the more skilful of the two another adventure succeeded close on the heels of this i went to see a huge singer in a fever 
as soon as he heard me talk of warm water he showed himself so adverse to this specific as to fall into a fit of swearing he abused me in all possible shapes and threatened to throw me out of the window i was in a greater hurry to get out of his house than to get in i did not choose to see any more patients that day and repaired to the inn where i had agreed to meet fabricio he was there first as we found ourselves in a tippling humor we drank hard and returned to our employers in a pretty pickle that is to say so-so in the upper story signor sangrado was not aware of my being drunk because he took the lively gestures which accompanied the relation of my quarrel with the little doctor for an effect of the agitation not yet subsided after the battle besides he came in for his share in my report and feeling himself nettled by the insults of cuchillo you have done well gil blas said he to defend the character of our practice against this little abortion of the faculty so he takes upon him to set his face against watery drenches in dropsical cases an ignorant fellow i maintain i do in my own person that the use of them may be reconciled to the best theories yes water is a cure for all sorts of dropsies just as it is good for rheumatisms and the green sickness it is excellent too in those fevers where the effect is at once to parch and to chill and even miraculous in those disorders ascribed to cold thin phlegmatic and pituitous humours this opinion may appear strange to young practitioners like cuchillo but it is right orthodox in the best and soundest systems so that if persons of that description were capable of taking a philosophical view instead of crying me down they would become my most zealous advocates in his rage he never suspected me of drinking for to exasperate him still more against the little doctor i had thrown into my recital some circumstances of my own addition yet engrossed as he was by what i had told him he could not help taking notice that i drank more water than usual that evening in fact the wine had made me very thirsty any one but sangrado would have distrusted my being so very dry as to swallow down glass after glass but as for him he took it for granted in the simplicity of his heart that i had begun to acquire a relish for aqueous potations apparently gil blas said he with a gracious smile you have no longer such a dislike to water as heaven is my judge you quaff it off like nectar it is no wonder my friend i was certain you would before long take a liking to that liquor sir replied i there is a tide in the affairs of men with my present lights i would give all the wine in Valladolid for a pint of water this answer delighted the doctor who would not lose so fine an opportunity of expatiating on the excellence of water he undertook to ring the changes once more in its praise not like a hireling pleader but as an enthusiast in a most worthy cause a thousand times exclaimed he a thousand and a thousand times of greater value as being more innocent than all our modern taverns were those baths of ages past whither the people went not shamefully to squander their fortunes and expose their lives by swilling themselves with wine but assembling there for the decent and economical amusement of drinking warm water it is difficult to admire enough the patriotic forecast of those ancient politicians who established places of public resort where water was dealt out gratis to all comers and who confined wine to the shops of the apothecaries that its use might be prohibited save under the direction of physicians what a stroke of wisdom it is doubtless to preserve the seeds of that antique frugality emblematic of the golden age that persons are found to this day like you and me who drink nothing but water and are persuaded they possess a prevention or a cure for every ailment provided our warm water has never boiled for i have observed that water when it is boiled is heavier and sits less easily on the stomach while he was holding forth thus eloquently i was in danger more than once of splitting my sides with laughing but i contrived to keep my countenance nay more to chime in with the doctor's theory 
i found fault with the use of wine and pitied mankind for having contracted an untoward relish for so pernicious a beverage then finding my thirst not sufficiently allayed i filled a large goblet with water and after having swilled it like a horse come sir said i to my master let us drink plentifully of this beneficial liquor let us make those early establishments of dilution you so much regret live again in your house he clapped his hands in ecstasy at these words and preached to me for a whole hour about suffering no liquid but water to pass my lips to confirm the habit i promised to drink a large quantity every evening and to keep my word with less violence to my private inclinations i went to bed with the determined purpose of going to the tavern every day End of Gil Blas and Dr. Sangrado by Alain René Le Sage. International Short Stories, Volume 3, French Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Philip Panos. International Short Stories, Volume 3, French Stories, compiled and translated by Francis J. Reynolds. A Fight with a Cannon by Victor Hugo. La Vivilla was suddenly cut short by a cry of despair, and at the same time a noise was heard, wholly unlike any other sound. The cry and sounds came from within the vessel. The captain and lieutenant rushed towards the gun deck, but could not get down. All the gunners were pouring up in dismay. Something terrible had just happened. One of the carronades of the battery, a 24-pounder, had broken loose. This is the most dangerous accident that can possibly take place on shipboard. Nothing more terrible can happen to a sloop in open sea and under full sail. A cannon that breaks its moorings suddenly becomes some strange supernatural beast. It is a machine transformed into a monster. That short mass on wheels moves like a billiard ball, rolls with the rolling of the ship, plunges with the pitching seas, goes, comes, stops, seems to meditate, starts on its course again, shoots like an arrow from one end of the vessel to the other, whirls around, slips away, dodges, rears, bangs, crashes, kills, exterminates. It is a battering ram capriciously assaulting a wall. Add to this the fact the ram is of metal, the wall of wood. It is matter set free, one might say. This eternal slave was avenging itself. It seems as if the total depravity concealed in what we call inanimate things has escaped and burst forth all of a sudden. It appears to lose patience and to take a strange, mysterious revenge, nothing more relentless than this wrath of the inanimate. This enraged lump leaps like a panther. It has the clumsiness of an elephant, the nimbleness of a mouse, the obstinacy of an ox, the uncertainty of the billows, the zigzag of the lightning, the deafness of the grave. It weighs ten thousand pounds, and it rebounds like a child's ball. It spins and then abruptly darts off at right angles. And what is to be done? How put an end to it? A tempest ceases, a cyclone passes over, a wind dies down, a broken mast can be replaced, a leak can be stopped, a fire extinguished. But what will become of this enormous brute of bronze? How can it be captured? You can reason with a bulldog, astonish a bull, fascinate a boa, frighten a tiger, tame a lion, but you have no resource against this monster, a loose cannon. You cannot kill it, it is dead and at the same time it lives. It lives with a sinister life which comes to it from the infinite. The deck beneath it gives it full swing. It is moved by the ship, which is moved by the sea, which is moved by the wind. This destroyer is a toy. The ship, the waves, the winds, all play with it, hence its frightful animation. What is to be done with this apparatus? How fetter this stupendous engine of destruction? How anticipate its comings and goings, its returns, its stops, its shocks? Any one of its blows on the side may stave it in. 
how foretell its frightful meanderings it is dealing with a projectile which alters its mind which seems to have ideas and changes its direction every instant how check the course of what must be avoided the horrible cannon struggles advances backs strikes right strikes left retreats passes by disconcerts expectation grinds up obstacles crushes men like flies all the terror of the situation is in the fluctuations of the flooring how fight an inclined plane subject to caprices the ship has so to speak in its belly an imprisoned thunderstorm striving to escape something like a thunderbolt rumbling above an earthquake in an instant the whole crew was on foot it was the fault of the gun captain who had neglected to fasten the screw nuts of the mooring chain and had insecurely clogged the four wheels of the gun carriage this gave play to the sole and the framework separated the two platforms in the breaching the tackle had given way so that the cannon was no longer firm on its carriage the stationary breaching which prevents recoil was not in use at this time a heavy sea struck the port the carronade insecurely fastened had recoiled and broken its chain and began its terrible course over the deck at the moment when the fastenings gave way the gunners were in the battery some in groups others scattered about busied with the customary work among sailors getting ready for a signal for action the carronade hurled forward by the pitching of the vessel made a gap in this crowd of men and crushed four at the first blow then sliding back and shot out again as the ship rolled it cut in two a fifth unfortunate and knocked a piece of the battery against the larboard side with such force as to unship it this caused the cry of distress just heard all the men rushed to the companion way the gun deck was vacated in a twinkling the enormous gun was left alone it was given up to itself it was its own master and master of the ship it could do what it pleased this whole crew accustomed to laugh in time of battle now trembled to describe the terror is impossible captain boabetolo and lieutenant la Vieuvilla, although both dauntless men stopped at the head of the companionway and dumb pale and hesitating looked down on the deck below someone elbowed past and went down it was their passenger the peasant the man of whom they had just been speaking a moment before reaching the foot of the companionway he stopped the cannon was rushing back and forth on the deck one might have supposed it to be the living chariot of the apocalypse the marine lantern swinging overhead added a dizzy shifting of light and shade to the picture the form of the cannon disappeared in the violence of its course and it looked now black in the light now mysteriously white in the darkness it went on in its destructive work it had already shattered four other guns and made two gaps in the side of the ship fortunately above the water line but where the water would come in in case of heavy weather it rushed frantically against the framework the strong timbers withstood the shock the curved shape of the wood gave them great power of resistance but they creaked beneath the blows of this huge club beating on all sides at once with a strange sort of ubiquity the percussions of a grain of shot shaken in a bottle are not swifter or more senseless the four wheels passed back and forth over the dead men cutting them carving them slashing them till the five corpses were a score of stumps rolling across the deck the heads of the dead men seemed to cry out streams of blood curled over the deck with the rolling of the vessel the planks damaged in several places began to gape open the whole ship was filled with the horrid noise and confusion the captain promptly recovered his presence of mind and ordered everything that could check and impede the cannon's mad course to be thrown through the hatchway down on to the gun deck mattresses hammocks spare sails rolls of cordage bags belonging to the crew and bales of counterfeit assigna of which the corvette carried a large quantity a characteristic piece of english villainy regarded as legitimate warfare but what could these rags do as nobody dared to go below to dispose of them properly they were reduced to lint in a few minutes there was just sea enough to make the accident as bad as possible a tempest would have been desirable for it might have upset the cannon and with its four wheels once in the air there would be some hope of getting it under control meanwhile the havoc increased there were splits and fractures in the masts which are set into the framework of the keel and rise above the decks of ships like great round pillars the convulsive blows of the cannon had cracked the mizzenmast and had cut into the mainmast 
the battery was being ruined. Ten pieces out of thirty were disabled, the breaches in the side of the vessel were increasing, and the corvette was beginning to leak. The old passenger, having gone down to the gun deck, stood like a man of stone at the foot of the steps. He cast a stern glance over this scene of devastation. He did not move. It seemed impossible to take a step forward. Every movement of the loose carronade threatened the ship's destruction. A few moments more and shipwreck would be inevitable. They must perish or put a speedy end to the disaster. Some course must be decided upon, but what? What an opponent was this carronade. Something must be done to stop this terrible madness, to capture this lightning, to overthrow this thunderbolt. Boisbertolo said to La Vieuville, Do you believe in God, Chevalier? La Vieuville replied, Yes. No. Sometimes. During a tempest? Yes. And in moments like this. God alone can save us from this, said Boisbertolo. Everybody was silent, letting the carronade continue its horrible din. Outside, the waves beating against the ship responded with their blows to the shocks of the cannon. It was like two hammers alternating. Suddenly, in the midst of this inaccessible ring, where the escaped cannon was leaping, a man was seen to appear with an iron bar in his hand. He was the author of the catastrophe, the captain of the gun, guilty of criminal carelessness, and the cause of the accident, the master of the carronade. Having done the mischief, he was anxious to repair it. He had seized the iron bar in one hand, a tiller rope with a slip noose in the other, and jumped down the hatchway to the gun deck. Then began an awful sight, a titanic scene, the contest between gun and gunner, the battle of matter and intelligence, the duel between man and the inanimate. The man stationed himself in a corner, and with bar and rope in his two hands he leaned against one of the riders, braced himself on his legs which seemed two steel posts, and livid, calm, tragic, as if rooted to the deck he waited. He waited for the cannon to pass by him. The gunner knew his gun, and it seemed to him as if the gun ought to know him. He had lived long with it. How many times had he thrust his hand into its mouth? It was his own familiar monster. He began to speak to it as if it were his dog. Come, he said. Perhaps he loved it. He seemed to wish it to come to him. But to come to him was to come upon him, and then he would be lost. How could he avoid being crushed? That was the question. All looked on in terror. Not a breast breathed freely, unless perhaps that of the old man, who was alone in the battery with the two contestants, a stern witness. He might be crushed himself by the cannon. He did not stir. Beneath them the sea blindly directed the contest. At the moment when the gunner, accepting this frightful hand-to-hand -hand conflict, challenged the cannon, some chance rocking of the sea caused the carronade to remain for an instant motionless and as if stupefied. "'Come, now!' said the man. It seemed to listen. Suddenly it leaped toward him. The man dodged the blow. The battle began, battle unprecedented, frailty struggling against the invulnerable, the gladiator of flesh attacking the beast of brass. On one side brute force, on the other a human soul. All this was taking place in semi-darkness. It was like the shadowy vision of a miracle, a soul, strange to say, one would have thought the cannon also had a soul, but a soul full of hatred and rage. This sightless thing seemed to have eyes. The monster appeared to lie in wait for the man. One would have at least believed that there was craft in this mass. It also chose its time. It was a strange, gigantic insect of metal, having or seeming to have the will of a demon. For a moment this colossal locust would beat against the low ceiling overhead, then it would come down on its four wheels like a tiger on its four paws and begin to run at the man. He, supple, nimble, expert, writhed away like an adder from these lightning movements. He avoided a collision, but the blows which he parried fell against the vessel and continued their work of destruction. An end of broken chain was left hanging to the carronade. This chain had in some strange way become twisted about the screw of the cascabel. One end of the chain was fastened to the gun carriage, the other left loose whirled desperately about the cannon, making all its blows more dangerous. The screw held it in a firm grip, adding a thong to the battering ram, making a terrible whirlwind around the cannon, an iron lash in a brazen hand. 
This chain complicated the contest. However, the man went on fighting. Occasionally, it was the man who attacked the cannon. He would creep along the side of the vessel, bar and rope in hand, and the cannon, as if it understood, and as though suspecting some snare, would flee away. The man, bent on victory, pursued it. Such things cannot long continue. The cannon seemed to say to itself all of a sudden, Come now, make an end of it, and it stopped. One felt that the crisis was at hand. The cannon, as if in suspense, seemed to have, or really had, for to all it was a living being, a ferocious malice prepense. It made a sudden, quick dash at the gunner. The gunner sprang out of the way, let it pass by, and cried out to it with a laugh, "'Try it again!' The cannon, as if enraged, smashed a carronade on the port side, again seized by the invisible sling which controlled it, was hurled to the starboard side at the man who made his escape." Three carronades gave way under the blows of the cannon. Then, as if blind and not knowing what more to do, it turned its back on the man, rolled from stern to bow, injured the stern and made a breach in the planking of the prow. The man took refuge at the foot of the steps, not far from the old man who was looking on. The gunner held his iron bar in rest. The cannon seemed to notice it, and without taking the trouble to turn around, slid back on the man, swift as the blow of an axe. The man, driven against the side of the ship, was lost. The whole crew cried out with horror. But the old passenger, till this moment motionless, darted forth more quickly than any of this wildly swift rapidity. He seized a package of counterfeit assignia, and, at the risk of being crushed, succeeded in throwing it between the wheels of the carronade. This decisive and perilous movement could not have been made with more exactness and precision by a man trained in all the exercises described in Durosel's Manual of Gun Practice at Sea. The package had the effect of a clog. A pebble may stop a log, the branch of a tree turn aside an avalanche. The carronade stumbled. The gunner, taking advantage of this critical opportunity, plunged his iron bar between the spokes of one of the hind wheels. The cannon stopped. It leaned forward. The man, using the bar as a lever, held it in equilibrium. The heavy mass was overthrown with the crash of a falling bell, and the man, rushing with all his might, dripping with perspiration, passed the slip noose around the bronze neck of the subdued monster. It was ended. The man had conquered. The ant had control over the mastodon. The pygmy had taken the thunderbolt prisoner. The mariners and sailors clapped their hands. The whole crew rushed forward with cables and chains, and in an instant the cannon was secured. The gunner saluted the passenger. Sir, he said, you have saved my life. The old man had resumed his impassive attitude and made no reply. The man had conquered, but the cannon might be said to have conquered as well. Immediate shipwreck had been avoided, but the corvette was not saved. The damage to the vessel seemed beyond repair. There were five breaches in her sides, one very large in the bow. Twenty of the thirty carronades lay useless in their frames. The one which had just been captured and chained again was disabled. The screw of the cascabel was strung, and consequently levelling the gun made impossible. The battery was reduced to nine pieces. The ship was leaking. It was necessary to repair the damages at once, and to work the pumps. The gun deck, now that one could look over it, was frightful to behold. The inside of an infuriated elephant's cage would not be more completely demolished. However great might be the necessity of escaping observation, the necessity of immediate safety was still more imperative to the corvette. They had been obliged to light up the deck with lanterns hung here and there on the sides. However, all the while this tragic play was going on, the crew were absorbed by a question of life and death, and they were wholly ignorant of what was taking place outside the vessel. The fog had grown thicker, the weather had changed, the wind had worked its pleasure with the ship. They were out of their course, with Jersey and Guernsey close at hand, further to the south than they ought to have been, and in the midst of a heavy sea. Great billows kissed the gaping wounds of the vessel, kisses full of danger. The rocking of the sea threatened destruction. The breeze had become a gale, a squall, a tempest perhaps was brewing. It was impossible to see four waves ahead. While the crew were hastily repairing the damages to the gun deck, stopping the leaks and putting in place the guns which had been uninjured in the disaster, the old passenger had gone on deck again. 
He stood with his back against the mainmast. He had not noticed a proceeding which had taken place on the vessel. The Chevalier de la Vieuville had drawn up the marines in line on both sides of the mainmast, and at the sound of the boatswain's whistle the sailors formed in line, standing on the yards. The Comte de bois approached the passenger. Behind the captain walked a man, haggard, out of breath, his dress disordered, but still with a look of satisfaction on his face. It was the gunner who had just shown himself so skilful in subduing monsters, and who had gained mastery over the cannon. The Count gave the military salute to the old man in peasant's dress, and said to him, General, there is the man. The gunner remained standing, with downcast eyes, in military attitude. The Comte de bois continued, General, in consideration of what this man has done, do you not think there is something due him from his commander? I think so, said the old man. Please give your orders, replied Boisbertolo. It is for you to give them. You are the captain. But you are the general, replied Boisbertolo. The old man looked at the gunner. Come forward, he said. The gunner approached. The old man turned towards the Comte de Boisbertolo, took off the cross of Saint-Louis from the captain's coat, and fastened it on the gunner's jacket. Hurrah! cried the sailors. The mariners presented arms and the old passenger, pointing to the dazzled gunner, added, Now, have this man shot! Dismay succeeded the cheering. Then, in the midst of the death-like stillness, the old man raised his voice and said, Carelessness has compromised this vessel. At this very hour it is perhaps lost. To be at sea is to be in front of the enemy. A ship making a voyage is an army waging war. The tempest is concealed, but it is at hand. The whole sea is an ambuscade. Death is the penalty of any misdemeanor committed in the face of the enemy. No fault is reparable. Courage should be rewarded and negligence punished. These words fell one after another, slowly, solemnly, in a sort of inexorable meter like the blows of an axe upon an oak. And the man, looking at the soldiers, added, Let it be done. The man on whose jacket hung the shining cross of Saint-Louis bowed his head. At a signal from Comte de Boisbertolo, two sailors went below, and came back bringing the hammock shroud. The chaplain, who since they sailed had been at prayer in the officers' quarters, accompanied the two sailors. A sergeant detached twelve marines from the line, and arranged them in two files, six by six. The gunner, without uttering a word, placed himself between the two files. The chaplain, crucifix in hand, advanced and stood beside him. March, said the sergeant. The platoon marched with slow steps to the bow of the vessel. The two sailors, carrying the shroud, followed. A gloomy silence fell over the vessel. A hurricane howled in the distance. A few moments later, a light flashed, a report sounded through the darkness, then all was still, and the sound of a body falling into the sea was heard. The old passenger, still leaning against the mainmast, had crossed his arms and was buried in thought. Wabertolo pointed to him with the forefinger of his left hand and said to La Vieuville in a low voice, La Vendée has a head. End of A Fight with the Cannon by Victor Hugo International Short Stories, Volume 3 French stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. International Short Stories, Volume 3. French stories. Compiled and translated by Francis J. Reynolds. Tonton by A. Chenevier. There are men who seem born to be soldiers. They have the face, the bearing, the gesture, the quality of mind. But there are others who have been forced to become so in spite of themselves and of the rebellion of reason and the heart through a rash deed, a disappointment in love, or simply because their destiny demanded it, being sons of soldiers and gentlemen. Such is the case of my friend, Captain Robert de X. And I said to him one summer evening, under the great trees of his terrace, which is washed by the green and sluggish Marne, Yes, old fellow, you are sensitive. 
what the deuce would you have done on a campaign were you obliged to shoot to strike down with a sabre and to kill and then too you have never fought except against the arabs and that is quite another thing he smiled a little sadly his handsome mouth with its blonde moustache was almost like that of a youth his blue eyes were dreamy for an instant then little by little he began to confide me his thought his recollections and all that was mystic and poetic in his soldier's heart you know we are soldiers in my family we have a marshal of france and two officers who died on the field of honor we have perhaps obeyed a law of heredity i believe rather that my imagination has carried me away i saw war through my reveries of epic poetry in my fancy i dwelt only upon the intoxication of victory the triumphant flourish of trumpets and women throwing flowers to the victor and then i loved the sonorous words of the great captains the dramatic representations of martial glory my father was in the third regiment of zouaves the one which was hewn in pieces at reichshofen in the niederwald and which in eighteen fifty nine at palestro made that famous charge against the austrians and hurled them into the great canal it was superb without them the italian divisions would have been lost victor emmanuel marched with the zouaves after this affair while still deeply moved not by fear but with admiration for this regiment of demons and heroes he embraced their old colonel and declared that he would be proud were he not a king to join the regiment then the zouaves acclaimed him corporal of the third and for a long time on the anniversary festival of st palestro when the roll was called they shouted corporal of the first squad in the first company of the first battalion victor emmanuel and a rough old sergeant solemnly responded sent us long into italy that is the way my father talked to us and by these recitals a soldier was made of a dreamy child but later what a disillusion where is the poetry of battle i have never made any campaign except in africa but that has been enough for me and i believe the army surgeon is right who said to me one day if instantaneous photographs could be taken after a battle and millions of copies made and scattered through the world there would be no more war the people would refuse to take part in it africa yes i have suffered there on one occasion i was sent to the south six hundred kilometers from oran beyond the oasis of fignig to destroy a tribe of rebels on this expedition we had a pretty serious affair with a military chief of the great desert called bonarigi we killed nearly all of the tribe and seized nearly fifteen hundred sheep in short it was a complete success we also captured the wives and children of the chief a dreadful thing happened at that time under my very eyes a woman was fleeing pursued by a black mounted soldier she turned around and shot at him with a revolver the horse soldier was furious and struck her down with one stroke of his saber i did not have the time to interfere i dismounted from my horse to take the woman up she was dead and almost decapitated i uttered not one word of reproach to the turkish soldier who smiled fiercely and turned back i placed the poor body sadly on the sand and was going to remount my horse when i perceived a few steps back behind a thicket a little girl five or six years old i recognized at once that she was a tuareg of white race notwithstanding her tawny color i approached her perhaps she was not afraid of me because i was white like herself i took her on the saddle with me without resistance on her part and returned slowly to the place where we were to camp for the night i expected to place her under the care of the women whom we had taken prisoners and were carrying away with us but all refused saying that she was a vile little tuareg belonging to a race which carries misfortune with it 
and bring forth only traitors i was greatly embarrassed i would not abandon the child i felt somewhat responsible for the crime having been one of those who had directed the massacre i had made an orphan i must take her part one of the prisoners of the band had said to me i understand a little of the gibberish of these people that if i left the little one to these women they would kill her because she was the daughter of a tuareg whom the chief had preferred to them and that they hated the petted spoiled child whom he had given rich clothes and jewels what was to be done i had a wide awake orderly a certain michel of batignon i called him and said to him take care of the little one very well captain i will take her in charge he then petted the child made her sociable and led her away with him and two hours later he had manufactured a little cradle for her out of biscuit boxes which are used on the march for making coffins in the evening michel put her to bed in it he had christened her tonton an abbreviation of tuareg in the morning the cradle was bound on an ass and behold tonton following the column with the baggage in the convoy of the rear guard under the indulgent eye of michel this lasted for days and weeks in the evening at the halting place tonton was brought to my tent with the goat which furnished her the greater part of her meals and her inseparable friend a large chameleon captured by michel and responding or not responding to the name of achilles ah oh, well old fellow you may believe me or not but it gave me pleasure to see the little one sleeping in her cradle during the short night full of alarm when i felt the weariness of living the dull sadness of seeing my companions dying one by one leaving the caravan the enervation of the perpetual state of alertness always attacking or being attacked for weeks and months i with the gentle instincts of a civilized man was forced to order the beheading of spies and traitors the binding of women in chains and the kidnapping of children to raid the herds to make of myself an attila and this had to be done without a moment of wavering and i the cold and gentle celt whom you know remained there under the scorching african sun then what repose of soul what strange meditations were mine when free at last at night in my sombre tent around which death might be prowling i could watch the little tuareg saved by me sleeping in her cradle by the side of her chameleon lizard ridiculous is it not but go there and lead the life of a brute of a plunderer and assassin and you will see how at times your civilized imagination will wander away to take refuge from itself i could have rid myself of tonton in an oasis we met some rebels bearing a flag of truce and exchanged the women for guns and ammunition i kept the little one notwithstanding the five months of march we must make before returning to Tlemcen. she had grown gentle was inclined to be mischievous but was yielding and almost affectionate with me she ate with the rest never wanting to sit down but running from one to another around the table she had proud little manners as if she knew herself to be a daughter of the chief's favorite obeying only the officers and treating michel with an amusing scorn all this was to have a sad ending one day i did not find the chameleon in the cradle though i remember to have seen it there the evening before i had even taken it in my hands and caressed it before tonton who had just gone to bed then i had given it back to her and gone out accordingly i questioned her she took me by the hand and leading me to the camp fire showed me the charred skeleton of the chameleon explaining to me as best she could that she had thrown it in the fire because i had petted it oh women women and she gave a horrible imitation of the lizard writhing in the midst of the flames and she smiled with delighted eyes i was indignant i seized her by the arm shook her a little and finished by boxing her ears 
my dear fellow from that day she appeared not to know me Tonton and I sulked we were angry However one morning as I felt the Sun was going to be terrible I went myself to the baggage before the loading for departure and arranged a sheltering awning over the cradle Then to make peace I embraced my little friend But as soon as we were on the march she furiously tore off the canvas with which I had covered the cradle Michelle put it all in place again and there was a new revolt in short it was necessary to yield because she wanted to be able to lean outside of her box under the fiery Sun to look at the head of the column of which I had the command I Saw this on arriving at the resting place then Michelle brought her under my tent She had not yet fallen asleep, but followed with her eyes all of my movements With a grave air without a smile or gleam of mischief She refused to eat and drink the next day she was ill with sunken eyes and body burning with fever When the major wished to give her medicine she refused to take it and ground her teeth together to keep from swallowing There remained still six days march before arriving at Oran. I Wanted to give her into the care of the nuns She died before I could do so very suddenly with a severe attack of meningitis She never wanted to see me again she was buried under a clump of African shrubs near Jerryville in her little campaign cradle And do you know what was found in her cradle? The charred skeleton of the poor chameleon which had been the indirect cause of her death Before leaving the bivouac where she had committed her crime She had picked it out of the glowing embers and brought it into the cradle and that is why her little fingers were burned since the beginning of the meningitis the major had never been able to explain the cause of these burns Robert was silent for an instant then murmured poor little one I feel remorseful if I had not given her that blow who knows she would perhaps be living still My story is sad is it not ah well it is still the sweetest of my African memories War is beautiful, eh? And Robert shrugged his shoulders. End of Tonton by A. Chenevier. International Short Stories, Volume 3, French Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wendy Almeida. International Short Stories, Volume 3. French Stories Compiled and Translated by Francis J. Reynolds. The Last Lesson by Alphonse Daudet. I started for school very late that morning and was in a great dread of a scolding, especially because Monsieur Hamel had said that he would question us on participles, and I did not know the first word about them. For a moment I thought of running away and spending the day out of doors. It was so warm, so bright. The birds were chirping at the edge of the woods, and in the open field back of the sawmill the Prussian soldiers were drilling. It was all much more tempting than the rule for participles, but I had the strength to resist and hurried off to school. When I passed the town hall, there was a crowd in front of the bulletin board. For the last two years, all our bad news had come from there. The lost battles, the draft, the orders of the commanding officer, and I thought to myself without stopping, what can be the matter now? Then, as I hurried by as fast as I could go, the blacksmith, Wachter, who was there with his apprentice reading the bulletin, called after me. Don't go so fast, bub. You'll get to your school in plenty of time. I thought he was making fun of me and reached Monsieur Armel's little garden all out of breath. Usually, when school began, there was a great bustle which could be heard out in the street, the opening and closing of desks, Lessons repeated in unison, very loud, with our hands over our ears to understand better, and the teacher's great ruler rapping on the table. 
but now it was all so still. I had counted on the commotion to get to my desk without being seen, but of course that day everything had to be as quiet as Sunday morning. Through the window I saw my classmates, already in their places, and Monsieur Amel walking up and down with his terrible iron ruler under his arm. I had to open the door and go in before everybody. You can imagine how I blushed and how frightened I was. But nothing happened. Monsieur Amel saw me and said very kindly, Go to your place quickly, little France. We were beginning without you. I jumped over the bench and sat down at my desk. Not till then, when I had got a little over my fright, did I see that our teacher had on his beautiful green coat, his frilled shirt, and the little black silk cap, all embroidered, that he never wore except on inspection and prize days. Besides, the whole school seemed so strange and solemn. But the thing that surprised me most was to see on the back benches that were always empty the village people sitting quietly like ourselves. Old Hauser with his three-cornered hat, the former mayor, the former postmaster, and several others besides. Everybody looked sad, and Hauser had brought an old primer thumbed at the edges, and he held it open on his knees with his great spectacles lying across the pages. While I was wondering about it all, Monsieur Amel mounted his chair, and in the same grave and gentle tone which he had used to me, said, My children, this is the last lesson I shall give you. The order has come from Berlin to teach only German in the schools of Alsace and Lorraine. The new master comes tomorrow. This is your last French lesson. I want you to be very attentive. What a thunderclap these words were to me. Oh, the wretches. That was what they had put up at the town hall. My last French lesson. Why, I hardly knew how to write. I should never learn any more. I must stop there, then. Oh, how sorry I was for not learning my lessons, for seeking birds' eggs or going sliding on the saw. My books that had seemed such a nuisance a while ago, so heavy to carry, my grammar and my history of the saints, were old friends now that I couldn't give up. And Monsieur Armel, too. The idea that he was going away, that I should never see him again, made me forget all about his ruler and how cranky he was. Poor man! It was an honor of this last lesson that he had put on his fine Sunday clothes. And now I understood why the old men of the village were sitting there in the back of the room. It was because they were sorry, too, that they had not gone to school more. It was their way of thanking our master for his forty years of faithful service, and of showing their respect for the country that was theirs no more. While I was thinking of all this, I heard my name called. It was my turn to recite. What would I not have given to be able to say that dreadful rule for the participle all through, very loud and clear and without one mistake? But I got mixed up on the first words and stood there, holding on to my desk, my heart beating and not daring to look up. I heard Monsieur Armel say to me, I won't scold you, little France. You must feel bad enough. See how it is? Every day we have said to ourselves, Pa, I've plenty of time. I'll learn it tomorrow. And now you see where we've come out. Ah, that's the great trouble with Alsace. She puts off learning till tomorrow. Now those fellows out there will have the right to say to you, How is it you pretend to be Frenchmen, and yet you can neither speak nor write your own language? But you are not the worst, poor little France. We've all a great deal to reproach ourselves with. Your parents were not anxious enough to have you learn. They preferred to put you to work on a farm or at the mills, so as to have a little more money. And I, I've been to blame also. 
Have I not often sent you to water my flowers instead of learning your lessons? And when I wanted to go fishing, did I not just give you a holiday? Then, from one thing to another, Monsieur Amel went on to talk of the French language, saying that it was the most beautiful language in the world, the clearest, the most logical, that we must guard it among us and never forget it, because when a people are enslaved, as long as they hold fast to their language, it is as if they had the key to their prison. Then he opened a grammar and read us our lesson. I was amazed to see how well I understood it. All he said seemed so easy, so easy. I think, too, that I had never listened so carefully, and that he had never explained everything with so much patience. It seemed almost as if the poor man wanted to give us all he knew before going away, and to put it all into our heads at one stroke. After the grammar, we had a lesson in writing. That day, Monsieur Amel had new copies for us, written in a beautiful round hand. France, Alsace, France, Alsace. They looked like little flags floating everywhere in the schoolroom, hung from the rod at the top of our desks. You ought to have seen how everyone set to work and how quiet it was. The only sound was the scratching of the pens over the paper. Once some beetles flew in, but nobody paid any attention to them, not even the littlest ones, who worked right on tracing their fish hooks, as if that was French, too. On the roof the pigeons cooed very low, and I thought to myself, will they make them sing in German, even the pigeons? Whenever I looked up from my writing, I saw Monsieur Amel sitting motionless in his chair, and gazing first at one thing, then at another, as if he wanted to fix in his mind just how everything looked in that little schoolroom. Fancy! For forty years he had been there in the same place, with his garden outside the window and his class in front of him, just like that. Only the desks and benches had been worn smooth. The walnut trees in the garden were taller, and the hop vine that he had planted himself twined about the windows to the roof. How it must have broken his heart to leave it all, poor man, to hear his sister moving about in the room above, packing their trunks, for they must leave the country next day. But he had the courage to hear every lesson to the very last. After the writing we had a lesson in history, and then the babies chanted their ba be bi bo bu down there at the back of the room, old Hauser had put on his spectacles and, holding his primer in both hands, spelled the letters with them. You could see that he, too, was crying. His voice trembled with emotion, and it was so funny to hear him that we all wanted to laugh and cry. Ah, oh, how well I remember it, that last lesson. All at once the church clock struck twelve, then the Angelus. At the same moment, the trumpets of the Prussians returning from drill sounded under our windows. Monsieur Armel stood up, very pale, in his chair. I never saw him look so tall. My friends, said he, ah, uh, ah, uh. but something choked him. He could not go on. Then he turned to the blackboard, took a piece of chalk, and, bearing on with all his might, he wrote as large as he could, Vive la France! Then he stopped and leaned his head against the wall, and, without a word, he made a gesture to us with his hand. School is dismissed. You may go. End of the Last Lesson by Alphonse Daudet International Short Stories, Volume 3, French Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. International Short Stories, Volume 3, French Stories, compiled and translated by Francis J. Reynolds. Quasi, 
Part One by Alfred de Musset. One. At the beginning of the reign of Louis the Fifteenth, a young man named Croisille, son of a goldsmith, was returning from Paris to Havre, his native town. He had been entrusted by his father with the transaction of some business, and his trip to the great city having turned out satisfactorily, the joy of bringing good news caused him to walk the sixty leagues more gaily and briskly than was his wont. For though he had a rather large sum of money in his pocket, he travelled on foot for pleasure. He was a good-tempered fellow, and not without wit, but so very thoughtless and flighty that people looked upon him as being rather weak-minded. His doublet buttoned awry, his periwig flying to the wind, his hat under his arm, he followed the banks of the Seine, at times finding enjoyment in his own thoughts, and again indulging in snatches of song. Up at daybreak, supping at wayside inns, and always charmed with this stroll of his through one of the most beautiful regions of France. Plundering the apple trees of Normandy on his way, he puzzled his brain to find rhymes, for all these rattle-pates are more or less poets, and tried hard to turn out a madrigal for a certain fair damsel of his native place. She was no less than a daughter of a fermier général, Mademoiselle Godot, the Pearl of Avra, a rich heiress, and much courted. Croisille was not received at Monsieur Godot's otherwise than in a casual sort of way, that is to say he had sometimes himself taken there articles of jewellery purchased at his father's. Monsieur Godot, whose somewhat vulgar surname ill-fitted his immense fortune, avenged himself by his arrogance for the stigma of his birth, and showed himself on all occasions enormously and pitilessly rich he certainly was not the man to allow the son of a goldsmith to enter his drawing-room but as mademoiselle godot had the most beautiful eyes in the world and croisille was not ill-favoured and as nothing can prevent a fine fellow from falling in love with a pretty girl croisille adored mademoiselle godot who did not seem vexed thereat thus was he thinking of her as he turned his steps toward Havre and as he had never reflected seriously upon anything instead of thinking of the invincible obstacles which separated him from his lady-love he busied himself only with finding a rhyme for the christian name she bore mademoiselle godot was called julie and the rhyme was found easily enough so quasi having reached enfler embarked with a satisfied heart his money and his madrigal in his pocket and as soon as he jumped ashore ran to the paternal house he found the shop closed and knocked again and again not without astonishment and apprehension for it was not a holiday but nobody came he called his father but in vain he went to a neighbor's to ask what had happened instead of replying the neighbor turned away as though not wishing to recognize him Quasi repeated his questions. He learned that his father, his affairs having long been in an embarrassed condition, had just become bankrupt, and had fled to America, abandoning to his creditors all that he possessed. Not realizing as yet the extent of his misfortune, Quasi felt overwhelmed by the thought that he might never again see his father it seemed to him incredible that he should be thus suddenly abandoned he tried to force an entrance into the store but was given to understand that the official seals had been affixed so he sat down on a stone and giving way to his grief began to weep piteously deaf to the consolations of those around him never ceasing to call his father's name though he knew him to be already far away at last he rose ashamed at seeing a crowd about him and in the most profound despair turned his steps towards the harbour on reaching the pier he walked straight before him like a man in a trance who knows neither where he is going nor what is to become of him he saw himself irretrievably lost possessing no longer a shelter no means of rescue and of course no longer any friends alone wandering on the seashore he felt tempted to drown himself then and there 
just at the moment when yielding to this thought he was advancing to the edge of a high cliff an old servant named jean who had served his family for a number of years arrived on the scene ah my poor jean he exclaimed you know all that has happened since i went away is it possible that my father could leave us without warning without farewell he is gone answered jean but indeed not without saying good-bye to you at the same time he drew from his pocket a letter which he gave to his young master quasi recognized the handwriting of his father and before opening the letter kissed it rapturously but it contained only a few words instead of feeling his trouble softened it seemed to the young man still harder to bear honorable until then and known as such the old gentleman ruined by an unforeseen disaster the bankruptcy of a partner had left for his son nothing but a few commonplace words of consolation and no hope except perhaps that vague hope without aim or reason which constitutes it is said the last possession one loses jean my friend you carried me in your arms said croisi when he had read the letter and you certainly are to-day the only being who loves me at all it is a very sweet thing to me but a very sad one for you for as sure as my father embarked there i will throw myself into the same sea which is bearing him away not before you nor at once but some day i will do it for i am lost what can you do replied jean not seeming to have understood but holding fast to the skirt of croisi's coat what can you do my dear master your father was deceived he was expecting money which did not come and it was no small amount either could he stay here i have seen him sir as he made his fortune during the thirty years that i served him i have seen him working attending to his business the crown pieces coming in one by one he was an honorable man and skilful they took a cruel advantage of him within the last few days i was still there and as fast as the crowns came in i saw them go out of the shop again your father paid all he could for a whole day and when his desk was empty he could not help telling me pointing to a drawer where but six francs remained there were a hundred thousand francs there this morning that does not look like a rascally failure sir there is nothing in it that can dishonor you i have no more doubt of my father's integrity answered croisi than i have of his misfortune neither do i doubt his affection but i wish i could have kissed him for what is to become of me i am not accustomed to poverty i have not the necessary cleverness to build up my fortune and if i had it my father is gone it took him thirty years how long would it take me to repair this disaster much longer and will he be living then certainly not he will die over there and i cannot even go and find him i can join him only by dying utterly distressed as croisi was he possessed much religious feeling although his despondency made him wish for death he hesitated to take his life at the first words of this interview he had taken hold of old jean's arm and thus both returned to the town when they had entered the streets and the sea was no longer so near it seems to me sir said jean that a good man has a right to live and that a misfortune proves nothing since your father has not killed himself thank god how can you think of dying since there is no dishonor in his case and all the town knows it is so what would they think of you that you felt unable to endure poverty it would be neither brave nor christian for at the very worst what is there to frighten you there are plenty of people born poor and who have never had either mother or father to help them on i know that we are not all alike but after all nothing is impossible to god what would you do in such a case your father was not born rich far from it meaning no offence and that is perhaps what consoles him now if you had been here this last month it would have given you courage yes sir a man may be ruined nobody is secure from bankruptcy but your father 
i make bold to say has borne himself through it all like a man though he did leave us so hastily but what could he do it is not every day that a vessel starts for america i accompanied him to the wharf and if you had seen how sad he was how he charged me to take care of you to send him news from you sir it is a right poor idea you have that throwing the helve after the hatchet every one has his time of trial in this world and i was a soldier before i was a servant i suffered severely at the time but i was young i was of your age sir and it seemed to me that providence could not have spoken his last word to a young man of twenty-five why do you wish to prevent the kind god from repairing the evil that has befallen you give him time and all will come right if i might advise you i would say just wait two or three years and i will answer for it you will come out all right it is always easy to go out of this world why will you seize an unlucky moment while jean was thus exerting himself to persuade his master the latter walked in silence and as those who suffer often do was looking this way and that as though seeking for something which might bind him to life as chance would have it at this juncture mademoiselle godot the daughter of the fermier general happened to pass with her governess the mansion in which she lived was not far distant quasi saw her enter it this meeting produced on him more effect than all the reasonings in the world i have said that he was rather erratic and nearly always yielded to the first impulse without hesitating an instant and without explanation he suddenly left the arm of his old servant and crossing the street knocked at m godot's door two when we try to picture to ourselves nowadays what was called a financier in times gone by we invariably imagine enormous corpulence short legs a gigantic wig and a broad face with a triple chin and it is not without reason that we have become accustomed to form such a picture of such a personage every one knows to what great abuses the royal tax farming led and it seems as though there were a law of nature which renders fatter than the rest of mankind those who fatten not only upon their own laziness but also upon the work of others m godot among financiers was one of the most classical to be found that is to say one of the fattest at the present time he had the gout which was nearly as fashionable in his day as the nervous headache is in ours stretched upon a lounge his eyes half closed he was coddling himself in the coziest corner of a dainty boudoir the panel mirrors which surrounded him majestically duplicated on every side his enormous person bags filled with gold covered the table around him the furniture the wainscot the doors the locks the mantelpiece the ceiling were gilded so was his coat i do not know but that his brain was gilded too he was calculating the issue of a little business affair which could not fail to bring him a few thousand louis and was even deigning to smile over it to himself when quasi was announced the young man entered with a humble but resolute air and with every outward manifestation of that inward tumult with which we find no difficulty in crediting a man who is longing to drown himself m godot was a little surprised at this unexpected visit then he thought his daughter had been buying some trifle and was confirmed in that thought by seeing her appear almost at the same time with the young man he made a sign to quasi not to sit down but to speak the young lady seated herself on a sofa and quasi remaining standing expressed himself in these terms sir my father has failed the bankruptcy of a partner has forced him to suspend his payments and unable to witness his own shame he has fled to america after having paid his last sou to his creditors i was absent when all this happened i have just come back and have known of these events only two hours 
I am absolutely without resources, and determined to die. It is very probable that on leaving your house I shall throw myself into the water. In all probability I would already have done so, if I had not chanced to meet, at the very moment, this young lady, your daughter. I love her from the very depths of my heart. For two years I have been in love with her, and my silence until now proves better than anything else the respect I feel for her. But to-day, in declaring my passion to you, I fulfill an imperative duty, and I would think I was offending God if, before giving myself over to death, I did not come to ask you, Mademoiselle Julie, in marriage. I have not the slightest hope that you will grant this request, but I have to make it, nevertheless, for I am a good Christian, sir, and when a good Christian sees himself come to such a point of misery that he can no longer suffer life, he must at least to extenuate his crime exhaust all the chances which remain to him before taking the final and fatal step at the beginning of this speech m godeau had supposed that the young man came to borrow money and so he prudently threw his handkerchief over the bags that were lying around him preparing in advance a refusal and a polite one for he always felt some good will toward the father of Quasi but when he had heard the young man to the end and understood the purport of his visit he never doubted one moment that the poor fellow had gone completely mad he was at first tempted to ring the bell and have him put out but noticing his firm demeanour his determined look the fermier general took pity on so inoffensive a case of insanity he merely told his daughter to retire so that she might be no longer exposed to hearing such improprieties while quasi was speaking mademoiselle godeau had blushed as a peach in the month of august at her father's bidding she retired the young man making her a profound bow which she did not seem to notice left alone with quasi m godeau coughed rose then dropped again upon the cushions and trying to assume a paternal air delivered himself to the following effect my boy said he i am willing to believe that you are not poking fun at me but you have really lost your head i not only excuse this proceeding but i consent not to punish you for it i am sorry that your poor devil of a father has become bankrupt and has skipped it is indeed very sad and i quite understand that such a misfortune should affect your brain besides i wish to do something for you so take this stool and sit down there it is useless sir answered quasi if you refuse me as i see you do i have nothing left but to take my leave i wish you every good fortune and where are you going to write to my father and say good-bye to him eh the devil any one would swear you were speaking the truth i'll be damned if i don't think you are going to drown yourself yes sir at least i think so if my courage does not forsake me that's a bright idea fie on you how can you be such a fool sit down sir i tell you and listen to me m godeau had just made a very wise reflection which was that it is never agreeable to have it said that a man whoever he may be threw himself into the water on leaving your house he therefore coughed once more took his snuff-box cast a careless glance upon his shirt frill and continued it is evident that you are nothing but a simpleton a fool a regular baby you do not know what you are saying you are ruined that's what has happened to you but my dear friend all that is not enough one must reflect upon the things of this world if you came to ask me well good advice for instance i might give it to you but what is it you are after you are in love with my daughter yes sir and i repeat to you that i am far from supposing that you can give her to me in marriage but as there is nothing in the world but that which could prevent me from dying if you believe in god as i do not doubt you do you will understand the reason that brings me here whether i believe in god or not is no business of yours i do not intend to be questioned answer me first where have you seen my daughter 
in my father's shop and in this house when i brought jewellery for mademoiselle julie who told you her name was julie what are we coming to great heavens but be her name julie or javat do you know what is wanted in any one who aspires to the hand of the daughter of a fermier general no i am completely ignorant of it unless it is to be as rich as she something more is necessary my boy you must have a name well my name is croisi your name is croisi poor wretch do you call that a name upon my soul and conscience sir it seems to me to be as good a name as godot you are very impertinent sir and you shall rue it indeed sir do not be angry i had not the least idea of offending you if you see in what i said anything to wound you and wish to punish me for it there is no need to get angry have i not told you that on leaving here i am going straight to drown myself although m godot had promised himself to send croisi away as gently as possible in order to avoid all scandal his prudence could not resist the vexation of his wounded pride the interview to which he had to resign himself was monstrous enough in itself it may be imagined then what he felt at hearing himself spoken to in such terms listen he said almost beside himself and determined to close the matter at any cost you are not such a fool that you cannot understand a word of common sense are you rich no are you noble still less so what is this frenzy that brings you here you come to worry me you think you are doing something clever you know perfectly well that it is useless you wish to make me responsible for your death have you any right to complain of me do i owe a son to your father is it my fault that you have come to this mon dieu when a man is going to drown himself he keeps quiet about it that is what i am going to do now i am your very humble servant one moment it shall not be said that you had recourse to me in vain there my boy here are three louis d'or go and have dinner in the kitchen and let me hear no more about you much obliged i am not hungry and i have no use for your money so croisi left the room and the financier having set his conscience at rest by the offer he had just made settled himself more comfortably in his chair and resumed his meditations mademoiselle godot during this time was not so far away as one might suppose she had it is true withdrawn in obedience to her father but instead of going to her room she had remained listening behind the door if the extravagance of croisi seemed incredible to her still she found nothing to offend her in it for love since the world has existed has never passed as an insult on the other hand as it was not possible to doubt the despair of the young man mademoiselle godot found herself a victim at one and the same time to the two sentiments most dangerous to women compassion and curiosity when she saw the interview at an end and croisi ready to come out she rapidly crossed the drawing-room where she stood not wishing to be surprised eavesdropping and hurried towards her apartment but she almost immediately retraced her steps the idea that perhaps croisi was really going to put an end to his life troubled her in spite of herself scarcely aware of what she was doing she walked to meet him the drawing-room was large and the two young people came slowly towards each other croisi was as pale as death and mademoiselle godot vainly sought words to express her feelings in passing beside him she let fall on the floor a bunch of violets which she held in her hand he at once bent down and picked up the bouquet in order to give it back to her but instead of taking it she passed on without uttering a word and entered her father's room croisi alone again put the flowers in his breast and left the house with a troubled heart not knowing what to think of his adventure three scarcely had he taken a few steps in the street when he saw his faithful friend jean running towards him with a joyful face 
what has happened he asked have you news to tell me yes replied jean i have to tell you that the seals have been officially broken and that you can enter your home all your father's debts being paid you remain the owner of the house it is true that all the money and all the jewels have been taken away but at least the house belongs to you and you have not lost everything i have been running about for an hour not knowing what had become of you and i hope my dear master that you will now be wise enough to take a reasonable course what course do you wish me to take sell this house sir it is all your fortune it will bring you about thirty thousand francs with that at any rate you will not die of hunger and what is to prevent you from buying a little stock in trade and starting business for yourself you would surely prosper we shall see about this answered quasi as he hurried to the street where his home was he was eager to see the paternal roof again but when he arrived there so sad a spectacle met his gaze that he had scarcely the courage to enter the shop was in utter disorder the rooms deserted his father's alcove empty everything presented to his eyes the wretchedness of utter ruin not a chair remained all the drawers had been ransacked the till broken open the chest taken away nothing had escaped the greedy search of creditors and lawyers who after having pillaged the house had gone leaving the doors open as though to testify to all passers-by how neatly their work was done this then exclaimed croisille is all that remains after thirty years of work and a respectable life and all through the failure to have ready on a given day money enough to honor a signature imprudently given while the young man walked up and down given over to the saddest thoughts jean seemed very much embarrassed he supposed that his master was without ready money and that he might perhaps not even have dined he was therefore trying to think of some way to question him on the subject and to offer him in case of need some part of his savings after having tortured his mind for a quarter of an hour to try and hit upon some way of leading up to the subject he could find nothing better than to come up to croisy and ask him in a kindly voice sir do you still like roast partridges the poor man uttered this question in a tone at once so comical and so touching that croisille in spite of his sadness could not refrain from laughing and why do you ask me that said he my wife replied jean is cooking me some for dinner sir and if by chance you still like them croisille had completely forgotten till now the money which he was bringing back to his father jean's proposal reminded him that his pockets were full of gold i thank you with all my heart said he to the old man and i accept your dinner with pleasure but if you are anxious about my fortune be reassured i have more money than i need to have a good supper this evening which you in your turn will share with me saying this he laid upon the mantel four well-filled purses which he emptied each containing fifty louis although this sum does not belong to me he added i can use it for a day or two to whom must i go to have it forwarded to my father sir replied jean eagerly your father especially charged me to tell you that this money belongs to you and if i did not speak of it before it was because i did not know how your affairs in paris had turned out where he has gone your father will want for nothing he will lodge with one of your correspondents who will receive him most gladly he has moreover taken with him enough for his immediate needs for he was quite sure of still leaving behind more than was necessary to pay all his just debts all that he has left sir is yours he says so himself in his letter and i am especially charged to repeat it to you that gold is therefore legitimately your property as this house in which we are now i can repeat to you the very words your father said to me on embarking may my son forgive me for leaving him may he remember that i am still in the world only to love me and let him use what remains after my debts are paid as though it were his inheritance 
those sir are his own expressions so put this back in your pocket and since you accept my dinner pray let us go home the honest joy which shone in jean's eyes left no doubt in the mind of quasi the words of his father had moved him to such a point that he could not restrain his tears on the other hand at such a moment four thousand francs were no bagatelle as to the house it was not an available resource for one could realize on it only by selling it and that was both difficult and slow all this however could not but make a considerable change in the situation the young man found himself in so he felt suddenly moved shaken in his dismal resolution and so to speak both sad and at the same time relieved of much of his distress after having closed the shutters of the shop he left the house with jean and as he once more crossed the town could not help thinking how small a thing our affections are since they sometimes serve to make us find an unforeseen joy in the faintest ray of hope it was with this thought that he sat down to dinner beside his old servant who did not fail during the repast to make every effort to cheer him heedless people have a happy fault they are easily cast down but they have not even the trouble to console themselves so changeable is their mind it would be a mistake to think them on that account insensible or selfish on the contrary they perhaps feel more keenly than others and are but too prone to blow their brains out in the moment of despair but this moment once passed if they are still alive they must dine they must eat they must drink as usual only to melt into tears again at bedtime joy and pain do not glide over them but pierce them through like arrows kind hot-headed natures which know how to suffer but not how to lie through which one can clearly read not fragile and empty like glass but solid and transparent like rock crystal after having clinked glasses with jean croisy instead of drowning himself went to the play standing at the back of the pit he drew from his bosom mademoiselle godot's bouquet and as he breathed the perfume in deep meditation he began to think in a calmer spirit about his adventure of the morning as soon as he had pondered over it for a while he saw clearly the truth that is to say that the young lady in leaving the bouquet in his hands and in refusing to take it back had wished to give him a mark of interest for otherwise this refusal and this silence could only have been marks of contempt and such a supposition was not possible croisy therefore judged that mademoiselle godot's heart was of a softer grain than her father's and he remembered distinctly that the young lady's face when she crossed the drawing-room had expressed an emotion the more true that it seemed involuntary but was this emotion one of love or only of sympathy or was it perhaps something of still less importance mere commonplace pity had mademoiselle godot feared to see him die him quasi or merely to be the cause of the death of a man no matter what man although withered and almost leafless the bouquet still retained so exquisite an odor and so brave a look that in breathing it and looking at it quasi could not help hoping it was a thin garland of roses round a bunch of violets what mysterious depths of sentiment an oriental might have read in these flowers by interpreting their language but after all he need not be an oriental in this case the flowers which fall from the breast of a pretty woman in europe as in the east are never mute were they but to tell what they have seen while reposing in that lovely bosom it would be enough for a lover and this in fact they do perfumes have more than one resemblance to love and there are even people who think love to be but a sort of perfume it is true the flowers which exhale it are the most beautiful in creation 
while croisier mused thus paying very little attention to the tragedy that was being acted at the time mademoiselle godeau herself appeared in a box opposite the idea did not occur to the young man that if she should notice him she might think it very strange to find the would-be suicide there after what had transpired in the morning he on the contrary bent all his efforts towards getting nearer to her but he could not succeed a fifth-rate actress from paris had come to play merope and the crowd was so dense that one could not move for lack of anything better quasi had to content himself with fixing his gaze upon his lady-love not lifting his eyes from her for a moment he noticed that she seemed preoccupied and moody and that she spoke to every one with a sort of repugnance her box was surrounded as may be imagined by all the fops of the neighbourhood each of whom passed several times before her in the gallery totally unable to enter the box of which her father filled more than three-fourths quasi noticed further that she was not using her opera-glasses nor was she listening to the play her elbows resting on the balustrade her chin in her hand with her far-away look she seemed in all her sumptuous apparel like some statue of venus disguised en marquise the display of her dress and her hair her rouge beneath which one could guess her paleness all the splendour of her toilet did but the more distinctly bring out the immobility of her countenance never had quasi seen her so beautiful having found means between the acts to escape from the crush he hurried off to look at her from the passage leading to her box and strange to say scarcely had he reached it when mademoiselle godeau who had not stirred for the last hour turned round she started slightly as she noticed him and only cast a glance at him then she resumed her former attitude whether that glance expressed surprise anxiety pleasure or love whether it meant what not dead or god be praised there you are living i do not pretend to explain be that as it may at that glance quasi inwardly swore to himself to die or gain her love end of quasi part one by alfred de musset International Short Stories, Volume 3, French Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. International Short Stories, Volume 3, French Stories, compiled and translated by Francis J. Reynolds. Quasi, Part 2, by Alfred de Musset. 4 of all the obstacles which hinder the smooth course of love the greatest is without doubt what is called false shame which is indeed a very potent obstacle quasi was not troubled with this unhappy failing which both pride and timidity combined to produce he was not one of those who for whole months hover round the woman they love like a cat round a caged bird as soon as he had given up the idea of drowning himself he thought only of letting his dear julie know that he lived solely for her but how could he tell her so should he present himself a second time at the mansion of the fermier general it was but too certain that monsieur godeau would have him ejected julie when she happened to take a walk never went without her maid it was therefore useless to undertake to follow her to pass the nights under the windows of one's beloved is a folly dear to lovers but in the present case it would certainly prove vain i said before that quasi was very religious it therefore never entered his mind to seek to meet his lady-love at church as the best way though the most dangerous is to write to people when one cannot speak to them in person he decided on the very next day to write to the young lady 
his latter possessed naturally neither order nor reason it read somewhat as follows mademoiselle tell me exactly i beg of you what fortune one must possess to be able to pretend to your hand i am asking you a strange question but i love you so desperately that it is impossible for me not to ask it and you are the only person in the world to whom i can address it it seemed to me last evening that you looked at me at the play i had wished to die would to god i were indeed dead if i am mistaken and if that look was not meant for me tell me if fate can be so cruel as to let a man deceive himself in a manner at once so sad and so sweet i believe that you commanded me to live you are rich beautiful i know it your father is arrogant and miserly and you have a right to be proud but i love you and the rest is a dream fix your charming eyes on me think of what love can do when i who suffer so cruelly who must stand in fear of everything feel nevertheless an inexpressible joy in writing you this mad letter which will perhaps bring down your anger upon me but think also mademoiselle that you are a little to blame for this my folly why did you drop that bouquet put yourself for an instant if possible in my place i dare think that you love me and i dare ask you to tell me so forgive me i beseech you i would give my life's blood to be sure of not offending you and to see you listening to my love with that angel smile which belongs only to you whatever you may do your image remains mine you can remove it only by tearing out my heart as long as your look lives in my remembrance as long as the bouquet keeps a trace of its perfume as long as a word will tell of love i will cherish hope having sealed his letter croisi went out and walked up and down the street opposite the godot mansion waiting for a servant to come out chance which always serves mysterious loves when it can do so without compromising itself willed it that mademoiselle julie's maid should have arranged to purchase a cap on that day she was going to the milliner's when croisi accosted her slipped a louis into her hand and asked her to take charge of his letter the bargain was soon struck the servant took the money to pay for her cap and promised to do the errand out of gratitude croisi full of joy went home and sat at his door awaiting an answer before speaking of this answer a word must be said about mademoiselle godot she was not quite free from the vanity of her father but her good nature was ever uppermost she was in the full meaning of the term a spoilt child she habitually spoke very little and never was she seen with a needle in her hand she spent her days at her toilet and her evenings on the sofa not seeming to hear the conversation going on around her as regards her dress she was prodigiously coquettish and her own face was surely what she thought most of on earth a wrinkle in her collarette an ink-spot on her finger would have distressed her and when her dress pleased her nothing can describe the last look which she cast at her mirror before leaving the room she showed neither taste nor aversion for the pleasures in which young ladies usually delight she went to balls willingly enough and renounced going to them without a show of temper sometimes without motive the play wearied her and she was in the constant habit of falling asleep there when her father who worshipped her proposed to make her some present of her own choice she took an hour to decide not being able to think of anything she cared for when m godot gave a reception or a dinner it often happened that julie would not appear in the drawing-room and at such times she passed the evening alone in her own room in full dress walking up and down her fan in her hand if a compliment was addressed to her she turned away her head and if any one attempted to pay court to her she responded only by a look at once so dazzling and so serious as to disconcert even the boldest never had a sally made her laugh never had an air in an opera a flight of tragedy moved her indeed never had her heart given a sign of life and on seeing her pass in all the splendor of her nonchalant loveliness 
one might have taken her for a beautiful somnambulist walking through the world as in a trance so much indifference and coquetry did not seem easy to understand some said she loved nothing others that she loved nothing but herself a single word however suffices to explain her character she was waiting from the age of fourteen she had heard it ceaselessly repeated that nothing was so charming as she she was convinced of this and that was why she paid so much attention to dress in failing to do honor to her own person she would have thought herself guilty of sacrilege she walked in her beauty so to speak like a child in its holiday dress but she was very far from thinking that her beauty was to remain useless beneath her apparent unconcern she had a will secret inflexible and the more potent the better it was concealed the coquetry of ordinary women which spends itself in ogling in simpering and in smiling seemed to her a childish vain almost contemptible way of fighting with shadows she felt herself in possession of a treasure and she disdained to stake it piece by piece she needed an adversary worthy of herself but too accustomed to see her wishes anticipated she did not seek that adversary it may even be said that she felt astonished at his failing to present himself for the four or five years that she had been out in society and had conscientiously displayed her flowers her furbelows and her beautiful shoulders it seemed to her inconceivable that she had not yet inspired some great passion had she said what was really behind her thoughts she certainly would have replied to her many flatterers well if it is true that i am so beautiful why do you not blow your brains out for me an answer which many other young girls might make and which more than one who says nothing hides away in a corner of her heart not far perhaps from the tip of her tongue what is there indeed in the world more tantalizing for a woman than to be young rich beautiful to look at herself in her mirror and see herself charmingly dressed worthy in every way to please fully disposed to allow herself to be loved and to have to say to herself i am admired i am praised all the world thinks me charming but nobody loves me my gown is by the best maker my laces are superb my coiffure is irreproachable my face the most beautiful on earth my figure slender my foot prettily turned and all this helps me to nothing but to go and yawn in the corner of some drawing-room if a young man speaks to me he treats me as a child if i am asked in marriage it is for my dowry if somebody presses my hand in a dance it is sure to be some provincial fop as soon as i appear anywhere i excite a murmur of admiration but nobody speaks low in my ear a word that makes my heart beat i hear impertinent men praising me in loud tones a couple of feet away and never a look of humbly sincere adoration meets mine still i have an ardent soul full of life and i am not by any means only a pretty doll to be shown about to be made to dance at a ball to be dressed by a maid in the morning and undressed at night beginning the whole thing over again the next day that is what mademoiselle godeau had many times said to herself and there were hours when that thought inspired her with so gloomy a feeling that she remained mute and almost motionless for a whole day when Quasi wrote her she was in just such a fit of ill-humour she had just been taking her chocolate and was deep in meditation stretched upon a lounge when her maid entered and handed her the letter with a mysterious air she looked at the address and not recognising the handwriting fell again to musing the maid then saw herself forced to explain what it was which she did with a rather disconcerted air not being at all sure how the young lady would take the matter mademoiselle godeau listened without moving then opened the letter and cast only a glance at it she at once asked for a sheet of paper and nonchalantly wrote these few words no sir i assure you i am not proud if you had only a hundred thousand crowns 
I would willingly marry you. Such was the reply which the maid at once took to Croisille, who gave her another louis for her trouble. 5. A hundred thousand crowns are not found in a donkey's hoof-print, and if Croisille had been suspicious, he might have thought, in reading Mademoiselle Godot's letter, that she was either crazy or laughing at him. He thought neither, for he only saw in it that his darling Julie loved him, and that he must have a hundred thousand crowns, and he dreamed from that moment of nothing but trying to secure them. He possessed two hundred louis in cash, plus a house which, as I have said, might be worth about thirty thousand francs. What was to be done? How was he to go about transfiguring these thirty-four thousand francs, at a jump, into three hundred thousand? The first idea which came into the mind of the young man was to find some way of staking his whole fortune on the toss-up of a coin, but for that he must sell the house. Quasi therefore began by putting a notice upon the door, stating that his house was for sale. Then, while dreaming what he would do with the money that he would get for it, he awaited a purchaser. A week went by, then another. Not a single purchaser applied. More and more distressed, Quasi spent these days with Jean, and despair was taking possession of him once more when a Jewish broker rang at the door. This house is for sale, sir, is it not? Are you the owner of it? Yes, sir. And how much is it worth? Thirty thousand francs, I believe. At least I have heard my father say so. The Jew visited all the rooms, went upstairs and down into the cellar, knocking on the walls, counting the steps of the staircase, turning the doors on their hinges and the keys in their locks, opening and closing the windows. Then, at last, after having thoroughly examined everything, Without saying a word, and without making the slightest proposal, he bowed to Croisille and retired. Croisille, who for a whole hour had followed him with a palpitating heart, as may be imagined, was not a little disappointed at this silent retreat. He thought that perhaps the Jew had wished to give himself time to reflect, and that he would return presently. He waited a week for him, not daring to go out for fear of missing his visit, and looking out of the windows from morning till night. But it was in vain. The Jew did not reappear. Jean, true to his unpleasant role of adviser, brought moral pressure to bear to dissuade his master from selling his house in so hasty a manner and for so extravagant a purpose. Dying of impatience, ennui, and love, Quasi one morning took his two hundred louis and went out, determined to tempt fortune with this sum, since he could not have more. The gaming-houses at that time were not public, and that refinement of civilization which enables the first-comer to ruin himself at all hours, as soon as the wish enters his mind, had not yet been invented. Scarcely was Quasi in the street before he stopped, not knowing where to go to stake his money. He looked at the houses of the neighborhood, and eyed them, one after the other, striving to discover suspicious appearances that might point out to him the object of his search. A good-looking young man, splendidly dressed, happened to pass. Judging from his mien, he was certainly a young man of gentle blood and ample leisure, so Quasi politely accosted him. Sir, he said, I beg your pardon for the liberty I take. I have two hundred louis in my pocket, and I am dying either to lose them or win more. Could you not point out to me some respectable place where such things are done? At this rather strange speech the young man burst out laughing. Upon my word, sir, answered he, if you are seeking any such wicked place you have but to follow me, for that is just where I am going. Quasi followed him, and a few steps farther they both entered a house of very attractive appearance, where they were received hospitably by an old gentleman of the highest breeding. Several young men were already seated round a green cloth. Quasi modestly took a place there, and in less than an hour his two hundred louis were gone. He came out as sad as a lover can be who thinks himself beloved. He had not enough to dine with, but that did not cause him any anxiety. 
what can i do now he asked himself to get money to whom shall i address myself in this town who will lend me even a hundred louis on this house that i cannot sell while he was in this quandary he met his jewish broker he did not hesitate to address him and featherhead as he was did not fail to tell him the plight he was in the jew did not much want to buy the house he had come to see it only through curiosity or to speak more exactly for the satisfaction of his own conscience as a passing dog goes into a kitchen the door of which stands open to see if there is anything to steal but when he saw croisille so despondent so sad so bereft of all resources he could not resist the temptation to put himself to some inconvenience even in order to pay for the house he therefore offered him about one-fourth of its value croisy fell upon his neck called him his friend and saviour blindly signed a bargain that would have made one's hair stand on end and on the very next day the possessor of four hundred new louis he once more turned his steps toward the gambling-house where he had been so politely and speedily ruined the night before on his way he passed by the wharf a vessel was about leaving the wind was gentle the ocean tranquil on all sides merchants sailors officers in uniform were coming and going porters were carrying enormous bales of merchandise passengers and their friends were exchanging farewells small boats were rowing about in all directions on every face could be read fear impatience or hope and amidst all the agitation which surrounded it the majestic vessel swayed gently to and fro under the wind that swelled her proud sails what a grand thing it is thought croisy to risk all one possesses and go beyond the sea in perilous search of fortune how it fills me with emotion to look at this vessel setting out on her voyage loaded with so much wealth with the welfare of so many families what joy to see her come back again bringing twice as much as was entrusted to her returning so much prouder and richer than she went away why am i not one of those merchants why could i not stake my four hundred louis in this way this immense sea what a green cloth on which to boldly tempt fortune why should i not myself buy a few bales of cloth or silk what is to prevent my doing so since i have gold why should this captain refuse to take charge of my merchandise and who knows instead of going and throwing away this my little all in a gambling-house i might double it i might triple it perhaps by honest industry if julie truly loves me she will wait a few years she will remain true to me until i am able to marry her commerce sometimes yields greater profits than one thinks examples are not wanting in this world of wealth gained with astonishing rapidity in this way on the changing waves why should providence not bless an endeavour made for a purpose so laudable so worthy of his assistance among these merchants who have accumulated so much and who send their vessels to the ends of the world more than one has begun with a smaller sum than i have now they have prospered with the help of god why should i not prosper in my turn it seems to me as though a good wind were filling these sails and this vessel inspires confidence come the die is cast i will speak to the captain who seems to be a good fellow i will then write to julie and set out to become a clever and successful trader the greatest danger incurred by those who are habitually but half crazy is that of becoming at times altogether so the poor fellow without further deliberation put his whim into execution to find goods to buy when one has money and knows nothing about the goods is the easiest thing in the world the captain to oblige croisy took him to one of his friends a manufacturer who sold him as much cloth and silk as he could pay for the whole of it loaded upon a cart was promptly taken on board croisy delighted and full of hope had himself written in large letters his name upon the bales he watched them being put on board with inexpressible joy the hour of departure soon came 
and the vessel weighed anchor six i need not say that in this transaction croisi had kept no money in hand his house was sold and there remained to him for his sole fortune the clothes he had on his back no home and not a sou with the best will possible jean could not suppose that his master was reduced to such an extremity croisi was not too proud but too thoughtless to tell him of it so he determined to sleep under the starry vault and as for his meals he made the following calculation he presumed that the vessel which bore his fortune would be six months before coming back to havre croisi therefore not without regret sold a gold watch his father had given him and which he had fortunately kept he got thirty-six livres for it that was sufficient to live on for about six months at the rate of four sous a day he did not doubt that it would be enough and reassured for the present he wrote to mademoiselle godeau to inform her of what he had done he was very careful in his letter not to speak of his distress he announced to her on the contrary that he had undertaken a magnificent commercial enterprise of the speedy and fortunate issue of which there could be no doubt he explained to her that la fleurette a merchant vessel of one hundred and fifty tons was carrying to the baltic his cloths and his silks and implored her to remain faithful to him for a year reserving to himself the right of asking later on for a further delay while for his part he swore eternal love to her when mademoiselle godeau received this letter she was sitting before the fire and had in her hand using it as a screen one of those bulletins which are printed in seaports announcing the arrival and departure of vessels and which also report disasters at sea it had never occurred to her as one can well imagine to take an interest in this sort of thing she had in fact never glanced at any of these sheets the perusal of croisi's letter prompted her to read the bulletin she had been holding in her hand the first word that caught her eye was no other than the name of la fleurette the vessel had been wrecked on the coast of france on the very night following its departure the crew had barely escaped but all the cargo was lost mademoiselle godeau at this news no longer remembered that croisi had made to her an avowal of his poverty she was as heartbroken as though a million had been at stake in an instant the horrors of the tempest the fury of the winds the cries of the drowning the ruin of the man who loved her presented themselves to her mind like a scene in a romance the bulletin and the letter fell from her hands she rose in great agitation and with heaving breast and eyes brimming with tears paced up and down determined to act and asking herself how she should act there is one thing that must be said in justice to love it is that the stronger the clearer the simpler the considerations opposed to it in a word the less common sense there is in the matter the wilder does the passion become and the more does the lover love it is one of the most beautiful things under heaven this irrationality of the heart we should not be worth much without it after having walked about the room without forgetting either her dear fan or the passing glance at the mirror julie allowed herself to sink once more upon her lounge whoever had seen her at this moment would have looked upon a lovely sight her eyes sparkled her cheeks were on fire she sighed deeply and murmured in a delicious transport of joy and pain poor fellow he has ruined himself for me independently of the fortune which she could expect from her father mademoiselle godeau had in her own right the property her mother had left her she had never thought of it at this moment for the first time in her life she remembered that she could dispose of five hundred thousand francs this thought brought a smile to her lips a project strange bold wholly feminine almost as mad as croisi himself entered her head 
she weighed the idea in her mind for some time then decided to act upon it at once she began by inquiring whether quasi had any relatives or friends the maid was sent out in all directions to find out having made minute inquiries in all quarters she discovered on the fourth floor of an old rickety house a half crippled aunt who never stirred from her armchair and had not been out for four or five years this poor woman very old seemed to have been left in the world expressly as a specimen of hungry misery blind gouty almost deaf she lived alone in a garret but a gaiety stronger than misfortune and illness sustained her at eighty years of age and made her still love life her neighbors never passed her door without going in to see her and the antiquated tunes she hummed enlivened all the girls of the neighborhood she possessed a little annuity which sufficed to maintain her as long as day lasted she knitted she did not know what had happened since the death of louis the fourteenth it was to this worthy person that julie had herself privately conducted she donned for the occasion all her finery feathers laces ribbons diamonds nothing was spared she wanted to be fascinating but the real secret of her beauty in this case was the whim that was carrying her away she went up the steep dark staircase which led to the good lady's chamber and after the most graceful bow spoke somewhat as follows you have madame a nephew called quasi who loves me and has asked for my hand i love him too and wish to marry him but my father monsieur godeau fermier general of this town refuses his consent because your nephew is not rich i would not for the world give occasion to scandal nor cause trouble to anybody i would therefore never think of disposing of myself without the consent of my family i come to ask you a favor which i beseech you to grant me you must come yourself and propose this marriage to my father i have thank god a little fortune which is quite at your disposal you may take possession whenever you see fit of five hundred thousand francs at my notary's you will say that this sum belongs to your nephew which in fact it does it is not a present that i am making him it is a debt which i am paying for i am the cause of the ruin of quasi and it is but just that i should repair it my father will not easily give in you will be obliged to insist and you must have a little courage i for my part will not fail as nobody on earth excepting myself has any right to the sum of which i am speaking to you nobody will ever know in what way this amount will have passed into your hands you are not very rich yourself i know and you may fear that people will be astonished to see you thus endowing your nephew but remember that my father does not know you that you show yourself very little in town and that consequently it will be easy for you to pretend that you have just arrived from some journey this step will doubtless be some exertion to you you will have to leave your armchair and take a little trouble but you will make two people happy madame and if you have ever known love i hope you will not refuse me the old lady during this discourse had been in turn surprised anxious touched and delighted the last words persuaded her yes my child she repeated several times i know what it is i know what it is as she said this she made an effort to rise her feeble limbs could barely support her julie quickly advanced and put out her hand to help her by an almost involuntary movement they found themselves in an instant in each other's arms a treaty was at once concluded a warm kiss sealed it in advance and the necessary and confidential consultation followed without further trouble all the explanations having been made the good lady drew from her wardrobe a venerable gown of taffeta which had been her wedding dress this antique piece of property was not less than fifty years old but not a spot not a grain of dust had disfigured it julie was in ecstasies over it 
a coach was sent for the handsomest in the town the good lady prepared the speech she was going to make to monsieur godeau julie tried to teach her how she was to touch the heart of her father and did not hesitate to confess that love of rank was his vulnerable point if you could imagine said she a means of flattering this weakness you will have won our cause the good lady pondered deeply finished her toilet without another word clasped the hands of her future niece and entered the carriage she soon arrived at the godot mansion there she braced herself up so gallantly for her entrance that she seemed ten years younger she majestically crossed the drawing-room where julie's bouquet had fallen and when the door of the boudoir opened said in a firm voice to the lackey who preceded her announce the dowager baroness de croisy these words settled the happiness of the two lovers m godeau was bewildered by them although five hundred thousand francs seemed little to him he consented to everything in order to make his daughter a baroness and such she became who would dare contest her title for my part i think she had thoroughly earned it end of quasi part two by alfred de musset international short stories volume three french stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marina Tsung. International Short Stories, Volume 3. French Stories, compiled and translated by Francis J. Reynolds. The Vase of Clay, by Jean Eckart. Jean had inherited from his father a little field close beside the sea. Round this field, the branches of the pine trees murmured a response to the plashing of the waves. Beneath the pines the soil was red, and the crimson shade of the earth, mingling with the blue waves of the bay, gave them a pensive violet hue, most of all in the quiet evening hours, dear to reveries and dreams. In this field grew roses and raspberries. The pretty girls of the neighborhood came to Jean's home to buy these fruits and flowers, so like their own lips and cheeks. The roses, the lips, and the berries had all the same youth, had all the same beauty. Jean lived happily beside the sea, at the foot of the hills, beneath an olive tree, planted near his door, which in all seasons threw a lance-like blue shadow upon his white wall. Near the olive tree was a well the water of which was so cold and pure that the girls of the region, with their cheeks like roses and their lips like raspberries, came thither night and morning with their jugs. Upon their hats, covered with pads, they carried their jugs, round and slender as themselves, supporting them with their beautiful bare arms, raised aloft like living handles. Jean observed all these things, and admired them, and blessed his life. As he was only twenty years old, he fondly loved one of the charming girls, who drew water from his well, who ate his raspberries, and breathed the fragrances of his roses. He told this younger girl that she was as pure and fresh as the water, as delicious as the raspberries and as sweet as the roses. Then the young girl smiled. He told it her again, and she made a face at him. He sang her the same song, and she married a sailor, who carried her far away beyond the sea. Jean wept bitterly, but he still admired beautiful things, and still blessed his life. Sometimes he thought that the frailty of what is beautiful and the brevity of what is good adds value to the beauty and goodness of all things. One day he learned by chance that the red earth of his field 
was an excellent clay. He took a little of it in his hand, moistened it with water from his well, and fashioned a simple vase, while he thought of those beautiful girls, who are like the ancient Greek jars, at once round and slender. The earth in his field was indeed excellent clay. He built himself a potter's wheel. With his own hands and with his clay, he built a furnace against the wall of his house, and he set himself to making little pots to hold raspberries. He became skillful at this work, and all the gardeners round about came to him to provide themselves with these light, porous pots of a beautiful red hue, round and slender, wherein the raspberries could be heaped without crushing them, and where they slept under the shelter of a green leaf. The leaf, the pot, the raspberries, these enchanted everybody by their form and colour, and the buyers in the city market would have no berries save those which were sold in Jean the Potter's round and slender pots. Now, more than ever, the beautiful girls visited Jean's field. Now they brought baskets of woven reeds in which they piled the empty pots, red and fresh. But now Jean observed them without desire. His heart was forevermore far away beyond the sea. Still, as he deepened and broadened the dish in his field, from which he took the clay, he saw that his pots to hold the raspberries were variously colored, tinted sometimes with rose, sometimes with blue or violet, sometimes with black or green. These shades of the clay reminded him of the loveliest things which had gladdened his eyes. Plants, flowers, ocean, sky. Then he set himself to choose in making his vases, shades of clay, which he mingled delicately. And these colours, produced by centuries of alternating lights and shadows, obeyed his will, changed in a moment according to his desire. Each day he modelled hundreds of these raspberry pots, moulding them upon the wheel, which turned like a sun beneath the pressure of his agile foot. The mass of shapeless clay, turning on the centre of the disc, under the touch of his finger, suddenly raised itself like the petals of a lily, lengthened, broadened, swelled or shrank, submissive to his will. The creative potter loved the clay, as he still dreamed of the things which he had most admired, his thought, his remembrance, his will, descended into his fingers, where, without his knowing how, they communicated to the clay that mysterious principle of life which the wisest man is unable to define. The humble works of Jean the potter had marvellous graces. In such a curve, in such a tint, he put some memory of youth, or of an opening blossom, or the very colour of the weather, and of joy or sorrow. In his hours of repose, he walked with his eyes fixed upon the ground, studying the variations in the colour of the soil on the cliffs, on the plains, on the sides of the hills. And the wish came to him to model a unique face, a marvellous face, in which should live through all eternity something of all the fragile beauties which his eyes had gazed upon, something even of all the brief joys which his heart had known, and even a little of his divine sorrows of hope, regret and love. He was then in the full strength and vigour of manhood. Yet, that he might the better meditate upon his desire, he forsook the well-paid work, which, it is true, had allowed him to lay aside a little hoard. No longer, as of old, his wheel turned from morning until night. He permitted other potters to manufacture raspberry pots by the thousand. The merchants forgot the way to Jean's field. The young girls still came there for pleasure. 
because of the cold water, the roses, and the raspberries. But the ill-cultivated raspberries perished. The rose vines ran wild, climbed to the tops of the high walls, and offered their dusty blossoms to the travellers on the road. The water in the well alone remained the same, cold and plenteous, and that sufficed to draw about Jean eternal youth and eternal gaiety. Only youth had grown mocking for Jean, for him gaiety had now become scoffing. Ah, Master Jean, does not your furnace burn any more? Your wheel, Master Jean, does it scarcely ever turn? When shall we see your amazing pot, which will be as beautiful as everything which is beautiful, blooming like the rose, beaded like the raspberry? And speaking, if we must believe what you say about it, like our lips. Now Jean is aging, Jean is old. He sits upon his stone seat beside the well, under the lace-like shade of the olive tree, in front of his empty field, all the soil of which is good clay, but which no longer produces either raspberries or roses. Jean said formerly, There are three things, roses, raspberries, lips. All the three have forsaken him. The lips of the young girls, and even those of the children, have become scoffing. Ah, oh, Father John, do you live like the grasshoppers? Nobody ever sees you eat, Father John. Father John lives in cold water. The man who grows old becomes a child again. What will you put into your beautiful vase? If you ever make it, silly old fellow, it will not hold even a drop of water from your well. Go and paint the handcuffs and make water jugs. Jean silently shakes his head and only replies to all his railleries by a kindly smile. He is good to animals and he shares his dry bread with the poor. It is true that he eats scarcely anything, but he does not suffer in consequence. He is very thin, but his flesh is all the more sound and wholesome. Under the arch of his eyebrows, his old eyes, hateful of the world, continue to sparkle with the clearness of the spring which reflects the light. One bright morning, upon his wheel, which turns to the rhythmic motion of his foot, Jean sets himself to model a vase, the vase which he has long seen with his mind's eye. The horizontal wheel turns like a sun to the rhythmic beating of his foot. The wheel turns, the clay vase rises, falls, swells, becomes crushed into a shapeless mass to be born again under Jean's hand. At last, with one single burst, it springs forth like an unlooked-for flower from an invisible stem. It blooms triumphantly, and the old man bears it in his trembling hands to the carefully prepared furnace where fire must add to its beauty of form the elusive, decisive beauty of color. All through the night, Jean has kept up and carefully regulated the furnace fire, that artisan of delicate gradations of color. At dawn, the work must be finished, and the potter, old and dying, and his deserted field, raises toward the light of the rising sun the dainty form born of himself, in which he longs to find in perfect harmony the dream of his long life. In the form and tent of the frail little vase, he has wished to fix for all time the ephemeral forms and colors of all the most beautiful things. O oh God of day, the miracle is accomplished. The sun lights the round and slender curves, the colorations infinitely refined, which blend harmoniously and bring back to the soul of the aged man, by the pathway of his eyes, the sweetest joys of his youth, the skies of daybreak, and the mournful violet waves of the sea beneath the setting sun. O miracle of art, in which life is thus epitomized to make joy eternal!
The humble artist raises toward the sun his fragile masterpiece, the flower of his simple heart. He raises it in his trembling hands, as though to offer it to the unknown divinities who created primeval beauty. But his hands, too weak and trembling, let it escape from them suddenly, even as his tottering body lets his soul escape, and the potter's dream, fallen with him to the ground, breaks and scatters into fragments. Where is it now? The form of that face brought to the light for an instant, and seen only by the sun and the humble artist. Surely it must be somewhere, that pure and happy form of the divine dream, made real for an instant. End of the Vase of Clay by Jeanne Carr End of International Short Stories, Volume 3, French Stories, Compiled and Translated by Francis J. Reynolds